Welcome to this meeting of the Dunedin City Council for a Tuesday, the 23rd of November. Welcome, uh, colleagues and staff, uh, and those who are so close and yet so far next door uh, in the municipal chambers joining us uh, for the public forum. We have uh, a series of uh, deputations this morning, beginning with uh, Eleanor and Robin from the South Dunedin Community Network. I am assured uh, that this is going to work for us uh, and the moment of truth uh, will arrive uh, imminently. Um, we've got five minutes for the two of you uh, and then time to ask some questions afterwards if you're happy to entertain them, otherwise we're all yours. We can't hear you if, if, if you can hear us. I can, if I talk loudly enough, I suppose you could hear me. But. Pushing, like pushing the button on a traffic light signal, doing it multiple times doesn't get you to a different outcome any faster. Very satisfying. that we adjourn the meeting for five minutes. Seconded, Councillor Lofusa. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That is agreed. Thank you.
in our best of three series. But welcome the two of you. Uh, we'll start the clock again generously. You've got five minutes from now. Rowe and Ian about how we might avoid duplication of effort, maximise 
notes. If you can wrap up quickly, that'll be helpful. Uh, a few lines to go Thank you. the anticipate positive conversations with the SDF team about how we collaborate and will divide our tasks so that we achieve a clear picture of South East needs and priorities. And while we're about it, we're expecting the development of a much more active and engaged community with local leaders emerging at different spheres of interest. It's all for us to the mill of community development, and that is what we need in South East Thanks you two for coming to talk to us. Um, a very exciting project. But one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, there's two of you or two or three of you and at the moment the front end of leading this project falls on you guys. What kind of supports have you got around setting this project up from DIA and... and, and Well, as guidance about, you know, there are some guidance about 
Oh, thank you, and you've done an amazing job. None, none taken. Uh, but thank you for your uh, your ongoing uh, work in the in the community and for your uh, time and effort and endurance uh, in dealing with our current technical situation uh, this morning. Thank you both. Next, Mr. Copeman. questions I'm curious but the, the outdoor access policy you refer to whose policy is that sorry um, I'm just looking at uh, 
a broad approach. You know, I see a lot of trails that cater for cyclists and walkers. Um, Thank you for coming to us, Clive. Um, you spoke of the economic benefits of a cycle trail and you mentioned 12 viaducts and 10 tunnels. Are you also aware that there are 37 bridges in the stretch that you're talking about and that decades of deferred maintenance mean that they require $15 million worth of investment to make them safe? Okay, um, thank you for that um, clear answer. On the issue of the cost of turning it into a cycle trail, have you got any idea of how many millions will be required simply to fence 37 bridges to make them safe for cyclists to cross? Okay, thank you very much for that. Councillor Hulang. Thank you. <clears throat> Some people have suggested having the, uh, the Amtari Gorge Rail still going and then people could put their bikes on and then cycle off after the, you know, when they get to the end of that ride. What do you think of that proposal? Oh, um, not rail bikes. No, they'd have to put their bike on the train, so they'd do the trip, and then when they get off, they'd carry on on a on a cycle path. I don't see that uh, as a great option, frankly. I, I, what I would like to see is, is walking, riding, and horse access for that trail instead of trains. Thank you. I don't think they're that compatible, and I think it would probably be a a very extensive option to make the Iron Gorge suitable for trains and, you know, a multi-use train. Thank you. Councillor Elder. Um, being a cyclist, I was just wondering what your experience out there over the number of years you've been out there cycling, as to the trends in cycling and the numbers that are getting out there that you observe. Get out of a plane and start riding on this trail. 
I have a lot of cashed up orphan friends. I'm talking lawyers and accountants, guys who are, you know, already retired in their 50s. They fly to Utah to go on these multi day cycle trips. I can't afford to do that. Those guys would be here in a minute if they could ride the Tiger Gorge because the rides we have down there are world class. The communities of the Strathtyre would, would always remind you, Clive, that one third of the Otago Central Rail Trail is within the Dunedin city boundary, uh, contrary to the claim that we are cut off from it. A quick question to close from Councillor Raddock. Uh, I'm just a bit worried about the shared use with horses. So you've done a lot of cycling in the wilderness, Clive, and have come across a great number of cyclists. How many horses have you come across, just anecdotally from, you know, 10 horses versus 100 cyclists or thousands of horses versus 10 cyclists. What, is, what have you come across? What have you just a chance encountered? Uh, I haven't come across a lot of horses uh, during my travels on a bike. Uh, So you're saying four horses for how many cyclists? Oh, well, on that particular day there were... Now I'm talking overall, the last few years. Uh, overall, I, I, but, uh, you know, I, I do think that um, horse trekkers uh, are not well served as a group by our community. Mr Cohen, thank you for your time and for your submissions this morning. We appreciate it. And next... We have Mr. Riley and Mr. Craig from the Otago Excursion Train Trust. <laughs> Kia ora kura. welcome to the both of you. You have five minutes. Thank you. 
operating body of the mine of assets for a trial for the next two years from 1st July 2022. This is to showcase our abilities and give our community focused structure a trial whilst the long term decisions are being deliberated. Our structure has a community based advisory board, a maintenance and infrastructure board, and an operation team which also includes a dedicated sales and marketing manager to allow the trial to reach its sales targets and goals. After all, we're serious about operating the train for our community, and it is one of the world's great train trips. Our trust's overall long-term goal would be to offer daily trips to Middlemarch to assist Middlemarch in becoming a visitor destination. It is the gateway to Central Otago, after all, so let's exploit that. It is also a pivotal transport option for the Otago Rail Trail, to which would include free cartridge of bikes for cyclists. We understand that not every traveller is keen on a long day out, so we offer diversification for the offerings to allow people to go one way in the train and return by coach, with an extended stay in Middlemarch so people can explore the area. If you agree on us in doing a trial of operations, with the trial of lamping up the gorge and trial of rail carting, the list goes on. We understand that the council's homework is needed to be done thoroughly by allowing us to have a trial with a different reporting structure and a more community-focused outcome. This two-year trial from July 2022 would make a perfect opportunity to allow us to demonstrate our abilities and assist the railway move a step closer to a more positive, robust future. You have 30 seconds. Sorry. Fair enough. Thank you for your consideration and the Attack Excursion Train Trust as an alternative to operating the city's railway. And you, didn't, and you didn't need them. Uh, well done. I'm going to move uh, that we extend the duration of the public forum beyond half an hour. Seconded Councillor Vincent Pope. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That is agreed. You're happy to take questions? Yep. Questions? Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. Um, I just want to get a, f a feedback on, is it about the train journey or the train experience that people really uh, want to come to and, and ride the train? So whether it went up the coast or whether it goes inland, um, what would the, be the difference, do you believe, in the passenger rate or the focus of the destination? Thank you, Worship. Kia ora karua. I just have a couple of questions. One of them is about comparing the number of cyclists versus the number of people um, that would take a train trip. And I see on page 25 of your business case, you have a comparative there. Would it be correct, I can't quite see because of the graph, that, cycli that the propensity for cyclists is about, is it, is it a quarter or less than that of the people that would take a train? Thank you. My other question is that you mentioned about that you a, a feasibility study. Um, you've got you've got a business case here, but there's also um, talk about a feasibility study. Did you want to go forward with that, or did you think that your business case was kind of enough? Uh, 
Um, so whilst you can have someone from KiwiRail turn up, there's also other contractors you can do. So I believe a fair bias there would be to send uh, an engineer out there at an independent scale and report back to see if, if it's inflated too much for, for the rate payers or whatnot to pay the, the maintenance cost. Um, and, and can you repeat that? Oh yeah, I'm just wondering if, that, well, first of all, when you're talking about the maintenance costs, so it's um, basically $15 million over 10 years. Um, did you have a, a different view about what that amount might be, or did you, is that what you would like to have peer-reviewed? We would like to have peer-reviewed that is exactly correct. And also, um, you mentioned about um, further feasibility, and I just wonder if that's around the, the different options of cycling versus... Um, a target excursion train trust, I guess, versus Dunedin City Holdings running it, the different ways of um, using the, the, the gorge? Yeah, so I believe that um, Dunedin City Holdings get charged $120,000 a year, um, and that's the Dunedin being used to operate the, the train for them. Um, in our case, we wouldn't be charging that. Thank you. Councillor Lord. Thank you, Worship. Um, look, I just um, wonder if you could, um, I, I want to know what was the history originally with the train trust and why, or how, can you explain how the City Council came to be running the operation? Was it a failure on the trust originally or how did it work? Do you believe... Oh, sorry. Excursion trains thought there was a good opportunity for tourism out of the lead and worked with the City Council to come up with a company to run and save the line. OK, thank you. That'll do. Thank you both uh, for your time this morning and for your ongoing efforts. We appreciate it. Finally on the slate today, David Hunt. Welcome, sir. The next five minutes are yours. Jurisdictions 
to manage this. And two approaches have been used that are actually directly relevant to Dunedin. The city of Bath in the UK has a population of 90,000 and a student population of 23,000. So the numbers are comparable to the numbers in Dunedin. The local authority there, after several years of, of complaints from the citizenry, uh, introduced a requirement for what they call houses in multiple occupation, or HMOs, to hold a license to operate. They define a house in multiple occupation as a house occupied by five or more people from two or more households sharing amenities such as kitchen and bathroom. Verified complaints of antisocial behavior lead to fines for the owner of the property, and repeated verified complaints lead to the loss of the license to operate the HMO. Their problem was solved in a year because the responsibility for bad behavior is placed squarely on the property owner with real costs imposed <coughs> on complaints. Repeated verified complaints lead to loss of a license, as I mentioned. That doesn't have to happen more than once before everybody realizes there's something they have to do. Interestingly in Bath, there are now increased suggestions from council members and from citizens in Bath that the university is currently doing more harm than good to the city because it's displacing permanent residents and small businesses from the tax base. I can provide a link to the relevant regulations if anyone is interested. The second approach that's been used is to classify the HMO, houses in multiple occupation, as a business, because that's what they are. The owner would then have to comply with all the regulations concerning noise, parking, rubbish, impact on neighbours, which apply to any other business in Dunedin. This change would give the DCC much greater authority to respond to complaints of antisocial behaviour. To help start a discussion on this matter, may I suggest Council asked for two staff reports, one on noise control, detailing the location and frequency of call-outs and the cost involved, and I know noise control has this data. Second, a report on the clearing up of broken glass, also detailing locations and frequency of call-outs and costs. These two reports would give some perspective on the current status quo and the costs involved. In closing, I should emphasize that this is not a discussion exclusively of our students, either from the university, polytech, or elsewhere. It's about controlling antisocial behavior from HMOs, no matter who the tenants are, so that houses in multiple occupations and permanent residents can coexist in our city. I should also add that these concerns are not merely personal to me, but are the result of conversations with many neighbors, colleagues, and friends over a period of years. Many people in Dunedin are seriously concerned at the ongoing, the ongoing reputational damage being sustained both by the city and by the university, and are looking for a way forward to resolve this problem. Uh, my contact details are with Lynn Adamson, and I'm happy to discuss these matters at any time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. You're happy to take questions? Sorry, that was a question. I could have um, made it more question-sounding. Um, you've proposed alternatives that have been employed by what you call local authorities in similar jurisdictions, but in your, in your editorial piece you acknowledge that they are approaches that are beyond the scope of local authorities in New Zealand, so they're not quite similar jurisdictions, are they? I've spoken to several people about this. Um, I'm, this is not my area of expertise, needless to say. Um, local authority in, in Bath, in particular, is the city of Bath and what's called North East Somerset. Um, so it's, it's larger, and the, their uh, legal ability to make changes certainly would be different to Dunedin, because I gather a lot of the, the uh, ability for this sort of thing to be done by local authorities has been uh, sequestered by the central government over the years. So, I, again, I'm no expert in that, but the, the problem is uh, people, as I say, people I speak to are, are tired of being told we can't do this and looking for something that we can do. I suspect the licensing as businesses is something that we could do, because that's something they do anyway. Councillor Vincent Pope. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Thanks for coming in and thanks for your opinion piece, which I read with great interest. Are you aware of the... Um, the extensive work that the city 
has done, along with OUSA, on these matters, particularly the glass and the litter issue? Understood. So the problem is not that nothing is being done. The problem is that the situation is is really large, and it, that it's, I'm not expecting a rapid response or a rapid solution to the problem. But it is something that we actually need to start having long, wide-ranging discussions about, and deciding what we can do. Because the problem that is concerned, I talked about ongoing reputational damage. Um, I've spoken to lots of people who say when you have visitors back in the days when we could have visitors, and you walk around Dunedin, the visitors from overseas are absolutely appalled at the situation around the university campus. I would suggest if you want to get a perspective on this, now of course most of the university students are disappearing at the moment, but when they're back and in full swing, just take a drive around the campus on a Sunday morning. Um, we happened to do this because I was going on a walk with a group on a Sunday morning a couple of months ago. And the streets around, the residential streets around the campus were literally covered from side to side with broken glass. It was, it, this was not a minor problem at all. Also, take a walk up Cargill Street and London Street from top to bottom, because I walked back and forth to the hospital from where I live on Arthur Street. I did that on a regular basis. And squalid is the word that comes to mind. Again, I would never take a visitor up there because it gives an appalling impression of the city of Dunedin. If we're looking at having more and more people living in the central city, which I'm much in favor of, I used to live in the apartments on Downing Street in, uh, before I moved up to Arthur Street. And that was excellent, because there were no students around there, and it was great living in the central city. But if you want to encourage people to live in the central city, then you have to have a situation where somebody with a family with young children is prepared to live, and to walk up and down the streets and say, yeah, this is not a bad place to be. Just one um, follow-up to that, if I may. Um, in your view, the um, Sophia Charter, which was signed, I suppose, a year ago now with the university and other parties, has it, <clears throat> do you consider that's had a useful effect on attacking this problem? Sorry, can you repeat that? Are you aware of the Sophia Charter that was signed by various parties after Sophia Cristani's death in terms of student behaviour, cleanliness, looking after the campus? properties these days are indeed owned by women, uh, including some uh, present uh, in this room. But thank you for your time uh, and for your presentation this afternoon. We'll move on to the meeting proper. Apologies received from uh, Councillor Gary, and I'll move that Council uh, accepts those apologies. Seconded Councillor Staines. Thank you. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. 
A confirmation of the agenda. I'll move that Council confirm the agenda with the following alterations that item 21 of the future of Dunedin Railways be taken before item 7, and that item 13 of the DCC's submission on Te Kawa Ite Hei Papa Pata taking responsibility for our waste be withdrawn, as this item will now be considered at a subsequent Council meeting. Uh, seconded Councillor Staines. All those in favour? Oh, Councillor Vanivers. I just was wondering what the reason for withdrawing item 13 was. It was a very short turnaround and councillors had a limited opportunity to provide feedback on the submission. Subsequently, the ministry has extended the deadline until the 10th of December, so we're providing councillors with additional time to provide feedback. Thank you. Those against, that's agreed. Declarations of interest, any amendments? Councillor Hall. You could use your microphone, that might be helpful. Donor of a building to the Fire Restoration Society, I no longer supply it. Thank you. That'll be amended. Nothing else, in which case I'll move that Council amends the elected members' interest register and proposed management plan accordingly and further notes the executive leadership team's interest register. Second, Councillor Staines. All those in favour? Those against? That is agreed. Item. Uh, 20, oh, sorry, item five, actions from resolutions of council meetings. <coughs> I'll move that council note the open and completed actions from resolutions of council meetings. Seconded, Councillor Staines. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. The forward work program from the 10 year plan 21 to 31, incorporating the 22 to 23 annual plan. I'll move that Council notes that. Seconded, Councillor Staines. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Item 21, which is in your supplementary papers, the future of Dunedin Railways. Welcome, Mr Christie. Can't quite welcome Ms Graham, but she will also speak to the report. Anything? from either of you by way of introduction. Yeah, councillors, if I could just draw your attention to a typo in recommendation B. The um, year should read 21-22, not 22-23. Apologies for that. The funding is required um, this year for that work. It's B. B. Recommendation B. Recommendation B on page 4. Or it appear nothing from the other end of the table. So, question, questions? <laughs> Councillor Barker. Thank you, Isha. I just have a few questions. Um, when we've been discussing the future of Dunedin Railways, we've also been talking about it in a, in a wider context. And I keep asking these questions, I guess, is around the Dunedin Destination Plan. Um, have we got a date for when that might be completed? Yes, we're expecting a draft um, this side of Christmas, but we'll need to go out for further consultation to ensure that that draft uh, meets the expectations of our community. So I would be thinking first quarter of next year before that comes back to council as a final document. And what about the, um, the product development report, which is also funded through STAT? That was quite an important mm. um, document to, to put a lot of our product in context. Yes, that's uh, a concurrent piece of work alongside the destination plan, and it is underway. Uh, again, that, uh, that document is well through the process, but I wouldn't expect that until the first quarter of next year. Okay, that makes it kind of challenging to contextualise. I just, and my next question is around some of the scenarios, and in the scenario it has about a third international visitors, and I just wonder, given that um, other att attractions with international visitors, i.e. the Albatross, um, Larnet Castle, etc., have between 75% and 80% international visitors. And in scenario two, it has operations with improving tourist market and international visitors at a third. And because previously it had been 80% 80, 80%, I just wonder why that scenario came out as that. 
Yes, so those scenarios were based on DCHL's earlier work. Um, you're right, Councillor. The expectation would be that international visitor numbers generally should be higher than what's anticipated. Um, that's part of the difficulty we have um, with the current environment in that we don't have open borders and we have no idea of knowing what that international market will look like in the future. So DCH, DCHL's <laughs> previous work, that was, was that back in April that that was done? Yes, that's correct. And have they updated that work since then? I don't believe they have. No, and that was the basis for what which Mr Patterson uh, undertook his report on. I'm quite concerned about that because at the time I, I've got my all of my questions from that report then and I was concerned about the um, the report. So was that report peer reviewed at any time? I don't believe it has been peer reviewed, no. So given that um, Mr Patterson based a lot of his um, report on that report, how, um, I guess, I'm, I want to use the word valid, do you, cons I can't say consider, mm. um, how, how valid do you think some of these figures are, given that the first report had a lot of questions around it? JC, turn yours off for a sec. Yep. Um, Councillor, if I can, that, that is one of the biggest challenges that we faced in pulling this together and trying to provide you with advice is there's just so much uncertainty about all of the data we have, including the um, business case from the Trust, for example. There's some numbers in there that we haven't had time to test. Um, Mr Patterson's work, we, we've attached it and included some information about that, but without the other pieces of work that you've um, asked questions about, we simply don't have enough data to um, recommend anything other than we have, which is a, a placeholder position for Council until that information comes, and then we bring something back to you for consideration in the round. So would, would the future, it says that um, it recommends staff to, to keep working on this, that would that include looking at all of the, the different feasibilities, an option with the Otago Excursion Train Trust, an option with cycling, an option with Dunedin City Holdings, and whether there was any other option that hadn't been considered? All of that. I, I spoke to um, Kate Wilson yesterday and to try and check where they were at with their feasibility study. And unfortunately, they haven't been able to progress it for a range of reasons. And, and COVID has made some of that really difficult, and they're volunteers as well, many of them. So that work hasn't progressed at a pace that um, she would have hoped. So we, we don't have that information. Um, and in talking with DCHL, they are more than um, willing to look at different governance arrangements for the train um, before all that data is complete and are happy to work with the trust potentially to see what is available. But again, we only got their business case a number of days before this agenda went out, so haven't had time to test those numbers in. In reading them, I think they do need a wee bit of interrogation. So I guess my question is, why do we need to make this decision now? Is this, is this to do with the layers of expectation that go out to Dunedin City Holdings? or what? No, but if, you, if council are keen to um, look at progressing this and for next year, we're suggesting that we need to um, give DCHL some certainty. They will feed that through into their letter of expectation. But we were asked to report back, and so that's what we're doing. Councillor Raddick. Uh, yeah, the projection is 2.4 million per year for maintaining and operating the rail. Uh, has that amount of money been spent in each of the last two years to June 20 and 21? Uh, to this financial year, I think it is close to the 2.4 million, which is why DCHL are basing that number uh, for the future. I haven't got exact figures from um, this year, obviously, because we're still part way through the season. But last year's um, trial showed that the costs were significantly more than what they'd anticipated at the 1.59 million. Yes. And so that looks like continuing on. Um, yes, depending on the amount of track maintenance that's required, that's why the figure is up to 2.4 million. Yes, and for how many years do you expect or is the expectation that that will need to continue? Uh, well, there was a capital program that was projected for 10 years, so yeah. we're... I thought that um, was at 1.2. Yeah. yeah, so this is for the next two financial years until the next long-term plan, which would give enough time for any future analysis to be done on alternative proposals. 
Thank you. But, but this uh, 2.4 million covers off both the capital requirements and the operating costs of the service over that period? Yes, that's correct. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Your Worship. I don't know if you'd be able to um, help, but you might be able to provide this later or as part of any further report. But I was interested in the comment made in the submission about the funding, the public appeal funding. And it's sort of lost in the mists of time for me when we acquired the hardware track and sleepers. Um, I wonder if you are you able to clarify um, who actually paid for what? Because I was of the view that most of the financial uh, contribution was from the city. I don't have that to hand, um, but we no. can. Can you clarify that in due course when this matter is next on the table, please, as it will be? Thank you, Councillor Milley. Thank you, Worship. I'm um, just looking at um, Part D of the recommendation. Um, is and in terms of the long-term operations and governance of DRL. Um, and I think you partially answered it when you're answering Councillor Barker. Is the is the reason that we're giving funding out or looking for security out to 2024 in time to work through that body of work, and that that body of work will have to be done in time for that current LTP, so it gives us a, a safety boundary out past that. Yep, and there's a lot of work. There's a lot of moving parts in this, and it's a reasonably significant decision. Cool. Thanks. Ah, thank you. Um, thanks for the report. Um, I've just got some questions actually just around um, as councillors we sit around the table and we need really good data to make really good decisions and I was just wondering if there was consideration for completely independent reviews of feasibility. So getting um, people who are experts in the tourism field and such like to do independent reviews? Uh, yes, Councillor, we'd expect that any work is peer-reviewed as part of this process. Um, and um, I was just wondering, um, what, is there any um, separate costings for the cost of the Tyree Gorge maintenance as separate from the Southern Scenic Route? Uh, the Southern Scenic Route doesn't require any maintenance costs because it's taken care of by Kiwi Rail, and I think the track is leased as part of that arrangement, so it, it really just covers the, um, the middle march to a Wingatui component in terms of the maintenance. Thank you. Councillor Lofiso. Uh, tēnā koe, Your Worship. Uh, tēnā koe, um Mr. Christie, uh, I just have got a question. So, given that uh, if we approve this placeholder option, um, what um, what opportunity for engagement um, for residents and stakeholders such as Mr. Copeman would be uh, included in the mix, or is it up to the various trusts to seek his input? So, I can get that. We're waiting on the um, three or four pieces of significant work that um, Mr Christie has signalled. Once we get that, I think it'll, we'll need to look at what that shows and then what type of um, engagement would be most appropriate because initially there'd been a thought that we might um, consult as part of an annual plan. Um, I don't know if that's where we'll land or not. It depends on the decision you make here. Um, but either way, I think we do need to look at how we engage community. And one of the reasons, for example, that... Um, our former Councillor Wilson's um, work has been delayed is because they haven't been able to find a way to engage with mana whenua, and that's important to them as well. So there's a, a range of stakeholders that need to be engaged, including um, the community in the Strathtyree, who have a, a range of views about what they would like to see. So it's, it's, it's really complicated. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, the answer's probably going to be no, because it looks like there's quite a lot of information that's not available, but do you have any idea of what sort of tourist, obviously at the moment, domestic tourist dollar that we're missing out on from not linking into the cycle trails? No, I've got no idea, sorry, Councillor. Right. Do you think that would be something that might be worthwhile knowing in connection with this motion? 
I think over time we do want to understand how cycle trails um, economically benefit Dunedin City, um, either as individual components or as linked up um, trails to other networks. Uh, that is a piece of work that I think um, would be something that would be of benefit to the city to know, and at, at this stage it hasn't been um, initiated. But it, it, but it speaks to the real challenge with what we're facing here is yeah. that um, what's the product mix? Do you, and where are the, the benefits? Are the benefits in a cycle trail? Because it does seem that it's going to be very difficult to run both our, have train tracks and um, bikes all the way to Middlemarch, and so it is really, really challenging, and that's why we need the DDP work to be done. We need to look at strategically what it is as a city, um, what tourism product we think best promotes the city. And we don't have enough data to know whether that's trains, bikes, mm. or a combination at this point. So my concern is that if we vote on this motion today and the recommendations, is that does that mean any potential cycle trail that could be used along that track um, or cycle train, maybe a combination, could be delayed until 2024, according to this. Is that the at, case? At, at least, Councillor. At least. Um, yes, there's the, something at least. At least, but the, that is partly because the rail trail folk haven't done their feasibility study, and so that hasn't been completed. And without that having been done and then lined up against all the other pieces of information, we simply don't believe that we can um, provide council with advice on the future of the train other than um, maintaining the status quo for the next couple of years while that work is done. Given the huge financial, I think it's fair to say that Central Otago has had huge financial benefit from the cycle trails, would that be fair to say? Yes, it has had economic benefit. Yes. Is there any reason why as a city, rather than waiting for a, a trust that has limited funds, why we haven't done some sort of feasibility study around how we could tap into that dollar as well from a city's point of view? Because, because the, the elected membership of this body hasn't asked for that work to be done. Okay, so... They, you, you resolved that we support the um, trust in doing the work, and so that's what we've been doing. That was a resolution of council, which we've been trying to give effect to. Right. What sort of support does D, um, ED give the trust then to get that feasibility study done? So we've been assisting, uh, well, we've offered financial support along with um, track assessment and an engagement with Mana Whenua. So it's still pretty early days, but right. we've signalled that we um, will support that feasibility work. Yeah, thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, just following up from Councillor Hullohan's question, regardless of whatever we did, there's going to be a significant amount of spend in that corridor, so I would assume that anything we did would require something that would end up in the 2434 LTP. And Correct. to some extent, that's why this deadline's where it is. Correct, and, and this report doesn't speak to the um, capital costs either of the viaducts, which I think Councillor Vandervis mentioned around the $15 million mark. To say nothing of the considerable amount of planning uh, that would be required. Councillor Wiley. Um, Mr Christie, again, I, just to continue the point, it's, it's more about a combination of timing and how these projects can come together. So would that be a fair assessment? Uh, timing is required to complete all the pieces <laughs> of work required to uh, provide you with information uh, for which you can make um, a decision. Yes. And I would anticipate that it would take probably roughly five years for a cycle trail from the beginning of a process to be implemented. At least that's my take on what it took. The, the Clutha, the new Clutha trail so would probably took I think that, that neither Mr Christie or I are in a position to say how long it would take to get the tracks but, up but, to develop but it would a cycle take, trail. It takes a number of years. It's it would take not an a, extended period of time and the Central Otago rail trail took an extended period of time. Correct. So what I'm trying to get at is if we elected to vote down um, the recommendations and supporting the 2.4 million, it's not like the tracks would be ripped up and people would be riding cycles there in the next um, year or so. The process would take yeah, no, dramatically longer. It, it, that is unlikely. And again, our advice is that we don't have enough information to provide you 
with um, independent staff advice on the future of the corridor and the decision to lift the tracks is, you know, once you've done that, the, any future train operations um, would never be restored. And so, and that may be where you end up, but at the minute we don't have enough inf information to be able to provide you with okay. advice. Okay, and, and just to follow on, regardless though, we are still looking at the $400,000 cost in relation to storing the train. You're um, looking at both but, but, costs? The yeah, 2.4 uh, exists for both options? Yep. Yeah. But the 400 is is, an, is is a vital one. Oh, and the 2.4. So even yeah. if you decide to um, cease operation from 1 July, that $2.4 million, almost all of that is still required um, to, according to DCHL. Okay. Thank you. It just won't, it just won't have any revenue to offset it. Councillor Lord. Thank you. Um, can I just ask questions, probably of the Chief, but has it ever been established that if the tracks were removed and all the assets sold, that we would actually have the right to do what we wish with that bit of land, or would that revert to New Zealand Rail to dispose of how they see fit? Or I don't know the answer to that, do you, JC? Um, I do know the rail corridor is leased um, as part of the arrangement, so we may not have full unfettered access to that track in the future, but I, I'd have to confirm that. But I, what I do know is that those kind of issues were able to be worked through for the part of the rail trail that is in, is in place from Middlemarch to Clyde. But yeah. what the situation is as of today, neither of us know. OK, thank you. Yeah, so I hadn't... I hadn't thought about that, so that's probably right. They're not going to put a train track in, for example. Yeah. Councillor Reddick. Uh, yes, I'd just uh, like to hear a bit more about the 2.4 million. Uh, if we were to do nothing, also, what I mean by that is we perhaps still run the train as the seasider, but do nothing on that middle march line. What is the 2.4 million per year that we? say is still required, what would that be spent on? Uh, so that would be to maintain track tunnels, bridges to a level that would allow a future service, should that be decided to operate on that line. Brilliant. And so that doesn't include any uh, upgrade or, you know, that's just to be able to use a train. Do we have any data on maintenance of that? This is the middle march line we're talking about as far as Hendon, but do we have any numbers on the maintenance of that uh, with a view to turning it to a cycle trail. That, well, I would expect it to be lower, but do we have any numbers? So the maintenance cost is for a level, a higher level of maintenance to Hinden and a lower level of maintenance to Middlemarch to allow for future decisions to be made. So it really is a do minimum option should you wish to retain a train service. But keep all options open for yes. retention of the train. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Risha. Um, I just want to check with the STAP money, and I'm trying to remember what STAP stands for, Strategic Tourism Asset Protection Program. Sorry, the RTO money that's coming in. Is the government has put, is, is it correct, 1.7 million into Dunedin RTO? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And of that, there's a certain amount that's being spent on the product development review. Yes, that's also correct. So are other RTOs, I think there's maybe 30 altogether, are they also doing product development work? Um, I believe some are, yes. So when they did their work, we would be able to benchmark ours to see what our unique points are against us? Uh, yes, definitely. It is, uh, the contractor that we have doing that work, I know, has undertaken similar work elsewhere oh, in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. My other question is around um, the number of great ride cycle trails in New Zealand. Would it be correct that there's 32 great ride cycle trails in...? I actually don't know, sorry, Councillor. OK, so, so there are over 30 um, great ride trails in, in New Zealand. Do you know the percentage of tourists that would go on cycle trails? I don't have that data either, sorry, Councillor. So that would be part, maybe part of the product development week. And I just wonder if you know the number of... Um, is, is Tyree Gorge Railway a unique rail attraction in New Zealand, or are there other rail attractions? Um, I understand. Trail, there aren't too many tra uh, rail attractions that are exactly the same, which is the definition of unique, Councillor. 
Are there other rail attractions in New Zealand? Obviously, there's the uh, trans scenic, etc. But are there any other railways that might operate like Tari Gorge Railway? Uh, no, and it is globally recognised as being quite unique for the city. Thank you. I would contend you can't be quite unique, Mr. Christie, but uh, Councillor Elder. Um, I just want to touch on a point that um, Carmen mentioned, and that is um, she asked your question around has there been any work done on the benefits of connecting to um, there are th three potential great rides that um, one finishes just within our boundary and two finish outside of our boundary. Has there been any um, funding put to look at um, the benefits of connecting to those at all? Um, not by us at this point in time and I'm not aware of anyone else that's undertaken that work. So do you think there could be benefit in, in looking at that wider piece of connecting across the region? I would anticipate as part of the work that the Otago Central Rail Trail Trust will do should um, at least be looking at the connecting routes that it would be party to and should provide some analysis around that. Um, because I would like to foreshadow um, saying that we should be investing in something like that. Um, um, and, yeah, no, that, that, thought, that was my question, really. Uh, thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Bishop. I um, just want to get back to the costing of up to 2.4 million. Um, in the report, you refer to a cost of 2.4 million and then a ticket revenue of 250,000. So is that a total outgoings in of 2.65 million offset by 250,000? Yes, that would be correct. An interpretation of that. Yeah. And so, um, and I'll just touch it in my speech later. So if the revenue were to be anything greater than 250,000, that expected number in terms of the up to 2.4 would start to go down. Is that the intention? Yes, very much dependent on how many visitors utilise that service. Um, so assuming it doesn't require any further funding to actually operate the service, so the revenue from the last trial of the trains, not planes, basically broke even. Right, OK, thanks. Mr Christie, do you have... And it's come subsequent to this report being written, I appreciate, but any uh, initial... Uh, indication from DCHL or DA, DRL insofar as the different entities about uh, under which conditions in the government's traffic light framework such a service would be able to operate? Does it need to be in green or can it also operate under orange? Well I had a, um, if I might mm. worship, had a chat with Mr Davies yesterday um, about that just trying to work out what it meant and they are still working through the logistics of what orange would mean for them because it does require how they would manage um, vaccination passports on the train, how they would maintain distance and whether they could, whether it was actually going to be viable um, with the number of how that would work. So he's not, they're not sure yet they're working through it. Green would definitely see them be able to go ahead but orange um, they don't know yet. And if we're to, I mean, if we're to take this decision as recommended, and over the course of the summer, the government's response framework makes it overly difficult to operate, would we have the opportunity before the next financial year to revisit this in any way, shape or form? Yes. Acknowledging that the bulk of the cost is effectively a, a holding fee for any potential future use as opposed to the running costs of the service. Thanks. Councillor Raddick. Just looking at the return on investment from the 2.4 million, item uh, 14 in the report, it talks about in 21, the most recent year, 5,800 passengers resulting in 200,000 of direct economic value to the city, which is a very low return of investment. However, uh, under this scenario of 16, you've got an additional 16,000 out-of-town visitors. So that would return a $2 million direct economic value, so coming so, well, a whole lot closer to that 2.4 investment. 
Uh, am I reading that correct? Yes. Good. So, um, I don't know, has any, I suppose it's just in the lap of the gods as to how COVID goes, as to whether uh, we'd get an influx of out-of-town visitors? The, the modelling here was premised off the fact that you would either have a strong tourist market returning or a weaker one, and I think if you look at the overall report from Benji Patterson, um, there is a wider economic benefit than just straight ticket sales that occurs when you are operating a service such as the Dunedin Railway Service. That return is greater the more visitors you have, and it's greater the more international visitors you have. Yes, well, under the international scenario, you're talking 3,600. Well, that, uh, well, I can't see that happening personally, but uh, certainly the minimal international visitor scenario is, has the potential. Uh, certainly for this season, yes. don't know if COVID is quite in the lap of the gods, Councillor. I think uh, human action uh, will have some part uh, in how community transmission affects us or not. Councillor Vanivers. Given that <coughs> DCHL are being asked to fund um, this and that DCHL have come up with a lot of these numbers, why is it that we don't have someone from DCHL to quiz here today? We felt that we were able to answer your questions. We being Mr Christie? Yep, it was my decision. Thank you. Councillor Elder. I'm just looking at option two, and it says do not continue with current interim DHL model, including funding, operating and maintaining DRL service. And I was just wondering, um, how would that, um, is there an option of just running the Southern Scenic route? I mean, why is that not an option? And um, because if we, um, if we discontinue funding, that would stop both the Tyree Gorge and the Southern Scenic Route. It's just a question. The Southern Scenic Route relies on um, Kiwi Rail Line, so it avoids any maintenance costs, but you still have a maintenance cost for the Tyree Gorge, whether you use that for any service or not. If you run a service on that, um, you can draw additional revenue. Okay. okay, I just wanted to find that out. Oh. That option, option two, is effectively a decision to, well, not never uh, run a service uh, on that line, but uh, not be able to do that at a later date without considerable cost to start that service back up again. That's correct. Thanks. Councillor O'Malley. Sorry, Your Worship, but just everybody keeps asking questions and another question comes to mind. Um, it's a question of the CEO and your um, discussions with DVML over the traffic light system. Um, it came to my attention that there was a difference in advice from MB and DVML over running an excursion train during level two. And so I'm wondering if when you're doing this discussion, are you getting the MB feedback at the same time and looking for consistency? The advice from Central Government seems to be changing on a daily basis, so we have been looking at, at it all, and I know Mr Davies is looking at advice from everywhere. But you'll see today there's been new announcements which may well change the situation. Um, when questions are finished, can I foreshadow that I would like to move the recommendations? Thank you, that's helpful. Councillor Wiley. Um, Slightly different uh, question. Um, the three water assets in relation to the Tyree Gorge line, um, do we have any indication of what the, the future of three waters would look like in relation to that network? I'm sorry, Councillor, what assets are you referring to? Well, for example, to? the viaduct, as I understand it, the viaducts carry the, the water pipe. Is that not correct? The, there's an infrastructure runs through along the viaducts and things like that. I can't answer that, Councillor, but the, as with any of the three water assets, we will be working through a process of what happens to them if the reform proceeds. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hulahan. 
Given at the moment we've got no, you know, little or no international tourists um, because of COVID, and because of COVID, we probably haven't got a lot of domestic tourists moving around, particularly from Auckland at the moment. Um, it, does that mean that this trial is really, you know, going to start with a limp, really, than a, you know, because it's what, we're, we're limited on the numbers that this this can access, really, isn't it? I don't know, well, so I don't know if it's fair to characterise it as a, as a trial. It's a, the proposal was for a continuation of the service that was operated over the last summer for a further two summers. Well, is it fair to say that most of the users of the train previously were international tourists? Um, there was, a, there was an international market, but there was also a heavy domestic market for the Torrey Gorge trip. Percentage-wise, how many were international compared to domestic? It's in the papers. Yeah, yeah it's, it's high um, for, for international, I think, is the case. Is that correct? Um, I think it's about equal for both international and domestic. I have to go back and relook at the numbers. It's right. in paragraph 14 of the report. Yes, which is... So... Yeah, I suppose my question is, is it, you know, it's, it's not giving it the best opportunity to, would it be fair to say, starting off in these, this situation? Councillor, what we're recommending is that while we get all the data that we're waiting for and in these COVID times, that the services continue to operate and not in a trial, we're not referring to it as a trial, it's just maintaining the line um, to Hinden, um, doing that, as maintaining the assets and operating a service where we can um, while we spend the next year or two looking at governance options, getting the information on tourism, getting the information about tracks, cycle, the feasibility study, so that you can then make a decision. So we're not suggesting that we will judge the success or otherwise of the next few months. Um, that's not the suggestion. Councillor Vanders. Regarding, um, uh, uh, sorry, had a brain fade. Oh, re regarding the issue over um, whether or not the viaducts and bridges carry any of the town's water supply, my clear understanding is that the town's water supply is completely independent of those bridges and viaducts, um, and the uh, water supply that goes across Tioma Gorge, for instance, is a viaduct all of its own, completely independent of the rail network. And, and that's my understanding of that pipeline. Whether or not we have any other assets that are attached um, that are smaller, um, I don't know. But the main supply, absolutely. But right. I, I, didn't, I can't be 100% certain that every single one of our water assets is unlinked to the corridor. <coughs> It's been moved by Councillor Barker. Is there a second? Uh, seconded Councillor Walker. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Worship. I um, have been a long time supporter of the train and obviously the tourism industry. Is it something I've, I've lived all my life, so I have a lot of insight into this. At the moment, due to COVID, things are tough and we don't have enough information to go forward on these decisions. So I feel that. Um, Number one recommendation, um, sorry, I just find my place, continue with the DCHL model until the 30th of June 2024 gives us the best option to wait for some time when we have some more clarity. Government's funded um, Enterprise Dunedin through $1.7 million to do some work on what the tourism industry is going to look like in the future. This includes both looking at cycling, looking at the train, the operating models, etc., and what makes Dunedin different to all of the other cities and our visitor attractions. Previous to COVID, um, tourism brought $700 million into Dunedin as visitor spend. It was 5% of GDP and 6% of unemployment. 6% employment um, and I'm not saying that we're going to get back to the good old days because things have changed however we do expect um, tourism to continue into the future. The advantages of option one um, are that it does allow 
Enterprise Dunedin to go ahead doing the strategic work, the Dunedin Destination Plan, which is going to be vital to us making decisions, the product development work, which is what I'm particularly interested in, um, and help council make decisions for the future. It keeps the options open. I don't think we can make any decisions today based on we just don't have enough information, and that's come through loud and clear through all of the questioning and through the report here. It allows time for the Otago Central Rail Trail to conduct their feasibility study, um, which has been held up. It allows time for the Otago Excursion Train Trust, who presented here today, to do their business case, look at the feasibility, and, and for council to assess all of the options. The costs of providing the service, of course, can be partially offset by passenger revenue, and we've got a, a new system, the traffic light system, and we still don't understand how that will affect the ability of Tauri Gorge Railway to operate, so that is, um, we will see how that plays out. We are talking about trials, but we are in uncertain times. Um, just go through. And it retains a visitor attraction in the city at a time when other tourism attractions are reduced in the city. And we look at Blooping's Pukakura, which is closed until maybe January, and who knows if they're going to open. Of course, we lost Cadbury's. We have other visitor attractions that are operating under um, small times. We had some people who had actually come into where I volunteer, and they said that they had booked on the train, which had been cancelled. And we know that the train, according to the... Um, information that Enterprise Dunedin have given us is, is one of the most searched uh, visitor attractions in Dunedin. It's absolutely vital that we keep this um, iconic tra attraction for Dunedin. Um, and it allows for a service by a provider, Dunedin City Holdings, with two years' experience of running Dunedin um, railways in an unpredictable market. So it's in um, safe hands in the interim, and I think this is the, the best decision that we can make today. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Vanavis. It's been repeated many times already that we don't have enough information, we don't have enough detailed data. And certainly the detailed data that you may want to have regarding future numbers of international tourists, etc., uh, evades us, but I believe that may always evade us. What we do have is a lot of uh, large, undetailed, if you like, information, which should be enough, in my view, to make a sound business decision on the rails. The Needham Rail. If you look at on page uh, seven uh, of thirty-eight, yeah, seven. If you look at uh, item fourteen, it gives us the detailed number of visitors that we had in two thousand nineteen using the rail journey, and there were seventy-six thousand of them. If you go to B in two thousand twenty-one, there were only five thousand eight hundred. This is what, in the business world, you would call a complete collapse of your market. And anything that might have been viable at 76,000 visitors uh, hasn't got a ghost of a chance of being viable at 5,000. But we have more information than that. We also know that even at 76,000, with the cruise ships and the overseas tourists, Dunedin Rail was effectively losing one and a half million dollars every year that it ran for that last decade simply because of not doing the necessary maintenance on the line that was drawing those customers to them. So even when we had 76,000 visitors and we're trying to break even on it, the loss, the actual loss, hard bottom line financial loss was one and a half million dollars every year in the good times. Given the now bad times and the uncertain times that are certainly coming, I believe that we have plenty of information, orders of magnitude information, showing that there is absolutely not a snowball's chance in hell of any financial return uh, coming from uh, Dunedin Rail, um, or even a social return. And I recognise that there has been quite a social component 
uh, and spin-off component for tourism in having the rail trail. Prior to COVID and prior to the cessation of the cruise ship market, I was always very supportive of even subsidising the Needham Rail because of the spin-off social benefits that there were, the fact that it was a great attraction. I like playing trains with the best of them. We have a marvellous big Markland set at home. Um, and when I grew up, we grew up beside the railway line in Balclutha and we used to love the trains and I've always had a great fondness for them. I understand all of that. But we now have, uh, we now no longer have an asset in Dunedin Rail. We have a liability of extraordinary proportions. 2.4 million just to keep it kind of as an option every year given that we've already wasted 2.4 million last year and presumably the year before as well to try and keep an option open and get more information to me is not a prudent use of ratepayer funds we've had two years of trialing and trying to look at options and still no possible solution to the $15 million deferred maintenance problem. We, to be responsible, need to bite the bullet and recognise that there is no saving Dunedin Rail. We can throw 2.4 million at it next year, we can throw another 2.4 million at it the year after, and we will get some new information. But I don't believe it'll be significantly different from the information we have now. And the information we have now shows that it was an unsustainable operation in the good times, losing $1.5 uh, million a year, and it is a desperately unsustainable operation now and in the foreseeable future. I believe that we should have had a DCHL representative here today, someone that I could have quizzed on their original recommendation for what we do it's with your five, your five minutes, Rail. Councillor. And I urge you to consider voting against the recommendations on the basis that buying more information Councillor. over the next two years with $5 million is unsustainable. Councillor Staines. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm speaking in support of the resolution. When we look at this, this is a heritage asset. It's a significant heritage asset for the city. When it's lost, if it's lost, if we don't accept these resolutions, it will be lost, then it will never come back again. So Council has, I believe, a significant moral obligation to ensure that firstly, we have all the data we need to make a recommendation to our citizens and ratepayers so that they can have an input into whether this heritage asset is lost and converted into a cycle trail or it is funded to the extent that it can remain in operation. And I, I have little doubt that for the foreseeable future it will not be able to wash its face. Earlier today we heard comments around you know, move forward an, an analogy with the Stock Exchange building's demolition. I'm pretty certain that if we asked the public today if they would rather have had that building retained with a cost to the city to, to you know, maintain it, the decision would have been we keep it. This is a heritage city. This is part of that fabric. So in supporting the resolutions, I'm supporting making sure we absolutely know what the future will look like and that we do give our ratepayers and the public of this city the opportunity to say whether they wish to support it by putting in rates input, because I think it will need it, or they don't. And once we get to that point, then I think we can make the decision for which direction we take in the future. Councillor Reddick. Yes, well, it seems to me this uh, paper and decision is all about uncertainty. And of course, we do live in uncertain times. 
And so I suppose it's an appropriate paper for us to be considering in this uh, COVID period. And it's, we don't know, we know next to nothing, actually. We've got a little bit of information from the past, from just recent years, and we have no idea of the costs for the future. We have not much, we're not a very accurate idea of the costs going forward. We are certainly no uh, certainty of the incomes going forward. And we do have a range of options, or uh, two or three options that have been presented to us today, and that we will have to make further decisions on in the future. The critical thing to me is that we have um, Dunedin's most iconic building, which is the or most iconic building in public ownership, which is the railway station. And we have alongside of that, and included in that package, the most iconic experience in Dunedin, which is the Tyree Gorge Rail. And they are both key factors in our heritage um, uh, marketability and presentation not only to our own citizens but to the outside world. And I agree with Councillor Vandivis that they are two very large liabilities. But there is really only one source of income to offset those liabilities and that is the Tyree Gorge Rail or Dunedin Railways Limited. And I am mindful when we look back at item 14A that the 76,000 visitors in 2019 there, were, there was $10 million of direct economic benefit, which in my mind offsets the 1.2 or 1.5 or even 2.4 million that should have been spent on track maintenance. And so just as uh, what happened with the most iconic building in private ownership in Dunedin, a very large amount of money and time and effort had to be spent on that building before it started to produce an economic return. And I'm thinking of the castle out there on the peninsula, of course. And I think it's beholden on us to spend some money and give the rail a chance to succeed uh, because that is the, the primary source of income that will help keep the railway station paid for, and no one is suggesting we demolish the railway station. That's our most iconic, the most uh, photographed building in town. And having something that can generate income for it and for the city and one offset in the other, I think is critically important at this stage. And I'm also mindful of scenario 16, uh, well, and item 17, that with just a, a small portion of the visitors, so 16,000 versus the 76, so only a quarter of the visitors, less than a quarter of the visitors, it would still, it could generate $2 million in direct uh, economic benefits. So if we came close to that, we would almost offset our 2.4 million that we have to put in for maintenance of the track and the whole apparatus. The other side of that coin is if it doesn't uh, come to pass that that uh, line up to middle March is viable. We can always convert that to a rail trail and I am inclined to think that we get a lot more cyclists using that rail trail into the future. But this test and this um, experiment over the next couple of years will also, I hope, solidify the Seasider as a very uh, um, significant attraction for Dunedin and to visitors from out of town. So they'll still get to go to the railway station and still get to ride in the train. And to me, the most logical final solution would be to have um, a rail trail going to Central and the train going to Omaru or thereabouts. However, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty that we have now that hopefully will be resolved over the next two years. And so uh, I'll be supporting the spending of the money in the meantime. Councillor Walker. Um, yep, thank you, Your Worship. Um, really interesting questions and interesting comments around this, um, I have to say. Um, I was happy to second this. Um, and, you know, for, for me, it was actually reading very well written staff report and the Benji Batson report made it, I think, fairly straightforward for me to come to quite an early decision. Um, but it has been good to hear other viewers around the table. Firstly, just to one of Councillor Van Der Vis's points, I think it's worth uh, noting and understanding that there's many things 
that we put money into that lose money, but we and the public uh, deem that money well spent, and thankfully we do that. Everything is not simply just based on economic return, and there's a plethora, plethora of things that many residents and ratepayers in the city use that don't make money. Um, many questions for me around the table sort of answered, answered themselves in that it highlighted um, the fact that there is a, a complete lack of information and much, much more information is needed. You only have to look at the staff report uh, to, to, to dig out words too early to evaluate insufficient information, um, mu much uncertainty, and the CEO's words uh, when she said there's lots of work to be done and lots of moving parts. Um, I'm, I'm still particularly a fan of a potential mixed model down the line. I don't see why it has to be one or the other. So I'm, you know, I'm really looking forward to, to, to robust you know, investigations into the poss possibility of that working. I've, you know, I, I, I live next door to an engineer and his, his words have always resonated in my ears that absolutely nothing from an engineering perspective is impossible. Everything is possible. Um, and Councillor... Um, Councillor Reddick uh, pointed out uh, wrongly, actually, that uh, the railway station is Dunedin's most iconic uh, building. I'd argue it's New Zealand's most iconic building. And, and I think the two are, are, are inseparable, actually, the Tyree Gorge Railway and, and that building. And it reminds me almost, you know, it's having, having that wonderful building down there without trains is almost akin to having a airport without planes. And I think, it, you know, for me, it's, it's a, the, 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 they're truly, truly in, interlinked. Um, and also, those who have read the report, and I've, I've certainly played through it, uh, won't, won't you know, be left in any doubt that heritage is what sells this city. I'd love, I'd love it to be wildlife. That's, that's my area, but it's actually heritage. That's, that's the overriding reason why people come here. And I think uh, Councillor Staines' comments around a, pre, a building that was knocked down uh, confirm that. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm supportive. I look forward to, 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 in the future, sitting around this table, if I'm fortunate enough to be re-elected, um, to look at some, some really you know, exciting, worthy options um, that take, t take, take this project forward, both for, you know, for the train, um, for tourist enjoyment, for cyclists, for walkers, and even for horse riders. Go figure. Never seen a horse while I've been cycling, but... I'm sure they're out there somewhere. So, yep, happy to, happy to support um, the motion. Don't ride through Sawyer's Bay often enough. Councillor Houlihan. Yes, we have quite a few horses in St. Leonard's, actually. Uh, yes, well, as uh, um, Councillor Vandiver said, you know, it's a lot of money. It's, it's a burden on our city. And, yes, he's probably right. And we could give up. We could shut down one of the most iconic, I'd argue, um, apart from saying Aotearoa, I would go even further and say one of the most beautiful buildings in the world, our railway station. And it is a, a stunning um, station. And it would be, in my opinion, um, we'd be giving up and saying that COVID had won if we just decided to say let's leave this operation, not support it anymore. And Councillor Walker is correct. There are quite a few things around our city that don't make money that we support. And we support them for good reason. We support them because they help the well-being of our people. They make our city a happier place to be. They bring more history, more heritage, more culture. Look around our city. What have we got when I drive into the city and I look up on our hills, I see the um, Otago Boys High School and that beautiful building that's there. All the buildings around that city, the uh, first church that when I get out, out of the car, as I arrive here, the buildings that surround us, we are absolutely privileged and uh, our city is, has an overwhelming number of beautiful heritage buildings. And this trip is, uh, some people, particularly journalists, hate that word, iconic, but it is. It is an iconic train journey. I've been on it many times. It is, though, I would say, expensive for uh, families uh, to do that trip. However, 
I think, yes, we could get bogged down in the pessimism of everything because that's what's happening. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of cautionness at the moment. But what I would say is that I do not think our city is a lot of people who want to give up. We're not built on people who give up easily. We're built on pioneers who are settlers who came here from overseas. They're sturdy. They've got strong foundations, and they're not people who give up easy, and they don't say, oh, you know, give it up. That's not an attitude people in Dunedin, Otipoti have, in my opinion. And what I would say is that people want us to support things like this because it is part of Dunedin. The railway station, the train journey, and there's also lots of extra opportunities with this. We can investigate how we could, I'd like to see, like some of the other councillors have mentioned, bringing in the cycleway into this. Ideally, using the train and the cycles will be my preferred option, but we need to investigate and do a feasibility study around this as to how it could work. Uh, but it's proven in a fact that after pandemics, economies all around the world have boomed and I think that's going to happen for the hot for the world and New Zealand Aotearoa is seen as a gem and Dunedin is obviously we're the center of the earth here and we are part of that so come a year or two hopefully as soon as possible but you know when it is safe and we open up, people are going to pour in here and we will have things, a, a beautiful, internationally acclaimed train journeys, for example, to offer them. Otherwise, we come and pay, what will be here to offer? We don't want to go, oh, we're here and there's nothing to do. Dunedin's a beautiful city and we have got fantastic attractions and I think we need to back this. Thank you. Thank you. I think the city was built on Māori land council. I'm starting to get um, the sense of I'm stuck inside a child writing their address, Dunedin, New Zealand, the Southern Hemisphere, the world, the Milky Way, the galaxy. Is it the most iconic building in the universe, Councillor Elder? Um, I would like to support this um, motion and I kind of um, really refer to Councillor Sophie Barker's um, questions and her um, statement that in fact we do not have enough information to make a really good decision right now. The COVID-19, uh, COP26, the future of tourism, international tourism, domestic tourism, we do not know what's happening in the future and so I think we need um, one, we need clear feasibility studies to indicate the data we need to make good decisions. In my mind, there are two parts to the continuation of our historic excursion train. The first I really fully endorse, leaving from our historic railway station and exploring the southern scenic routes, um, to me makes sense, using Kiwi rail tracks at a lower cost and contributing to the economies and vibrancy of local communities like Waitati or wherever they visit. I think that's a, a no-brainer and we need to continue to put that. For me, the big question is how do we make the most of the Tairi Gorge? And I think that's the big issue we've got today. This is the most stunning, dramatic and historic landscape that is a treasure or a taonga for the, the people of Dunedin, for the whole of Dunedin. So how can we use this taonga best to add the social, economic, environmental and cultural well-beings of our people in the present and for the future, which is our job as a local government? How does this meet our future strategic goals? What do we want to invest in? And we need that data. We need to know what we, to make the best decision. Do we want to invest in enabling our whole community to have free access to this beautiful landscape? Do we want to invest in something that is low carbon and decreases the carbon footprint of travel and tourism? Do we want to invest in something that improves physical, mental well-being of our people? Do we want to invest in creating one, two and even week-long adventures for our people that is on bike or on your feet? 
Those are questions we all have to ask. How do we invest and how do we enable all of our city to access the beauty and, and the history that is the Tyree Gorge? So I believe we have to have an open mind as to the potential of the Tyree Gorge and look at our whole strategic network and also this, the region, regional network. Um, we have to have an open mind about a shared walking, biking, horse riding trail that is free for the whole community to use. That's why we need a full and comprehensive feasibility study on a shared trail to be done before we can make any decisions. Um, so supporting t this to be done is very important as we have all got to have the good data to make good decisions. So I believe this needs to go back to our whole community um, and uh, in the future um, we need to have engagement on this. Um, I would also like to see, um, as Carmen mentioned, a uh, strategic uh, or study done on the benefits of connecting to all the trails across the region because I think that's a regional strategic opportunity that we need to investigate. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that the railway station is probably the most iconic building in the solar system. I wouldn't go beyond that. Yeah. Um, and we don't know what's happening on the dark side of the moon either, so that might not be correct. Um, the, I'm not going to get into the economic models because I think you know, that's what the whole point of this is, that we're going to go and check that. I'm looking, though, at Part D of the resolution um, and looking at the long-term operation and governance of Dunedin Railways Limited. Um, it's been a long time since the Otago Expression Train Trust was the actual operator and runner of the train, and DVML is doing a good job, but trains is not there not their game. And I think that we need to look at that structure because that might have a lot big impact on the operating model and that'll have a big impact on the ability of the model to generate income and the income will then be important to us, understand what our liabilities will be going forward. Um, and then my only other comment is we may have to take a third option if we decide that maintaining those viaducts is too expensive and that is not allowing anybody up there at all because the viaducts will be expensive and they will have their own maintenance costs regardless of whether it's a bike or a train going over them. So in that model will in fact be a lots of other things to consider. Um, and I think I don't need to speak any longer. Thank you very much. Very considerate of you, Councillor. Councillor Lofiso. Uncle, Your Worship, I'd just like to record my thanks to um, Ms Graham and Ms Christie for preparing um, the reports that we're considering and also thank the mover and seconder. Um, for me, uh, like Councillor O'Malley, um, I'm not really interested in business models, etc. I think that COVID-19 has presented us a wonderful opportunities uh, for us to, to uh, shake up upside down the whole paradigm, economic paradigm, with which we have to operate within. I note that um, Max Rush, uh, Rush, Rushbrook made a, um, a media release uh, last week talking about uh, how classless and egalitarian um, we are not, and that probably the top 10% of this society owns probably closer to 70% of the assets. So what I'm very interested in in supporting this um, motion is just the very practical um, everyday realities of people who work for Dunedin City Railways. If we were to not go forward, that means people are jobless. And um, as Councillor O'Malley said in the past, um, sometimes when it's interacting with the CCOs, we could be, we could sucker ourselves into saying we're council owned only, but I'm very uh, thankful today that we're council controlled because that means we have an influence over the everyday lives of people who work for City Railway. And um, yeah, okay, with the, the business models, we can just say, yep, let's cut it because it's, we're not getting a great return on investment. But then that's the future and lives of people. And so I think that our role as leaders in the city is to try wherever possible is to, like other colleagues have said, have hope, have certainty, and not contribute to um, you know, the economic burdens and financial survival of people and families in this city. Thank you, Councillor Wiley. 
Um, thank you. First off, I want to thank both submitters that came to speak uh, to us on this issue. And, you know, both spoke with great passion and uh, desire for what they wanted from essentially the Tyree Gorge route. Um, and both brought some really good perspectives to what could be developed up in that area. Um, I will be supporting this. Um, first off, I look at uh, A as um, funding up to 2.4 per annum. Hopefully we won't have to be all of 2.4, but uh, and hopefully we have good revenue uh, to offset some of that. But it is funding up to uh, 2.4. The 400,000 and B, that's a, a cost that's going to be incurred regardless, um, unless we were going to sell off all the uh, assets, which I would be very much against um, in that sense. But we do have to spend the 400,000 regardless. Uh, the C, noting the uh, continuing support of the Otago Central Rail Trust and what they're doing, um, as per the question I asked, nothing is going to happen tomorrow. It's going to be a three to five year proposition, whatever happened in the development of a Cent Otago Central Rail Trust uh, extension between Middlemarch and Wingatui. And also, I think when you look at D, that makes sense to me in the sense of the time it's going to take to come back and really get an understanding of where to next. I think all of us would love a crystal ball in this room, um, even if it was just to work out what's going to happen in the next month, let alone the next six months, next year, two years, or through to 2024. Um, none of us have lived through a time like this, so for us to try and make decisions and second guess and work out what the outcomes are going to be, um, it is what it is. We just have to basically, unfortunately, make decisions as we go and as the Prime Minister and our CEO love to say, you know, we're, we're building the plane as we're flying it. And that's pretty much the way that some of these decisions are going to have to be made. Um, but we have to also, in our case, be conscious this is ratepayers' funds. This is DCC money that we are looking to invest in this. Um, so when also we look at where a train product, and, and I think that's the key is, I think the, the essence I get around the table is most of us believe that there is a great train product to be had in Dunedin. And whether it's going up the Tyree Gorge or whether it's a coastal excursion product, there is a great train product to be had for a Dunedin. There is also opportunity for a great cycle journey, and that is developing and tourism, and we're seeing the data about it. Um, I struggle when I hear cycling is a new golf, but that's, well, that's a debate for another day. Golf is still doing very nicely, thank you. But cycling is booming, the electric bike has changed, and cycle networks are great tourism assets. Is there a, a mix there? Is there a blend there? Well, I guess that's what we'll find out from the Otago Central Rail Trail Trust uh, in time. But the key thing for me is we have to support the tourist assets of our city. Every time we lose a tourist asset, that's jobs, that's people, that's money, that's vibrancy of our city. When you look at people, and again, I'm not going back to cruise ship days, because if they come back, that will be a great benefit, but won't be for many years. But if we go back to just last summer, the people that came and rode the train and visited from around the country, they stayed in bed nights. They ate in restaurants. They spent money around town. And they also visited other tourist attractions. But even a lot of our own local people got out and did a lot of great tourism attractions, and that's important. This is not just all about the visitors, it's also about our residents enjoying and getting out and seeing our city. So to me, this is about supporting the Dunedin tourism industry as a whole. And remember, tourism is a big part of our city. It's the attractions, it's the hotels, it's the motels, it's the restaurants, it's the bars, it's the people. It's the people, it's the people, it's the people. It's the vibrancy of our city. So I will continue to support this. Thank you. Councillor Barkey, a right of reply. Thank you, Worship. After Councillor Wiley's speech, I almost have nothing to say. However, I just would like to respond to um, Councillor Vandivis talking about um, the Tyree Gorge Railway not making any profit. And for 10 out of the 12 years between 
2007 and 2018, they did make a profit. Board I'm not border. I can anticipate the, the argument that we're about to have here between the operating cost of the entity as it existed and the maintenance cost deferred or otherwise of the infrastructure. Uh, but I, I don't think, I think both I'll of you... I'll withdraw. <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Exactly. Um, so I would also just like to talk about, uh, Councillor Staines talked about the, um, the stock exchange and I was at an, an event on um, Saturday evening looking at the stock exchange and my heart kind of broke because that was the loss of a significant heritage asset and I would hope that we would not allow that to happen to the Tauri Gorge Railway as well. It's been um, great to hear all the support around the table for both for our Heritage City and also for um, supporting the visitor attractions. And I had a little chuckle, I guess, when um, Councillor Reddick talked about making money out of, a, out of a heritage tourism asset. I think it took us about 30 years before we turned a profit. And that wasn't because we were bad at business. That's because these heritage assets do eat up money. But you would look at, the, um, at my family's heritage asset now, and that is an iconic visitor attraction that brings a lot of um, visitors and economic impact into the city and the train is also like that. We look at the um, figures in here around the $10 million economic impact, then we look at what tourism, um, this visitor spend was about $700 million. and as Councillor Lafiso said, that's about jobs, that's about people, that's about supporting um, our, our rich cultural institutions. I think we also invest one point six million dollars into Olveston and the Chinese Garden and this is part of what makes our, the fabric of our city great so thank you. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. We'll take it by division. Thanks. Councillor Barker. Aye. Oh sorry. Before, um, nobody wants any of these parts taken individually? No. We'll take the whole thing by division. Thanks. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Hall. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 13 1. Thank you. Item 7, which is on page 33 of your substantive agenda. Welcome. Ms. Glenn Gary and Ms. Wikaira, live music action plan update. Anything from either of you by way of introduction? No, we'll take it as read. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Walker. Um, yep, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for the report, uh, Ms. Glengarry and Ms. Wikaida. Um, two initial questions, both financial ones, actually. Um, in terms of the $10,000 that we um, allocated through the long-term plan, how, how much of that has been, been used? It has all been used. Uh, we have the final bill to come in from our sound consultant. The most that will be is expected to be around 8500 and the remaining funds have been used towards the community consultation led by Craig Birch Mordonga. And second question, um, in terms of the phase three, the su suggestion there that um, there's likely to require further investment from council, probably a bit of a stretch to get a, a detailed answer, but I guess you know what I'm asking. So I'll answer that. Okay. So the, this will be considered, re operating budget requests will all be considered in the round when the council considers the draft annual plan budgets. I have a question, it's the same question I asked the planning team when they came to speak to Variation 3 or the initiation of Variation 3. Uh, subsequent to that, has a connection been made between the, these two pieces of work to look at whether any of your planning suggestions might be incorporated through that planning process? We are still working on that um, dialogue. Great, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Walker. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, another question has come to mind because um, when I when I read the report, I, I got a real sense that um, that the Save uh, Diddy the Music uh, people 
uh, sorry, collective have been consulted quite extensively. It, if they were to be sitting there, would, would they answer in the affirmative, do you think? I'm hoping so. I think so, and I really need to acknowledge the immense amount of work that the collective have undertaken themselves. They've gone beyond it, it, it. We've sort of discussed at staff level that, you know, this is gigging and popular music in terms of saved and needed live music. Uh, we're thinking about a live music action plan that we are interested in seeing um, kura kaupapa, classical music. But I, I, I would say they feel mm. they've been well consulted and that they're continuing the conversations more widely. There are no further questions. Councillor Staines? So moved by Councillor Staines to note the report seconded by Councillor Walker. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Councillor Walker? Yeah, just, just very briefly, obviously thank, thanking staff for the work on this. And I mean, as I indicated in one of my questions, reading this makes me um, really hopeful that really good solid progress is being made on this um, and I'm just you know, I, I, again one of my questions just really keen to make sure that um, the Saved and Even Live Music Collective um, um, all those people you know Mr. Bennett, Ms. Gilmore etc are just f fully included going forward and I get, I get confidence from Ms. Glengarry's answer that, that that is going to be the case so um, and yeah just it, it's excellent everything I anticipated that this um, this plan would achieve seems at the moment to be being progressed well, so um, fingers crossed that's the way it uh, proceeds as we move forward. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. I'd like to thank um, Ms Waikara and her team. I, I really enjoyed reading this report. I thought it showed, to me anyway, it really showed that I hope that the Save Dunedin Music Group have been listened to. They've now been engaged, and if they're meeting every week, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And what's coming out of that is this feasibility study that hopefully that doesn't take too long and that we get results soon and we get, I'd love to see some great rehearsal spaces and thinking outside the square of what we could use around our city because we do have a thriving music scene. We've always had a good reputation right from years back for the Dunedin Sound, but now we've got a lot of new music coming out and I, I think it would be great to see that supported. And this certainly, this is a great step towards that and I think it's fantastic. I, I really thought this report was excellent, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to add my thanks to the members of the creative community for the way that they have approached this situation and, and have made these comments through the 10-year plan process as well. Um, it wasn't the uh, it wasn't the best way to start a conversation necessarily um, that evening uh, in April 2021, and and the the, mem the membership of the creative community could, had two options available to them in terms of how they might go about trying to resolve uh, some of those issues. Um, they they could have taken a more uh, combative approach and an, an antagonistic approach, but instead uh, they've sought to build consensus within their own community, and that's not. That indeed, that's not an easy thing to do, uh, but also um, to work constructively with our staff um, to try and come up with what uh, enduring solutions to these issues might look like. And, and it's, um, I'm, I'm really excited to see the, the work that will follow on from this, and, and I think it's testament to what um, community leadership can do with the support of um, staff uh, engagement and a, and a small amount of money that we made available to this project through the 10-year plan process that we'll see the uh, the fruits of through the annual plan uh, process. Councillor Staines, your right of reply. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against? That's agreed. Item 8. Mr. Rowe, welcome. For your debut performance. Anything you wish to add by way of introduction to the paper before we take questions? I will take it as read, thank you. Questions? Councillor Elder. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I really like the openness and frankness of your report, and I was just wanting to um, talk to some, a theme that was in there, and that is um, you consider that a lot of work, good work has been done, but um, do you see that as being a lot of siloed work as well? Thank you, Councillor. Um, yes and no. I mean, the the report notes that um, the work that you could say comprises the South Dunedin Future Program has been going on for some time, um, over a decade in some instances. So um, inevitably that has involved um, cross-council work, both internally within the DCC and, and with ORC and other agencies. Um, I guess it's... Largely that's been information sharing to date and I think the complexity of this program and the issues that it's tackling and the longevity of those mean that it probably needs to evolve to another level where um, it's coordinated planning, it's coordinated budgeting, um, that whole sort of um, just another layer of complexity that needs to be reflected in the way that the organisations approach it. Um, think about it and sort of prepare, I guess. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Council Officer. Uh, tēnā koe, Your Worship. Tēnā kōrua. Um, I'm, my question is referring to page 53, the, the little grid and the working principles um, in terms of, I, and I don't want to be caught up too much in semantics. The Treaty of Waitangi is not Te Treaty of Waitangi, so um, is it going to be Given that the Local Government Act just requires, well, not just, but, you know, requires us to work within the principles, what's your vision for how this is going to be uh, confirmed? Through the strategic refresh or framework refresh or...? I don't know, what's the process? Kia ora, Councillor. Um, we have included both the Tiriti or Waitangi and the Treaty of Waitangi there in the strategic principles. Um, we hope that in the new um, local government legislation that this might be the way forward, but, but we, we, we don't know, obviously. Um, but it's good to, to, to identify that um, in there, is my feeling. But personally, uh, you know, professionally, the strategic refresh will include um, will include a much more identified way of um, including the principles of the treaty um, across across the organisation and across projects such as this. Councillor Walker. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Ms Wikaira and Mr Rowe. This programme update is excellent, actually, and uh, it's um, great, to have you, great to have you on board. Welcome. Um, also, also very <coughs> illuminating. My question is around the uh, dynamic adaptive pathways planning approach. I'm just so curious as to why you chose that, that, that approach rather than another approach. Was it, was it simply because this is best suited to the identified problems? Thanks, Councillor. Um, the the d dynamic adaptive planning pathways or pathways planning approach, DAP, it's been identified as best practice um, for dealing with climate adaptation work, which is I think the primary reason why we're taking it on. It's an area where there's lots of uncertainty. Um, I think there's also an opportunity to um, adapt the process to uh, to an approach that suits the context down here, suits the need in the South of Eden. So, but we are learning. Um, we have one of the NIWA advisors, Dr. Paula Blackett, who wrote the textbook, if you like, or the guidance, is providing us advice on this as well. So, and she's commented to us in our program meetings that this. Uh, the issues that South Dunedin is dealing with are some of the most complex that she has faced with this model. So, you know, um, watch the space, I guess. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to say I found this report quite refreshing and I like the honesty in there of highlighting the fact that there's difficulties around the different organisations and it just shows Councillor, we have a full agenda Yes, today. yes. My question is, it seemed to me one of the points that we need to look at is now governance over those areas is with, when there's operational, because if we have a, a motion and we say this, of course that's going to affect 
everything else. So how do you suggest there's some solutions to that? Because I know it was just briefly touched on in here, but um, it's certainly because there needs to be more working together and even a governance, almost a governing body that it will come together for that almost. I'd Council, I mean, questions around governance are decisions for the for the governors to make, and there are a range of options. But uh, council's position up until this point uh, has been that uh, where decisions are to be made in areas of the Dunedin City Council's within the scope of our authority, that they would we would prefer them to be made around this table, uh, as opposed to uh, another uh, governing body. Yes, I understand that that's part of the problem, is that that's been the case all the way along, and it's conflicted do have, sometimes do with other... For, do you have questions for staff? Yes, I have. Yes. My next question is, today in the public forum, we had Eleanor Doig come and talk, and we're listening to what they're doing, the work around DIA, and this might not be fair to ask you this, because you might not be aware of what's been going on there, but that seemed to be me to be now another layer and another lot of players in there, and how are you seeing that will work in with all of us working together? Um, it is another layer, although it's a group from the same set of players that we will be dealing with anyway. So um, it's a really good example of the community um, activating themselves. So it's, this is not something that the council will need to do to the community or that this team would need to do to the community in South Dunedin. There's a lot of activity going on out there. Um, the challenge is going to be in coordination, right? Yes. Um, there's an enormous amount of work going on. How do you get consistent messaging, consistent strategy and yes. make sure it all kind of talks to one part of the system? And I guess that's why this council's created the role that I'm yes. in to, to play, uh, play that role of pulling it together and trying to um, make it more coordinated. That will take time. Um, there's a lot of balls that are going to be in the air, so um, I think we've sort of committed to trying to go to iterative change over time. This report was the first first stab at that, and I think we'll come back in seven or eight months' time with more detail, more def definition around what the key elements are, what we're trying to do, who the key players are, and how it might all fit together. And I would anticipate a couple more conversations in the next six or seven months with the councillors around what that might look like as well. Thank you, yes, because listening to what she was saying, what the work she was doing with DIA, I thought a lot of that actually came under some of the council's policies, and I thought there was already crossovers that I was listening to and thinking, well, wait a minute, isn't those, aren't those things that would normally come under our jurisdiction as governors and operational things for council? So it is, I can see there's an issue there with crossovers, and I wondered how you'd deal with that. But Councillor Wiley. Mr Rowe, um, thank you and uh, welcome to the meeting um, and to your role at DCC. Um, are you living in South Dunedin? No. Okay. So based on this report and the front page of the paper this morning, how do you think a resident of South Dunedin may view what this is saying? So, Councillor, I don't think it's fair to ask staff to speak on behalf of other members of the community, okay. or, or indeed I'll... ask staff to talk about where they might live right, right. in the city boundary. Okay. It's wildly inappropriate, Councillor, and I'd ask you to apologise. Well, I will apologise on that basis, but I am, I'm actually quite concerned about this report, that's all. And the reason I'm quite concerned about this report is that... You'll have, you'll have an opportunity to speak to your concerns when we speak to... Okay. But if you have questions of staff, now's the time to ask them. When you talk stakeholders, who are you refer referencing? Uh, a wide set, basically anyone that has an interest in South Dunedin. Um, so obviously community residents would be one. Um, a whole bunch of uh, businesses, industry that uh, are currently located out there. There's mana whenua. Um, and then I guess one of the parts of the report spoke about how South Dunedin is a pretty critical element of the broader city. So there's a lot of Dunedin residents who don't live or reside in South Dunedin that have an interest in um, the area or, or, or broader city functions that um, are influenced by, for example, um, core infrastructure that's located there. Okay. And when you talk about uh, the, the, on paragraph 15, the work has involved extensive community engagement, including 60 plus meetings, I take it that you'll be continuing a lot of those sort of meetings in Hui's and trying to get a lot more community engagement? or resident engagement? 
Absolutely. And, you know, I, I need to acknowledge that I'm very fortunate to be coming in at a time when there's been a lot of good work done and hard work done by the council and the staff to rebuild relationships um, with the community. Obviously, that was um, in a difficult space in 2015, and there's been a lot of repair work done. And that, that needs to continue because we do need to identify, you know, when we move forward, we need vision, we need outcomes, um, a whole range of things, that's things that we need to be tested and validated by the community, not just in a one-off, but in an ongoing process. And I'm conscious that some groups have had more exposure to that than others. Um, and we'll be looking to try and reach out to some groups that maybe haven't. Okay. You referenced um, the South Dunedin flood in 2015 in this report, but uh, nowhere did I see the reference that uh, former CEO Sue Bidrose had made uh, that 40% of the South Dunedin flood was infrastructure failure at a public meeting in South Dunedin in, what was it, April 2016. And I'm just wondering why there was no mention of that infrastructure failure. You talk about the screens at Portobello, you talk about the mud tanks, but yet 21 times you mention the word climate change. And I just get the feeling that's what this paper is all about and not enough about some of the infrastructure in South Well Dunedin. spotted, Councillor, it is indeed about adapting to climate change. I'll answer that. The, the infrastructure... Um, issues in 2015 have been identified in that report, but as the former chief executive said at the time, we still would have had a significant flood in South Dunedin, even if all the infrastructure had been working correctly. Yeah, we would have had a 30 centimetre flood instead of a 50 centimetre flood. So I guess part of this is I want to make get confidence that residents are going to be, because this is titled the South Dunedin Future, um, and this is a program update of that, that South Dunedin residents are going to be very much have the ability to engage and work on this going forward. Oh, I can respond to that. The, I mean, we are forming this up at the moment, but I would anticipate that the focus of the program will possibly be broken into three different sort of chunks. The first one will be really looking at mitigation. So how, how do you mitigate the risk presented at the moment by heavy rainfall events? That's the primary focus, right? There's a second piece around avoiding maladaptation, or how do we avoid making decisions now that are maybe going to be unsuitable or lock us into particular pathways, um, or commit funding now that we maybe don't want to commit later? And then the third piece is really the, the, the proper adaptation piece around how do we um, draw together enough information um, to be able to make informed decisions about time periods that are going to be 30, 50, 100 years. So we're going to have to make some judgments with a whole lot of uncertainty. So the program will be trying to f address all of those things at one time. Um, but I can, I can assure, assure you that there's a lot of, um, there will be a lot of focus on infrastructure, on current infrastructure, and optimising that as there has been um, in the past. Councillor Baker. Thank you, Worship. Kia ora koroa and hare mai, Mr Rowe. Welcome to the Council and thank you for the report. The um, diagram of adaptive pathways was particularly insightful. I just want to ask a question about the relationship and engagement with central government. Obviously we have local MPs and I was just wondering, there's a lot of stakeholders throughout the report um, and climate change is obviously an, a national issue. Um, so I wondered how, how those two things are going to work together, our local MPs, central government. So one of the current work streams that we've identified in the current state assessment is looking at strategy and policy. And part of the reason for that is there's a whole lot of uncertainty around that national architecture. Um, what is central government going to come out with um, in terms of the Climate Adaptation Act, Manage Retreat? That's going to be quite a, um, quite a key guide in how we might approach this. So um, obviously <laughs> there's a lot of other reforms going on that I don't need to um, tell the council councils about. But we, I think there is a piece in there that we will need to explore and what does this look like in terms of partnership with central government, funding partnerships, planning partnerships, strategy and the like. So I, it's probably an, an untapped space and my impression from talking to central government um, contacts is that they're sort of looking at us as much as we are 
at them about for guidance in this space. So again, I would hope over the next six or seven months, we can start to explore that a little bit more and come back to the councillors and provide some detail on what the opportunities might be. Councillor Reddick. Hello. Um, you referred in the, uh, the large page, on page 54 of our program, uh, to the integrated catchment model. And is that referring to the South Dunedin Integrated Catchment Management Plan that Opus prepared for Council in 2011? Is that what you mean by that? No, that's a reference to some ongoing work that Three Waters team um, and the DCC is currently undertaking. So I, I would have to check with them about time frames, but sure. um, it's not I, Then are you aware of the integrated catch, catchment management plan that I'm talking about? Opus prepared that report in 2011. I've seen references to uh, the report. I've not seen the contents, no. Okay, so what I'm concerned about is, you know, the predilection for action or the predilection for um, discussion and reports and paperwork because back in that report, 2011, there was some very, they had a risk matrix scoring of a number of um, infrastructure elements which we had very high risk characterised, well, as very high. And uh, just a few years later, uh, nothing had been done. So I'm not sure where this is going, but I, I can't see it being particularly productive to ask questions of staff about a report they haven't read. That may be based the case. On, based I'm on just... your summary of said report. Can I just yes. also interject that the, the current three waters you work is modelling. You can't interject, for... but it's still more. <laughs> Do you have any, do you have any questions of the report that we are discussing here, not reports that you may have read previously? Well, it's relevant to the question, which is the you know previous reports have led you know did not produce action, and we had a flood in 2015, and we've had close to flood events in the last two uh, summers as well. So my question is, what are you do you know are you developing or coming up? To, with a relatively rapid uh, plan of action to actually mitigate the risk that we have, a clear and present risk that the residents of South Dunedin are aware of? Uh, the immediate risk and the ongoing operations of the, of the network currently is outside of the responsibilities of my role. I, I think it's more, it would, you'd need to have a conversation with the Three Waters team around the specifics. <laughs> I could speculate, but it's probably not going to be of much use. Much appreciated. Thank you. Are there further questions? I've got you, Councillor. I'm just checking to see if there's anyone who hasn't asked one who would like to before we go for round two. Councillor Elder. I'm having a second bite at the cherries. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just thinking about three waters reform and in the context of three water, waters reform, there is a concern that local de decision making is, is, is not as p powerful. And I think of <coughs> South Dunedin, and, the, and their real and genuine concerns about the future of the area and how- Councillor, um, I'm struggling to see oh, how this right. is getting to a productive uh, point. The, the point is, do you see this group continuing on um, through the Three Waters Reform and advocating and supporting South Dunedin in um, the Three Waters re Reform process. I don't think advocacy is the role of staff, Councillor, but... Quite right. So the, the work will continue. How we interface with whatever the water entity looks like, we will, we will you know, see what that is and work out how we best engage. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Romelli, I missed you then. No, sorry, I didn't have a question. I was just trying to clarify something. Oh, thanks. There are no further questions. Someone would like to move. Councillor Elder, you're moving the recommendations. It's been moved by Councillor Elder, seconded by Councillor. Thank you. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor Elder? Yes, I would. Um, I just want to thank Jonathan for his full and comprehensive report. Um, and it certainly 
um, identified some of the weaknesses of, of, of the past work, but there was still some really good work done, and I want to thank all the people in the South Dunedin community who have stood up for that community and done work in that area. Um, I, I commend the Council on both the ORC and the DCC for appointing Jonathan because I think in fact there are lots and lots of um, really strong streams of work that once they are um, put together can create uh, a, a comprehensive plan that deals with um, the social, the economic, the infrastructure that is what makes South Dunedin a great place. Um, the people of South Dunedin really, really love living there. Um, it is flat, so it is accessible, and there are lots and lots of community services within that area, and I think they should be encouraged that there is um, a, a, a far more cohesive plan um, and that, in fact, the research is being done to have good scientific data to um, look at the infrastructure and the future of South Dunedin and, and mitigating, but also adapting to the future. Further speakers, Councillor Walker. Yes, I'll be very brief. Just want to <coughs> thank staff for this, what I thought was an excellent report. Also wanted to thank Councillor um, Wiley for inadvertently pointing out what was um, I think pretty obvious to me in the, in the early parts of the executive summary, which is this is about responding uh, to climate change. And as the summary points out, South Dunedin sits in a precarious uh, part, of, part of New Zealand in terms or vis-a-vis -vis climate change and the likely effects it may accrue. And again, as it points out here, these, the complex and interconnected nature of these issues require an equally integrated response. And I think this paper and this report indicates that's what we're going to do. So I applaud that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I am happy to see this report come through too. Um, I'm also happy to see the word mitigation spent, speak, spoken of a bit more strongly than potentially it was maybe in 2015. Um, and I think it was something that the people of South Dunedin were looking for and we have got it in our Three Waters program. And that is actually what the hydraulic modelling is on at the moment, is to make sure that when we do that first mitigating step, we've got the hydraulic modelling correct. So that whatever we go forward with will actually work during that mitigation phase. Um, I do just want to make one other comment here, and that is that I do see a role at some point or another for a governance component in this, because like in any other position where we have more than one authority operating, sometimes there is a, a void which is indescribable in physics between two territorial authorities when something overlaps. <laughs> And I've heard it said that maybe connecting Dunedin isn't working all that well, but I think it was actually probably important that the governance is there to see what is and isn't working. And, it, and I anticipate this will actually work better, um, but I still think there might be a role for whatever it is, either it's frequent um, updates or, or, um, or some form of meeting. I don't have any particular um, design in mind at the moment, but... Not only the ORC and DCC, GNS has been providing a lot of technical data here, and the Ministry for Environment is going to clearly be a player coming into the future. So sometimes the governance component offers a kind of glue to what otherwise can be somewhat separated activities. But Mr Rowe may be, in fact, the glue that we're looking for here, so it may be already here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Yes, I agree. That was something I raised as well, is that it became very clear reading through the report that there hasn't been a lot of, um, that, that there is, there hasn't been a lot of sharing of perhaps operational or governance in this, and, and that's what it pointed to, is that we're sharing information, but not a lot more. And as a result of that, I think it's fair to make the assumption, and I think it dictates that in here, is that a lot of things perhaps have taken maybe longer and so that's to the detriment of the people in South Dunedin where they deserve better and things, you know, there's an urgent issue in South Dunedin where, like it or not, it is faced with a climate change issue. You can argue there's poor drains or there's this or that, but climate change is real and it is happening right now 
and South Dunedin, because it's low-lying, is going to be one of the areas that are going to be seriously affected. And I think it's great that they are part of a, um, a study that will look more extensively at that area. And I think we need to put our best people on this work and I think bringing in a person to coordinate all the different groups is, is a sensible idea. And so hopefully Mr Rowe will be able to do that and coordinate everything because if we haven't got a point of contact where, and this is what I've said about other issues too around building too, and it, it applies to not just South Dunedin but so many other things that Council does uh, where you've got, say, DOC, um, ORC, and other different areas can, departments involved, it slows the process down. And it's become very clear on a lot of other projects too that it's difficult to get consensus and decision making when this is the issue. So it is not just a problem for this area. We need to look at it. And I think that given this report has highlighted this, now we know it's a problem we need to look actively to fix it because a lot of projects are being held up because of these reasons. But urgent action is needed for South Dunedin. I hope this is going to be actioned now. We've got Mr Rowe to look at coordinating things and things will start to move more quickly, one hopes. Thank you. Councillor Reddick. Yes, I'm concerned that the advent of climate change has been used as an excuse for a lack of action in the South Dunedin catchment. And I have noticed that there is quite a feeling in certain in people I've spoken to from South Dunedin that that has been the case, because there has certainly been an overall lack of action on that Opus report of 10 years ago. Many of the risks are of high and very high nature, and only the very easiest of those risks have been dealt with. However, I'm gratified by uh, Mr. Mr. Rowe's report because he's covered a lot of ground in what we've got here, and uh, he speaks, you know, very clearly about it. And I did uh, take uh, take note and write down his words: How do we mitigate risk? And the focus will be on optimising current infrastructure because I feel sure that the people of South Dunedin would like to see some genuine action as far as risk mitigation and repair and upgrading of the current infrastructure so that they could uh, rest easy when rains come. Now, there's a, um, you know, a still a large part of the integrated catchment plan from 10 years ago has not been uh, completed. Uh, and we're into more reports and modelling to try and um, you know, get more certainty about it. But there's been, a, it's quite a long gap 10 years. So hence I asked Mr Rowe about his predilection for action and uh, I hope that he takes note of that and uh, nudges things along because the people of South Dunedin and especially those experts that many of whom I've spoken to that have knowledge of the South Dunedin catchment, they are very concerned that very little action has taken place and the risk is still there. And uh, as recently as last January and the January before, we were very close to flooding events in South Dunedin again. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to follow on from the point I raised about um, engaging with our local MPs and central government, climate change and um, South Dunedin futures. Uh, something that I think the central government should be engaging with. When we look at what our, our, our rate payers, our small city of, of the small funding base we're spending investing, $900,000 per annum on this work, we've employed six, uh, added e six FTE to our zero carbon sustainability in South Dunedin futures. And I really think we should be looking to leadership and funding from central government to address this problem. What sent shivers up my spine was um, Mr Rowe saying that central government were looking at us as much as we were looking at them. So why should Dunedin be funding all of this work and doing all of this work when really we should be looking to central government to either fund it or provide good direction, resources and expertise to help us along the way? Councillor Wiley. Thank you. Um, I actually found this paper quite informative 
and I uh, especially appreciate the table on page 53-54 that outlines the South Dunedin Future Programme and the current state assessment and work that's been identified. I think the part, as I sort of alluded to in questions, was that in this report I saw climate change highlighted 21 times. Residents were highlighted twice. Community and stakeholders, along with residents, were highlighted 14 times. To me, this paper is about the South Dunedin future. It's about the future of the residents of South Dunedin. And I just hope that the residents do get fully engaged in this work and do fully actually take up every opportunity to come along to whatever meetings and hui's and uh, community network opp opportunities there are, because this is about the future of South Dunedin. And it is about how we make South Dunedin prosperous going forward. The part that I find frustrating at times, and we heard a, a, quite a bit about after the South Dunedin flood, was about retreat and leaving the area. And I think there is a balance where we can have a very strong, vibrant South Dunedin future over the next hundred years. And I think this is, and some of this work I really look forward to seeing because I do see opportunities where we can invest and whether it's other types of um, infrastructure or ways of living in the area, but the key thing being is we acknowledge what's happened in the past, but we make sure we invest in the future so South Dunedin maintains its vibrancy. But more importantly, this is a plea to the residents and property owners of South Dunedin to actually get out and engage and see what is happening and what we are trying to build on the future of South Dunedin. Further speakers? It seems to me that there may be something of a misunderstanding about what Mr Rowe's job is. Um, because as far as I can tell, his job is working as a coordinator of the overall work program, uh, bringing together pieces of work that are happening in different parts of this building and other, uh, and other, uh, and other agencies to look at what is a very complex set of interconnected problems. And you know, there's been discussion about will it be actioned? Well, on page 53 of the agenda, there's an entire grid of things that are currently happening, uh, whether that's the St Clair St Kilda Coastal Plan uh, work, whether it's the integrated catchment modelling project, whether it's the South Dunedin flood mitigation work that we've funded through the 10-year plan, uh, whether it's the South Dunedin Library work that is, that is currently ongoing, all of those are actions that are currently being undertaken by Council to support uh, the South Dunedin Future Programme. What has been made clear through this uh, is that they haven't necessarily been that well uh, connected because we haven't uh, hired someone uh, to do the work of bringing all those departments together because they're all too busy getting on with uh, doing their, their various uh, pieces. Um, the, the question has been asked around a governance, what is the governance oversight of this work? Well, it's this meeting. The, the report has come to this meeting for us to have oversight over the work that, it was, that is going on. Uh, it's jointly funded by the Regional Council at this, at this point, and so the same paper is going to their meeting this week uh, for, them to, uh, for them to discuss uh, and, uh, and, and interrogate. And, and whether that proves adequate in terms of having a shared understanding at a governance level across those two organisations to, to satisfy uh, the desire of regional councillors and city councillors that uh, they do understand the work that is being jointly funded and um, well, remains to be seen. And if it, if it isn't adequate, then we can look at uh, alternative models to make sure that uh, the right information is being um, shared with uh, the right people who will ultimately make the decisions that uh, will be asked of them uh, when some of these uh, pieces of work uh, come to uh, come to the to a thornier end, but this is a uh, speaking as a as a governor, this is exactly the kind of work that should be presented to this meeting: uh, a strategic look at all of the things that are happening within council uh, to contribute uh, to the South Dunedin Future Program, and it's great that it mentions climate change 21 times, however difficult individual elected members might find to say those words out loud, because that is exactly what this project is about, adapting to a changing climate. 
adapting to a, uh, to a less stable climate future, regardless of how uh, sharp our mitigation efforts are. Uh, human action uh, since the Industrial Revolution has locked us into a path where we will have to adapt. Uh, and, and there will be big decisions that need to be made eventually around how we do that. Uh, but it is absolutely right uh, that we are doing this work and that it remains the focus of this work. And the most heartening thing for me, actually, in this schematic is that we're finally including people uh, as infrastructure uh, in, in the way we think about climate adaptation because we know that uh, when things get tough, if you're dealing with extreme weather events or, or whatever the individual situation might be, uh, that better connected communities and stronger and more resilient communities are more likely to be able to uh, withstand uh, the shocks that will inevitably uh, come along the way. And so looking at uh, strengthening our community and building up the capacity of our community alongside with our scientific data sets and our planning and infrastructure modelling, I think is absolutely right uh, and, and long overdue in how we consider uh, climate action uh, to look like because people are equally as important as pipes are uh, in terms of uh, how, we, uh, how we support the broadest well-being uh, of our communities uh, now uh, and into the future. Are there further speakers? Councillor Aldi, your right of reply. Um, I just look at page 47 on this report and I note point 43 um, that our program goal or vision could be enhance community resilience and well-being through sustainable urban regeneration of South Dunedin. And I can see that happening already with the great South Dunedin Library um, and hub coming with 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 um, Dunedin Kiwi Rail investing in the area of businesses investing in um, rebuilding some of the, the 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 buildings in the South Dunedin business area. I think this is a vibrant, colourful, and uh, um, just growing area of South Dunedin. I look at um, using information from existing work streams and outputs and short-term outcomes could reasonably lead to the following set of indicative and mixed terms outcomes. Reduce risk from natural hazards. Reduce frequency and impact of flooding. Reshaping the urban form of South Dunedin. Climate change adaption impacts are equitable and increase um, community resilience and I can wholeheartedly support those goals and I believe the future for South Dunedin under that um, is, has got lots of potential. I do however do support what um, Councillor Sophie Barker said and I see, see South Dunedin as an area where in fact as someone said there could, you could term it a slow moving earthquake and a, an area in which Central government does have a role to play, and I would um, therefore call out to central government and and um, call to them to actually have a partnership uh, in this um, work. And um, I also feel it really, really encouraged by Jonathan Rowe's report and the fact that we are paying him through ORC and DCC to work on this together because we need a very comprehensive um, and um, um, well-planned um, approach to this because, in fact, you know, we look at the uncertainty, we look at the three waters reform, and we need to have a really good plan for South Dunedin going forward for their future and for ours. Thank you. I'll put the motion by division. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. Aye. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Aye. Carried unanimously. unanimously. Thank you. I'll move that we adjourn for lunch until 1.30. Seconded Councillor Walker. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you.
Gentlemen, item nine is the zero carbon update report, and as we kind of welcome back uh, Ms. Reynolds, welcome uh, in your first ap appearance before the committee, which sounds far more terrifying than I'm sure that it actually is. Um, anything either of you wish to offer by way of introduction? Happy no. to take it as read. Uh, very good. Uh, questions, Councillor. This is item nine, the zero carbon update report. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, um, Your Worship. I, um, I've noticed in some other jurisdictions, both here and overseas, that um, visual representations of what's happening um, are used to make these sorts of issues, the reporting on these sort of issues, real. I mean, I first saw that in. Uh, electricity use in public buildings, where there was a meter showing the current usage and what the target was. Have you ever? Th I mean, I don't see anything um, in that sort of regard here. But have you considered some sort of display like that or reporting like that as a means of um, informing the community about the issue, how we're doing or how we're not doing, and so on? Um, I'll speak to that, Kia ora Councillor. We haven't considered that, but um, we, I, I do feel that that is a very good idea, um, and it's a very good way to visually represent um, um, a very complex um, issue, and I think, thank you for that. Thank you, I'll leave that with you. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for the, the reports. A couple of questions. Uh, on round number 13, and you talk about the, um, the implement of the new software solution. Just interested to just know a wee bit more about that. Um, sure. So this is a software system that helps us to get data from across the, the DCC's operations into a single point. We'd previously been using a, a spreadsheet, which was... Um, quite large and time consuming and you know prone to error. Um, so the software solution helps to automate some of that and, and um, also should enable uh, managers or, or people working in particular areas of DCC to see the emissions associated with um, their operations um, and see it at different levels, so the whole DCC level or, um, and within groups or teams as well. Yeah, thank you. I can't believe you're using spreadsheets. Um, and obviously towards the end, there's a lot of talk about the Southern District Health Board and it's, what, is there a reluctance or what's the situation with them in terms of getting them to <coughs> sign up? Um, not quite sure. I think they're quite busy. They have more recently um, been in touch with us, which, is, which has been great. So we've been able to start to progress some of those conversations. Councillor Barker. My question is following on from the Southern District Health Board. It's been eight months, I guess, since the um, alliance was going to be put together, and this does seem to be a hold-up of it, because obviously it's the, the governance and the oversight. So I wonder whether progression can be made without them. Obviously, they're going to be undergoing some, some review, et cetera, and I wonder if the alliance can go forward without them. Um, so the, this has been part of the discussion, so up until... Um, Earlier, a few months back, our conversations with both Mana Whenua and the um, SDHD were, um, were slowly progressing. Um, so there have been conversations about whether everyone has to be part of the MOU for the MOU to, pro to progress. Um, fortunately, some of those conversations started to progress again, and we've been able to get to a point where we feel that um, it, you know, everyone can be at the table um, as part of the alliance. I guess my next question follows on from that. With when it was um, in June 2019, um, we were declaring a climate emergency, and it's now a couple of years later, and we're still trying to get the the governance alliance together. My question really is around um, that the council develops a climate emergency plan, and I just wonder, because I'm quite simplistic, where, where we might see a plan. <laughs> Well, I think hope, we're hoping to have the alliance as part of being able to pull that plan together. Um, as you'll know, we've had uh, senior staff who have been away on maternity leave this year. 
We also lost a, well, a, another um, senior staff member who moved on from the DCC. Um, so we've just had Florence um, in this role for the last few months. We've got uh, new roles coming in in the um, early in, in 2022, and we have um, a staff member coming back from maternity leave, so we will have a lot more resource to start to progress some of this work. Councillor Houlihan. Given a lot of our targets for this, you know, require other organisations that are outside the DCC doing their bit as well. Um, do, do you think, like the last paper we had, we talked about how they've brought in a person to coordinate and liaise. Do you think we need a, a person to coordinate and work with all external groups? So uh, that would be the role of um, the senior principal policy uh, person who leads this, who is um, Ginty McTavish. Oh, right. um, but she's obviously on maternity leave. She returns in January next year. Right. There are two further roles um, uh, that will come into to, to start to form more of a team. Um, a senior policy analyst, Sarah Carbon, and a, um, a senior communications and engagement uh, advisor, Sarah Carbon, as well. So in a similar way to um, the way in which the, Zero, uh, the South Dunedin Future team has started to develop, um, the Zero Carbon team is developing <coughs> in a similar fashion. Great. Um, so realistically, given we've set a goal for, the previous council set a goal for 2030, how realistic is that for us to achieve it right now on the way we're going? Um, it's definitely an ambitious target and as you've noted it does require other actors to yes. um, help us get there. A few things I'll mention, um, change is happening at the national and international level. Uh, um, another uh, report that you'll be considering is the emissions reduction plan discussion document for the whole country. Um, and so we'll, we'll start seeing, um, well, we'll, well, we should get the final version of that in May next year. Um, so we're starting to see some progress at the national level. Um, I'll also note that it, that it is a net target, so that leaves the door open for potential offsetting um, to reach that target. So, so there's, I guess there's different approaches that can be taken. Um, but yes, noting that it is, it is ambitious. So have we got enough time to meet that goal? I feel like you've just asked the same question again, slightly differently. To, to be fair, Councillor, you did get an answer. Um, it it's may an not have been as straightforward an answer as you were. Yeah, it's an ambitious... It does a bit. Well, it's an ambitious target, and at this point we haven't got a, the plan. And, w and one that depends on uh, factors that are outside of our control. Councillor, you need to use your microphone for the purposes of... Recording. Would it be fair to say, if you're saying it's ambitious, that you're concerned we might not be able to meet it? That is a possibility, yes. OK. Is that you saying that or the Mayor? <laughs> it is a possibility. It is. OK, thank you. Councillor Lord. Yeah, um, thank you, Worship. Uh, look, just to, I feel a bit ignorant asking this, but in the report, point four... It talks about the um, biogenic methane emissions by 2050, and it says a 24 to 47 per cent reduction, and it just seems a wide range. And I'm just wondering, can you explain the reasons for those choices? Like, is that is that exactly what it means, 24 to 47 per cent, or is? Uh, sure. So uh, the biogenic methane target was chosen to align with the national target. Um, so that's the reason for those numbers. Further questions? Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Bishop. Um, thanks very much for the report. It does get back to one of the, you know, with the tightness of this target, 2030, and I'm looking at our, and, and point 0.23, the 10-year plan initiatives. Would it be fair to say that it's probably not necessarily fully funded in the current 10-year plan out to 2030? So are we looking in the 24 to 33 10-year plan anticipating that we would have to put more money in if we are to try to achieve our 2030 target? 
I think would be a, I think there's a fair assessment, Councillor, that more a, a greater degree of investment from the city would need to be included in the next 10-year plan, were we to have any chance of meeting the targets we have set for ourselves. Which I then I guess would ask the other question: Why did we set the current 10-year plan without that budget in it? Um, given that we set it after the um, after the um, motion was passed. And well, we have. We've, we've, we've resourced staff who are doing the work uh, that will then draft the plan, which is how we would go about uh, implementing that, which was always the plan. Thank you. you wish Otherwise, we'd just be making up figures to put on the budget without uh, any justification, which I don't think would have done us any of us any favours. <laughs> Councillor Walker. Yep, thank you once again. Um, I did have questions around staffing, but I think I've, I've, I've now given of where we're going with that. Uh, number 10, you mentioned, you make reference to Taito um, Carbon Reduce. <coughs> are they part of Taito Enviro Care? They are. Great, great choice. And just to be clear, um, um, and I'll frame this in the question, it's not, it's, it's not your expectation that at 11.59pm uh, on December 29th, 2029, that that's the moment we click over, but the expectation is we make a damn good effort to try and get as close as we can. That is correct. Councillor Vannevis. Given that we've had a lot of these initiatives and quite a lot of budget go into this <clears throat> reduction um, aims for many years now, and that if you look at CO2 levels, there has been no identifiable reduction at all. They keep going up. What do you think is going to be different about what is in this report that will change what I see as an inevitable increase in CO2 levels? Um, a, a couple of points there. One, one would be... Um, as I've mentioned, there, there is change happening beyond just Dunedin. Um, for example, uh, the, the government's uh, emission reduction plan that should be forthcoming, um, changes within the emissions trading scheme, those kind of uh, national level um, policies will have an impact and, and that change is starting to occur. I, I would say that change is likely to be slow because um, at that national level because um, it takes time to change things, essentially. Um, and I would also say I believe our latest um, emissions reduction, emissions <coughs> footprinting um, showed that there was a, a, a decoupling or, or around the, in other jurisdictions as well, it shows a decoupling between sort of um, Growth and emissions, which is a promising, um, a promising sign as well for overall reductions. But you can't point to anything in all the years that we've been doing this that shows that we've had any positive effect in Dunedin. I mean, emissions have been a straight line upwards. Wouldn't say a straight line, but uh, sorry, no, we can't. Okay, thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Given that, um, do you think 2050 is probably more realistic in line with what the government's goals have, that they have set? And might that make it, my follow on would be from that, is would it make it easier for us to work in line with the government's goals? Because as you say, the government is setting you know, targets for the country that then would align with that. I'll, I'll answer that, Councillor. Um, council, this council has given us a target of 2030, and so that is what staff will work towards. Yes, I understand that, but <clears throat> according to the, the speaker currently here, and from all assessments, it seems that that's a very, perhaps, overly ambitious target. While I'd love to see us make it, it sounds like um, it's not. we're not looking likely to make it. All I can say, Councillor, is that's the target that Council has set for us and that's what we're working towards achieving. Right. Okay, thank you. 
Councillor Elder. Um, I'm just um, looking at this report and looking at what's happening in the community, and I was just wondering, um, have we got any sort of monitoring systems that give people ongoing data of how we're doing? For example, um, you do a, a, a um, cycle counter on the cycleways, for example, that kind of thing. At the city level, the only uh, monitoring that we have is, uh, I believe, it's been three yearly emissions inventories. Um, there may it may be that within specific teams they do have other monitoring, um, but I'm I'm not aware of that. So no further questions. Would someone like to move the report be noted? As recommended, moved by Councillor Benson Pope, seconded Councillor Lofiso. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Uh, briefly, thank you, Your Worship. Um, <clears throat> thank my, my thanks to the staff for this work, uh, and I, I think the questions have teased out the challenge. There's no doubt that the international, national, and citywide challenge is substantial. Um, but I've always been of the view that the council's position needs to be as aggressive as it is, and uh, I, I would wish that other authorities and other countries took the same sort of attitudes we're seeing happening uh, in New Zealand, Aotearoa, right now. Uh, I would um, I would hope that the suggestion I make about a different type of reporting or indication of the reality of the target and progress towards it or not. Uh, is something that might, the staff might take on board, um, seeing it's been mentioned three times now. Um, but I think we, um, we need to all realise that this is not something that's going to be easy. We know that. But it's a target that we must try our very best to achieve. Councillor Walker. <coughs> yeah, uh, thank you. And I've just written on my page here, not easy in big letters. Um, that's exactly what this isn't. So thank you. Um, also to the staff for the zero carbon work. It is not easy, um, but obviously accurate, measurable, and good data quality are gonna be fundamental um, in terms of driving this, driving this work forward. Um, and also, you know, future outcomes aren't gonna accrue overnight. They're gonna accrue because we're embedding good, robust, strategic, long-term thinking to make sure that positive results do accrue uh, it, it, hence, and uh, hopefully with the, 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 the bringing together of the Zero Carbon uh, Alliance, that will, will start to embed those things more firmly, and I look forward, hopefully, to the, um, the Health Board being part of that also. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Benavis. This council has been aiming for these kind of zero carbon CO2 emissions reductions aims for longer than I think most councillors have been around here. And yet, if you look at the data, all the paperwork, all the jobs that were involved, all the monitoring has made not one jot of difference. I mean, two councillors have just now said um, that uh, they've admitted that it's not going to be easy. Um, my concern, and it's been my concern since the outset, is that CO2 reduction is not even possible. And the reason it's not possible is A, we breathe it out. B, any energy we use basically produces CO2. And civilization depends on energy use. Quality of life depends on energy use. Uh, development depends on energy use. Uh, and reduction of poverty has been fundamentally driven by significant increase in energy use. For us to keep having these reports being written and for us to keep saying that we are going to participate in the Zero Carbon Alliance and we're going to do this and we're going to do that, um, to me, all of it has been essentially a talk fest. It's had no uh, identifiable um, results 
and it continues to have no identifiable results as long as we continue to say it's not going to be easy and these are difficult targets and it depends on what China and India do. And we know what China and India are doing and we know that what we do here will not make a jot of difference either. Why don't we actually go for targets that would be uh, achievable? Why don't we push the government, for instance, to simply say, you're not having polystyrene anymore, manufacturers, you've got to have some other kind of better packaging or you take producer responsibility for it. Why don't we get our central government to do things which we plainly can't, which we're not in a position to, and why do we keep wasting money on reports like this? To me, I think it's virtue signalling. I appreciate that there's a lot of uh, well-intentioned um, people that are trying to do something positive in this space, as they say. Uh, but uh, it's not just not going to be easy. It's simply not possible. CO2 levels have been going up. They're going to keep going up. There's nothing we can do about it. And to pretend that we can is simply, I think, to be unrealistic in an unsustainable way. Um, notwithstanding the fact that there's obviously a lot of sincere work goes into these reports, I'm not going to note this report again as my objection to what I consider to be a ill-conceived waste of time. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, uh, I have concerns about, you know, I first of all, I think as a council, the council was, the previous council made this goal and I thought it was a very ambitious and good goal to make. And out of the country, I think Dunedin was one of the most, one if not the most ambitious council. But of course, treating on that ambitiousness is the fact that it's very difficult to meet. And what I'm concerned about is that when you set a goal, it needs to be smart. And part of that is for it to be realistic and measurable. And I think my concern is, is it now becoming unrealistic to achieve this goal? And I hope not, but my fear is that it might be. Because right way back, we had, we've had, as Councillor Vandivis is correct, we have had a few updates on this. And it has been, I've found to be fear, disappointing that we haven't had key figures you know, that we needed to be able to, because uh, when you're achieving a goal, it has to be measurable. How can we say we're achieving success when we haven't even have measurements for what our carbon zero targets are? And it's very difficult to do that. I mean, we haven't got clear goals. We haven't even got all the main parties on board yet. And I think if we're going to really do this, we should be ambitious, like we've already been by setting this goal, and why don't we as a city say, right, these are, this is where we um, need to cut the emissions, for example, like in a, a, I actually I liked what Councillor Vandiver said around, one, asking government to help us with it, I agree with that, but two, around saying, okay, well, say for example, all businesses in our city, we'd like you to, so Dunedin would be like a marketing thing to say, we are a carbon zero city and have all businesses saying you can't use this packaging or you can't use that. I mean, we don't want to become a policing state, but if we set goals and say, well, we've set this target, if you come along on this journey with us, we expect you not to be using these sort of things because they're adding to our landfill, they're adding to all the waste that we've got. And we haven't, in our budget, as Council O'Malley mentioned earlier, in our 10-year budget for the next 10 years, which surpasses our goal of 2030, we haven't even got money in there for this. So as far as not meeting the measurable or the realistic, we're not even, you know, we haven't, it's not smart because we haven't actually got the figures to say this is how much we need to achieve this goal. We don't actually know that. So I find it quite alarming and, and concerning, and I think we need to, look at ways to improve this, because right now I don't think the way we're going, we're not going to be achieving this goal. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Your Worship. I do agree that we should have an aspirational goal when we did our economic development strategy. We had 
10,000 jobs and $10,000 per, um, per person, more money, and, and we had a report recently that showed that we were actually well on the way to achieving that despite a few bumps along the way. So I do support having an aspirational goal. My challenges are around um, that we developed a climate emergency plan, and as I'm quite simplistic, I'm like, well, where's the plan and how are we going to execute it? So I certainly take on board um, Councillor Benson Pope's um, point about that we should have something that we can sh easily show people what we're doing and how we're achieving it. I do note that in the budget that we approved, we um, added in six full-time employees into the budget, I think I said that last time, for zero carbon sustainability and South Sydney and future work. So we have put money in the budget to um, work on this climate emergency plan and it was useful to hear the staff say that there had been um, absences um, and that they were employing people to do this work. My other concern was around the Southern District Health Board being part of the alliance and, and, and how the eight months that it was taking to do this, to, to get the alliance together to, to make this work happen. And I really wish that, that we go ahead, perhaps without the Southern District Health Board. Important partner, but I think the important stuff is actually to get the work started. I also um, note that pe perhaps we should have more leadership from central government, and I note the emissions plan is, is coming up soon. However, I feel we need stronger leadership, looking at the infrastructure, looking at um, funding some of this work, because it is up to us small councils to keep pouring money into this stuff, which should possibly be better led by central government. Councillor O'Malley. Your Worship. Um, a long time back I had advocated before we had this target that 2035 would be a good target because it was a close time but probably more achievable. Well, we have 2030 now as our target. I don't think we wait for others. Um, the idea that we look overseas and say there are bad players, therefore we don't need to be good players, is, is, is really a cop-out. Um, but my concern is that, is that we were once a member of the Covenant of Mayors and we've been members of other alliances in the past and we've done a lot of planning but I don't think we've done a huge amount of action and I know that from our energy audits we know that standing energy and transport are the two biggest contributors to our carbon footprint right now so I worry and I look at this as we note it because that's all we're doing um, that when you spend time on planning you have an opportunity cost because you're not acting you're still planning and in two months time it will be 2022. Time is, 10 years is an incredibly ambitious thing when you consider the speed at which government works at, how we procure, how long it takes to get things done. Um, and my experience when I've been involved in large organisations that have to take on a lot of unknowns going forward is that you don't wait and assess every unknown before you take your first action. You, take, you say, I have already got these identified places I can act on now. And you start with a series of actions and your planning. And I'm concerned that we have, it's hard for councils to have a culture of risk. Yet if your timetable is so tight as this is, we will have to take on some element of risk. Because if we go forward with just certainty, I can almost guarantee that it'll be 2024 or 2025 before we act our first action out. And then we'll only have five or six years and that action will not be enough to have us completed by 2030. And I don't want to see this turn into, oh well, it was a good try. Um, if we're taking this seriously, we have to aim for 2030 still. Now, I don't think we can meet it, but I don't think that that means that we then under, under effort it or don't put enough effort into it. But we need to say, actually, we're targeting 2030, so we know we can be there by 2040. Because if we looked, if we wait for 2050, I know what we'll do. At 2045, we'll say, okay, now it's time to plant our first tree. Um, so it's ambitious. It will be very, very hard to meet. But, but by 2030, we need to be able to stand beside this and say that, in fact, that we went on the right trajectory and we had the throttle open up at the right point. I am really, my feedback is, I would really like to see some actionable things coming in the next 12 to 24 months, and I don't want to find we've joined another alliance or waiting for somebody else to turn up. Councillor Reddick. Um, in many ways, I'll just action uh, echo the comments of my colleague, 
Councillor O'Malley, uh, because the, it concerns me that we are out of step with the government on this, and the government will be the primary funder and the primary driver. They're the ones that get to make laws to achieve uh, their zero emission targets. And when we are so far out of kilter with what they are planning, it makes life even more difficult for us. Uh, the next thing is we have two years into a plan and uh, with zero achievement to report. In fact, we've gone backwards. And I look at and the previous item on our agenda, the South Dunedin uh, Futures Plan, and we are 10 years from a catchment management plan with very little activity and no additional security for the people who live in South Dunedin. And I look at, so that's 10 years behind there, and I look at the beach and the erosion that we see on the beach, and you know the one proven mechanism has not been reinstituted, and since the 20 years, it's been falling into dilap dilapidation. So I think the people of Dunedin have concern that uh, we are much better at talking about stuff and getting reports written than we are at actually doing things. Councillor Lofiso. Uh, tēnā koe, Your Worship. I would just like to recall my thanks to the mover and also to the staff um, for for doing as we've asked them to do. And um, I am not in. <coughs> I, when it comes to climate change and all that stuff, I have deep faith that Papa Tua Nuku, Mother Earth, will do as she will do. My belief is that we should focus on the people. And so I'll just quote um, the president of Palau speaking at COP26 when he was talking about the environmental impact on island nations in the Pacific. There is no dignity to a slow and painful death. You might as well bomb our islands, which has already been done um, last century. But for me, the important part of this report is the transition, the equity in transition. And again, it comes down to people people, people, and as Councillor Wiley said before in a previous debate, that's where it is. And we are a first world um, nation with third world populations, tangata whenua, and for me, yeah, you could try and say this is virtue signalling, but for me, I actually believe in this. I believe in the spirit of the work and I believe in what we're doing. We have to try we have to use all the levers that we can to actually um, not just signal, but actually put in place uh, work and, and mechanisms that are going to protect our residents and, and strongly act um, and with programs that are going to help people make the transition, take it seriously, be prepared. Because I think things are getting like, we have to try and we have to be ambitious because it's going to get worse. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Lord. Thank you, Worship. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <laughs> not a good start. Look, I, uh, I voted against the uh, plans when we made the decision three, four years ago now, but. Um, I just hear the talk about whether we have an ambitious plan and whether we're going to fall short of that target. And I think the decision was made to have these plans. And I'd just like to relate a wee thing, but I, I um, just had a, a Facebook memory come up the other day of something that happened five years ago, and it was about a pig I'd caught up in the woods. And uh, we were standing there with a dead pig and trees that were about two or three feet high. Now, five years later, those trees uh, probably six metres high, they're 20, 25 feet. And I don't know if people realise just how much of a target and Dunedin City has been replanted in forestry. And I'm not saying that I personally agree that that's necessarily a good thing, but what I do think is uh, trees are going in every single day and there's more and more land going into forestry for carbon farming purposes. And I think that these plans, they might be ambitious, but you don't, I mean, it's like when you set a, any sort of a plan. You may not come and, and manage to achieve it, but it doesn't mean you can't make good progress. And um, what I know is the trees that are five years old today will be, you know, uh, 14 years old by 2030. 
the trees that aren't planted until 25 um, will still be five years old. And I, I really believe some of these plans, there will be change. There will be change that um, fossil fuels will be superseded. I mean, you wouldn't catch me buying an electric car at the moment, but five years' time you might find that they've reached a stage where I'm really quite proud to own one and quite happy to own one. Um, so I just, I, I can support, we're only noting the paper, there's no problem, I was never going to not support it, but um, I, I, I just think that nine years is still an awfully long way away, and or if you want to be pedantic and say eight and a half years, but there's an awful lot can happen in eight and a half years, so just don't ever forget that. Councillor Elder. Thank you for that note, Mr Lord, being a forestry person myself. Um, I just look at the the model that we have seen um, play out before us in the economic development meet last meeting and there was the Grodin End partnership and that partnership was the whole city working together, not just one person, but the whole city working together to achieve an aspirational goal. And you've got um, 10,000 jobs and 10,000 extra dollars. Um, per person and we have achieved that goal and I look at this one and I think having an aspirational goal is a good one. You, having a, 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 a group and a shared responsibility across the city to achieve it is a good one. Also having personal responsibility about how each of us individually do our little bits whether it's walking, biking, whether it's mending our clothes, whether it's um, buying things at the op shop, reduce, reuse, recycle. It starts with us as individuals and then the whole city working in partnership to aspire to these goals. And I, I, I just think um, I agree with aspirational goals, even if we don't achieve them, if we start working together we've got the possibility of doing so. Councillor Staines. I've been listening to the debate and I can say for certain that if we don't do anything to try and reduce our carbon footprint, then there is one thing for certain, it won't reduce. And we, we are a governing body. We have a role to show some leadership. And as a city, our carbon footprint per person is probably quite high. Although that is a tiny piece of the issue that's facing the world. So I think we should have a visionary goal for our citizens. We should, and I agree with Councillor O'Malley, we should be getting into the do rather than what is it we need to do. There are things that we know now we could be doing and we need to take that bull by the horns basically and start doing some of it and advocating with our communities for the things that they can do that are simple enough that they can have a contribution towards it. I remember back to the days of, of rubbish recycling and the fact that nobody wanted to be recycling bottles, they just wanted to put rubbish out. We introduced that recycling and not long after people are starting to talk about, well, what about other rubbish? You know, now we're talking about green waste. People can get their head around these things if you take it in steps. And it's for, I think it's our responsibility to start taking those steps and showing the way for our residents to reduce their carbon footprint. Because there's one thing very clear to me, even though we may not make 2030 our 2030 goal, the government ain't going to make its 2050 goal unless all citizens and all councils get on board and do their bit. Seems quite, it seems clear to me, as, as Councillor Staines has said, that uh, the zero carbon transition isn't going to be done, isn't going to be achieved at a household scale uh, or a city scale or, a, or even a national scale. It's a, it's a require, it requires a, a concerted global effort. 
uh, and I certainly agree that while the target dates are effectively arbitrary, as has been traversed, had we had a 2050 target, then I can't imagine that we would have been debating what to do about that with any, anywhere near the degree of uh, urgency uh, in terms of um, the work that our staff are doing. It will require behaviour change, and it will require structural change, and it won't be achieved by banning polystyrene cups and a few beach cleanups. Uh, that isn't going to get us to where, uh, to where we need to get to. Um, it's been mentioned that our target puts us out of kilter with central government. Uh, we've been out of kilter with central government the entire time I've sat around this table. Uh, under the previous government, we were more, amb we were, uh, uh, more ambitious than them, and under the current government, uh, we're more ambitious uh, than them. Um, it's, it's what leadership looks like, and you know, we know uh, that people pushing us to do more and to, and to be more ambitious is how we end up making the decisions that we have made. And I can't see um, our, our government uh, or other uh, major players shifting in the direction that we know they need to without that sort of uh, concerted advocacy. Um, it's been mentioned that um, we've, we've talked a lot and, and reports have been written and staff have been employed and we've signed up to, to commitments and so on and nothing has been done. Uh, I would contest the fact that nothing has been done. In the current 10-year plan, there is significant capital investment in how we think about our transport network, and we know that the transport network is the single biggest thing that this council can influence to support the zero carbon transition. Uh, similarly, through the waste futures uh, work in terms of the, the waste system, is it enough? Absolutely not. But uh, we're getting on with doing work uh, rather than waiting for the, the plan it's in its entirety to be signed off. And it's a it's analogous, really, to the South Dunedin Futures work. Uh, the, the, the whole is currently being shaped up and coordinated, and, that's, and that is new. But the individual parts, whether it's the St Clair St Kilda Coastal Plan or, or the South Dunedin Library or other individual projects that make up that whole, uh, some of which are, are, are well advanced. And so the work is happening. It requires greater coordination and greater resourcing and greater investment. I uh, absolutely agree with, uh, with, with that. Uh, they're not. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive, um, and I mean, it's useful to have all of these uh, papers in a row on the agenda. We've just debated the South Dunedin Future Program, and uh, many around the table expressed their concern about the vulnerability of the people who live on the flat in those uh, exposed areas, uh, people who are exposed to the uh, growing instability of our climate. Uh, and then we get to turn the page and talk about doing something about taking the pressure off those people who are exposed to the vulnerabilities of a changing climate. And all of a sudden, uh, our ambitions and our aspirations dissipate uh, when we realise that we might have to actually do something differently ourselves uh, if we don't make good on the speeches that we make on behalf of others uh, who live in the most affected parts uh, of our city. And, I, and I had, um, I've, I've spared you all half the rant from the next paper. You'll be pleased to know uh, I hadn't intended speaking to a, a, a noting report, um, but some of those things uh, required responses. Councillor Benson Pope, you're right of reply. Um, thank you, Your Worship. And um, I must say, I'm I'm heartened by the appetite for action or more action uh, and I guess a bit like evolution it's been great to see that the membership of this council has moved from um, one or two deniers and a large number of climate sceptics to uh, a much more um, a, a much less easily defined uh, group of resistance I, I don't think anyone's saying that the small things like product stewardship or uh, the, pack the, the not so effective packaging accord aren't a small part of what we need to do. But the Mayor in a typically elegant fashion just described the reality here. We've just been talking about our concerns about South Dunedin, so what's the problem? You know, it is our shores that are threatened um, it's our economy as well, for those of you who put that first. Our glaciers are the ones that are melting. Uh, and how would poor Queenstown get on if there were no snow fields uh, for tourists from wherever to enjoy? 
This is something that the whole international community is demanding, including a large number of younger people who will be the ones most affected, who've been banging on it, actually knocked our door down and came to tell us what they expect of us. So by all means, uh, express concerns about a lack of action. Uh, by all means, demand of central government even more action than we're seeing. But we know that there are elements in our community, and we've seen that recently with the vehicle changes and the tax break changes and the, res the response to incentives about electric, electric vehicle use. We know there are elements in our community who strongly resist this sort of stuff. We know that corporates have dumped on us some of the biggest, oldest, dirtiest engines in the biggest, oldest, ugliest, most threatening utes uh, that we've seen in a long time on our streets because that was in their interest to do so, because other people were saying elsewhere, not anymore. So let's work on all fronts to make as much progress as we possibly can. And if anyone thinks that central government isn't doing enough, then they should be saying that loud and clear to central government, uh, as we have been, actually. And we'll have the opportunity to do so again in item 10. We'll take the vote by division. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Alder. Yes. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor <coughs> Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lefiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 13-1. Thank you. Item 10 uh, is uh, the DCC submission on uh, transitioning to a low emissions and climate resilient future. Um, it's quite all right. Uh, emissions reduction plan discussion document. We are waiting for for staff to appear. That's all right. Anything to offer by way of introduction? Uh, just to um, apologise for the mistake in the title, it should read climate, climate resilient future, not resilient future. Otherwise, take it as read. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And it's my intention to move the recommendations with a further addition of uh, a clause supporting the Free Fears public transport campaign, um, as has been indicated in advance of the meeting. Questions of staff? Councillor Barker. Thank you, Worship. Kia ora. I have a question around the, the hierarchy of plans, policies and strategies. I just want to understand kind of kind of where this um it's called an emissions reduction plan discussion document. So I kind of want to understand we give our feedback. I don't know if we have the ability to, to speak to that document and then what is the, the process for that going forward? Does it feed into other plans or strategies? How does it how does it actually work? Um, so the discussion document, um, my understanding with, in conversation with MFE, Ministry for the Environment, is that um, the submissions will go and they close tomorrow midnight, I believe, um, and then that will inform their mahi over the next few months, um, and they're planning to publish the final emissions reduction plan um, in May next year. The, the original intention, my understanding, is that it was for the emissions reduction plan to be out for feedback now, uh, and that that work was subsequently delayed by um, more COVID factors, particularly in terms of getting support or input from the private sector and the corporates in in Auckland. Uh, and so this is this is what's come in its place, uh, and the the plan itself will come out alongside the budget in May, government's budget. Council of Officer. Uh, tēnā koe, Your Worship. Tēnā um, I just 
noted the um, the parts of our submission or this yeah um, that oppose um, Kaitahu Kio Otago Okaha um, submission. Not quite, we're not quite at the RPS council. Oh, okay. That's it is on the that is on the agenda. Apologies. Uh, and we'll have people who are going to answer those questions for you, hopefully. Councillor Elder. Thank you for not forgetting me, Your Worship. Um, and, <laughs> and thank you very much for the submission. It's very detailed and, um, and a very interesting read. My question is that the tenure through quite a lot of it suggests that we'd be quite keen to be, I guess, guinea pigging on behalf of the government because the word pilot happen to be a pilot to trial stuff is, is requested. Is that done intentionally? And if, if so, has, have there been conversations that have indicated that might be something that's possibly <coughs> feasible? Uh, yes, that's intentional. Um, so I think this, this aligns somewhat with the uh, submission on the Climate Change Commission's advice. Um, and that was a th one of the themes in there. Um, I think also in one of the themes in conversations with my counterparts and other councils um, is that in the discussion document, uh, the role or collaboration of central government with local government is um, is not not emphasise as much as it could be um, and, and, and that was one way that we thought uh, we could um, given we have this this 2030 target we, we could be a good place to get some things moving yeah. you, You've answered my follow up question which was going to be do, do you think that having the 2030 target would, would actually play in our favour and you've asked that Councillor Elder Oh, my, my mic's still on. Um, there are just two questions, um, and actually it comes from my son in London, actually. Um, he got a subsidised bike, and in London they um, extend that to a number of businesses, and I was wondering if there was anything we put in related to the government having a, a, a higher aspiration in subsidising bikes to get people started. We could look at including that. Um, and the other thing my son in London has taught me, he does not own a car, but in his community there's a car that people hire when they need it. So if he wants to go for a big trip, he can hire it, he can book it. And I was wondering, especially in, in big cities with high populations and pop, big population densities, I think that's a really good way to go. And I was just wondering if there was any comment around that that we could put in related to um, the encouragement of shared, scar shared car C schemes. Com Council, we can include anything in our submission that we like. Um, the, the, the approach that staff have taken in drafting this has been to steer away from, from my understand, reading of this, steer away from individual actions. Uh, that might be undertaken to give effect to the high level feedback around. So there's commentary around what you, you know, thinking about the cost of public transport and thinking about early intervention in transport without singling out individual <coughs> itemised actions. Uh, so that's, that's been the approach of the drafting. We, we can change that if we want to have a round table <coughs> debate about individual actions that we might want to see included in it. That's not, a, that's not a question that staff can answer. Further questions? No. Um, uh, it's, I have indicated that I'll move this um, with uh, clause C um, uh, supporting, including council support for the uh, free fares uh, campaign who are also making submissions to the current um, consultation document. Is there a seconder? Seconded Councillor Walker. Um, thank, thank you. Uh, and, and like I said, a lot, a lot of this has been uh, 
traversed in the in the previous in the previous debate. Um, much has been made of the comment our Prime Minister made about climate change being the nuclear-free moment uh, of her generation. And the environmental movement in particular have, have jumped on that uh, and, what, and the perceived lack of action they see uh, on climate action as being um, somehow incongruous. Um, but I don't know if it is quite as incongruous as it might appear. The, the nuclear-free campaign, as noble and, and, and just as it was, uh, didn't require uh, anyone uh, here in New Zealand to make any real significant changes about how they lived their lives or how we structured our society or how we built our communities. Um, it had geopolitical implications, but nothing, nothing really in the day-to-day -day lives of people. Uh, and, um, and that isn't how we are going to uh, fix uh, our, our climate action problem. It does require action at every level, uh, every level of, of government, uh, of, of private enterprise, of community organisations, and it needs uh, those levels to be working together. And we need to be working uh, with government. And, and I applaud um, again the, the invitation that our staff have extended to central government in the drafting of this, that we want to work with them on ideas that might be able to give effect to our shared ambitions. Um, it's not about waiting for central government to set all the policy or fund all of the action or do all of the work for us because, as we've traversed in earlier papers today, we have a moral obligation to people in our own community uh, to say nothing of our wider uh, um, South Pacific community to, to, to be taking on some of this work uh, ourselves. Uh, there certainly is a lack of detail uh, in, the, in the consultation document, and I've, I've traversed that already. This was uh, initially intended to be a far more complete uh, document, uh, but um, global public health uh, responses have got in the way of that, and essentially we end up with this, which is uh, the government saying, Here's, we reckon this is about 70% of what we need to do, and uh, what do you reckon we could do to fill the other 30%, uh, and I look forward to seeing what comes of all of the feedback uh, when the, the plan itself comes through in May, uh, and uh, more importantly, uh, the resourcing that government allocate to the emissions reduction plan uh, through the budget setting process uh, in May. Uh, I think it is, it is right uh, for us to make the suggested amendments that we have in terms of prioritising uh, cutting uh, our greenhouse gas emissions as opposed to trying to buy ourselves a free pass through whatever offsetting mechanism we might be able to find ourselves on the uh, international market. Um, because we do, as has been traversed already today, need to uh, change how we how our, how our society functions. We need to change how we move people uh, around. We need to change how we move freight around, how we plan cities, how we build houses, uh, how we manage our, our waste system, uh, all, of those, uh, all of those things. Uh, and, and, um, and I'm heartened to see the comments that have been made in this, in this submission around uh, what does a just transition look like uh, and what does uh, an equitable response uh, to, uh, to climate change uh, look like because we can't afford to treat this as one giant trolley problem uh, where, uh, as always is the case in these situations, the communities who have played the, least, this played the smallest part in creating the mess that we're currently in uh, end up at the pointiest end of, um, of uh, the developed world's largesse, uh, shall we say. Uh, this will require early action and investment, and this goes back to the debate we've just had around you know, talking and planning. Uh, we, need, uh, we need to be intervening uh, early, particularly in areas where uh, existing alternatives uh, and options exist for us, uh, and, and we need it everywhere. Uh, we can't afford, um, as, a, as a city here in Dunedin, to wait for uh, Auckland and Wellington and Christchurch to have their uh, transport networks um, future-proofed uh, in the way that they're currently having those conversations with fairly uh, dramatic price tags until it's our turn. Uh, there needs to be a, a focus on um, providing uh, those uh, alternatives for people uh, across the country. And, and, and that was what led me to uh, supporting the, um, the, the, or strengthening the wording that's already in the document uh, to, and bringing us to the point where we support the Free Fears campaign, which is being run by a, a coalition of community groups, trade unions, 
um, uh, social service agencies uh, and is focusing on uh, calling on the government to provide free public transport for uh, people with community services, uh, services cards, uh, people under the age of 25, uh, and for all tertiary students. Uh, and, and my personal view is that that doesn't necessarily go far enough, but it's certainly a, a step in the right direction. And I think it's a campaign worth getting behind, not just for the environmental implications of rethinking our transport network, but uh, for all of this council's stated uh, social well-being goals around making sure that people in our, in our community have access to everything uh, that this city uh, has to offer, which currently isn't the situation when we have a, a transport network that, uh, that excludes people in the way that it currently uh, currently does, uh, and uh, we can uh, do it uh, without panic uh, as an authority, and that the, the ask of the campaign is for that to be funded by the government, uh, not to be funded by the, directly by the, the ratepayers of either the regional council or any territorial authority uh, in this, uh, in this uh, district. Um, but uh, there is certainly a, a degree of, uh, of urgency uh, in terms of the challenge that we face, and I, and I welcome that uh, being uh, quite clearly laid out in the submission uh, as, uh, as drafted by staff, uh, and welcome support for it. Further speakers? Councillor Manners. Do we have questions first, or? You can, you can raise questions and speak into it. And I, I can address them in my right of reply. Right. Um, I will. If, if I have to raise questions while speaking to it, my one opportunity to speak, I'll choose to speak later. That's fine. Further speakers? Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I support the submission Part B. Um, I support, in principle, the idea of free public transport, and I would actually say that, in fact, if you're taking this seriously, it shouldn't actually have any restrictions. And, in fact, if you want to get conversion, transport should, public transport should be free. But I would actually say that until the Land Transport Management Act is changed, it's not, it's the second activity that we need to pursue first. The first activity is that territorial authorities should be running their public transport systems so that they can actively integrate them into the carbon reduction plans of their transport systems. And I'll give you a really good example of something that I was witness to on the Waikawaiti coast just recently. At the community board meeting, they had asked for extra buses to be put on for that region, and they were told by the ORC transport planner that the NZTA money that was coming to support them had been turned down. And then when I asked why, he said because the business plan had not been put forward. And I said, who's supposed to put the business plan forward? And he said, the ORC. And I said, did you? And he said, no, we didn't. And then I said, why not? And he said, because we're not sufficiently resourced to put that plan forward. So while the public transport system remains in the Otago Regional Council, we are not actually achieving our outcomes in public transport. So I support this, and I will support this, but I raise again, we cannot just simply accept that the OIC just wants to hold on to the public transport component and just refuses to give it to us. We've got to get those buses back because that's part of our whole integrated transport plan. I know it's a sidebar, but the fees, the free fares for public transport are important, but out of context of running the buses properly, they're not going to be as effective as if we had that, that control inside our planning systems. Further speakers? Councillor Wiley. Um, I'm going to support A and C, um, A and C, but I'm not going to be supporting B. Um, and the reason for that being is that, as much as I agree with some of what they're trying to achieve here, the issue is that actually there is another way to do this, and working with our tertiary institutions. And there's also the ability. We know that funding for the bus service is about creating a better, better bus network. And I think we're just going to end up with the status quo of a bus system that sort of works but doesn't really work. What we really need, as I believe, is greater revenue within the system. And the $2 fare is a good, great way to, for that to happen. And tertiary students aren't going to hop on the bus just because it's free. And the reason I say that is because you look at a lot of the oldies that have the, the gold card. Do they hop on the bus because it's free? No, they still drive their car. 
What we need is a bus service that actually works far more effectively. And when I look at what this free fare is all about, it's about, yeah, working through a bus system, but it's not about providing a better, more effective bus system. And I can't see that happening for Dunedin, unless there's more information that I'm missing. But as I went through this last night, and understanding how our bus system here works, frequency, types of buses, how the transport network can operate more effectively, unfortunately, is about dollars. And unless I know where the dollars is going to come to fund that better transport system, that's going to be a barrier for us. And so as much as I, I like the idea of some of this, especially with the tertiary students, um, the under 25s, the key is, though, we need it to be funded. And again, the government is consistently showing us, from what I can see, is that they will only fund it to a certain point. And so hence I go back to something that I've talked about before. If the students actually invest in it, they will use it. And I think that's the biggest part that I look at. And I think the bus service, we need a far better, more effective bus service, but I don't think this is the pathway for that to happen. Councillor Walker. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. And, <clears throat> and forgive me, uh, Councillor Wiley, I'm not picking on you because I'm going to use you as an example again, as I did earlier. Um, you suggest that by, by, by providing free bus service, students won't use it. I remember um, coming into this room actually about 18, 19 years ago, um, advocating for better cycle infrastructure around the city. And most of the councillors at that time were not interested in my submission, just looked at me and said, we can provide all the infrastructure we want, but we're just not a cycling city. Nobody will ever cycle. Here we are 20 years later. <clears throat> I, along with thousands of other people, cycle every day around this city, and those numbers are rising exponentially. If you provide free bus fares, more people will use it. Queenstown, look at Queenstown. Look at the $2 fare. You can shake your head all you want. You can't, you can't excuse me, I'm speaking. Shake your head all you want. People, please. Um, I, yeah, so I've obviously seconded in this, and I support ABC. Point of order. Um, Point of order, Councillor uh, Wiley. Councillor Walker is indicating that I don't support the $2 bus fare. I, I said I did. No, that's, what's, the point of, what's the point of order? That Councillor Walker took what I said out of context. I don't know if out of context is a valid point of order, Councillors. I'm not going to uphold it. I'll Councillor make a Walker. point of order. Uh, Councillor Walker is misleading Council because a usage of uh, cycleways and push bike riding is not rising exponentially. If, if, he, if he was to ask his wife, he'd find out what exponential means. And a steady oh, increase, steady but slow, is not exponential. Uh, no, I'm not going to uphold the point of order. Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, yep, so as I was saying, I support ABC. Um, I, I particularly um, support B. And to be honest, if we look at um, a submission under item 44, all we're really doing is strengthening what's already there, because we already say uh, substantial fare and or elimination would be straightforward to implement in the first budget period. So I just think it's worth um, supporting this for no other reason for, for me. It's, a, it's an equity question as much as an environmental question. Um, it's about reducing emissions and improving, improving equity, and I don't think any of us can, could disagree with that. Um, and I, in general, I'm really pleased with the whole submission, and I go right uh, towards the end to number 68, and I, I really gl I'm glad we included, um, we, well, we suggested other methods for reducing waste emissions um, and involving uh, and considering supply chains. I think that's really, really important, um, and it's nice to see the government's been talking about that at a higher level, and also mandatory um, project product stewardship schemes and reuse quotas, and I think um, much of the world is moving that way, and I think New Zealand is probably p p uh, you know, doing a bit of catch-up there, to be honest. And, of course, it includes all the usual suspects, like bounds of single-use products, which um, you'd think by the year 2021 would just be, be um, the, the modus operandi. So, yep, I support it all. And um, if nothing else, the last three items have certainly highlighted um, what a per perilous state the world is in, to be honest, and the challenges, the challenges we, we have ahead. And I just urge all of you around this table and after next October to be, whoever's here, just to continue to be, keep being bold, please. Further speakers, Councillor Reddick. 
Yes, I actually support the, um, the motion, but I would like to point out and support um, one of the points that Councillor Wiley made, and that funding, funding blanket free fares is not necessarily the way to go for public transport. I certainly support funding some free fares and I think sele selective use of that mechanism um, to make, to increase usage, ridership of the buses to the highest possible extent uh, would be a helpful thing. However, I'm not going to uh, not support the motion just because I'd like the word some inserted. Thank you. Councillor Staines. Thank you, Your Worship. I support all of these resolutions. And if we link it back to what we've had on the previous two items, this council needs to move towards reducing its carbon footprint. And one way to do that is to get people onto buses. Now, it seems to me that right now, Many people believe that driving their car into town is actually cheaper than riding a bus. We need to drive that out. of if, the, if there's no charge for getting on the bus, well, the bus is cheaper than driving your car. But to add to that, and in risk of being put on the gallows in the middle of the octagon, there's a second part which is in our court that we need to deal with. And that is, there should be less commuter parking as part of if we can get free transport, if the government can give us free fares for public transport, our side of the bargain should be that we make it more expensive for all day parking around the city. Encourage, it's the, it's the commuter population. If we want to drive down carbon emissions from transport from personal vehicles, if you can stop commuter vehicles, by providing an alternative which is more attractive than personal car, then we will start down the path of dropping our carbon footprint. Thank you. Councillor Venevis. Free transport, free beer, free bread, free circuses. Nothing is free. And it's not specified who's paying for all of this. We are just one COVID variant away from people avoiding COVID coaches, trains or any other transportation where they're all crammed into the same box. The claim that cycle numbers are rising exponentially is a claim that you only need to drive up and down the one-way street system 50 times before you actually see a cyclist. And that was seen coming. And I argued against it in this council in 2012. I said, they said, if we build the cycleway up and down the one-way street system, people will use it. Well, I said, you're going to lose a massive amount of car parking, part of the agenda. That loss has been estimated, or it was then, at half a million dollars a year to the council and lost parking revenue every year. Move forward 10 years and those wretched cycleways remain mostly unused. You've got more chance of seeing a scooter on the cycleway than you have seeing a cyclist. The utter waste that we have indulged the carbon footprint of putting all those concrete lumps up and down what used to be really good usable parks up and down the one-way street system, to me, is just incredible. And that after 10 years of failing to actually get a decent number of people using this facility, we are still persisting with it. Mayor Hawkins has talked about the mess that we are currently in. The mess that I see is the excessive debt, the billion dollar plus debt that's coming up next on the agenda. The mess that I see is the indulgence by this council in transportation projects that aim to somehow alleviate parking problems by not producing any parks and spend 10 million on wayfinding anyway, another 10 million on uh, 
uh, park and ride facilities, which, like the lumps of concrete up and down our one-way street system, I now predict will not be significantly used. That's another 10 million down the, down the Swanee, as, as I see it. Um, Councillor O'Malley has said we need to get those buses back. We got rid of them because we were making a mess of running them in the first place. The ORC at least have tried to improve on that. Mayor Hawkins said the transportation, we have a transport network that excludes people. The ORC runs a transportation network called the bus service and they've excluded us from running it and for very good reason. We have wasted an awful lot of time and energy trying to take back the buses and make them free. And the ORC have basically said, go away, you're not having them. They're not yours, they're ours. This crippling ORC fighting the DCC all the time, and they do it uh, over minor uh, um, issues and in interpretation of government laws, is one of the parts of the mess that we're in. A mess we could have avoided, by the way, if we had gone for a unitary council uh, some time ago. Councillor, I'd ask you to focus on the matter at hand. The matter in hand. I can't approve the DCC submission for similar reasons to the last one. It's virtue signalling rubbish. It's not going to make any difference at all. Uh, I can't uh, support free bus fares when I don't know who's paying for them and when I very much doubt they're going to have much effect on the number of people using them anyway. Um, and in terms of authorising the Chief Executive to make any minor editorial changes to the submission, I can't foresee any minor changes that she could make that I could vote for either. So I'm voting against the whole lot. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Your Worship. I support A, B and C. Um, it's good to see central government actually taking some leadership and working to provide a plan that will help umbrella our plan to come. Um, Councillor Stain certainly brought up a, a, a rational consumer point around making a decision between which costs the more to take a bus, a free bus, versus driving your car in, and it saddens me when I drive in an electric vehicle, um, and to see all of the one single person cars driving into town that will all need single person parks or um, using fuel, etc., etc. And we, I think we really do need to work on mode shift. When we look at transport, it is, does create the highest emissions, and this is the low, low hanging fruit that we've been looking at. Um, how do we minimise this through cycleways, um, through building our park and rides, and, and is signalled in our in our plans to come? I therefore I do support looking at funding free fares, and I do know that someone has to pay for them, and I for one am willing to pay for them. Councillor Officer. Tēnā koe, Your Worship. I'd just like to say tēnā koutou to the staff again for doing as we've asked, and um, thank you, Your Worship, for moving. Um, and I, for me, it all, as I've said in the previous debate and as Councillor Wiley said before with this afternoon and futures, it's people, people, people. And for me, the, the main, the engine room of this submission is behaviour change, empowering action from our people. And I'll just relate, I was very privileged in 2011 to visit Victory um, School and it was a victory hub. It was at the back of the school and it was a 20 year uh, project um, between the community and the school. And in showing us around, the principal Mark Brown said to us, uh, various community organisers from around the country, he said, we spent $20,000 on transport, on taxi fares to transport uh, former refugees, mainly from Burma, to come to the school for English language classes. And he said it was really important and it's been a feature of that develop community development to remove all barriers to participation. And this is what I think this is about. This is what it's about in terms of empowering people to be able to use public transport. And contrary to what Councillor Wiley claims, I use the buses and I see a lot of um, superannuitants using the buses 
particularly um, in the hours that apply. So uh, for me, it's a case of empower the people um, and let them participate fully in society because they, they will be able to participate um, as sections of us, privileged people already do. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Mayor for putting forward the suggestion of um, free bus fares. I think free bus fares are a great idea. Anywhere we can support that makes sense. It's um, reducing our climate emission, our, our carbon emissions, and helping combat, obviously, climate change. Um, reducing people using their cars makes sense, and if they want to use a bus, great. And it also means the people who want to use a car hopefully can get a park and the roads aren't as clogged, which I approve of because um, I, I use a car, but my children, well, one of my children uses a bus. And I do believe that if a bus is free, uh, a lot more people will use them. My concern is we don't run the buses, ORC do. How can we guarantee that... ORC will now follow through with this if we approve this. You know, I don't know, has that been negotiated? I'm not sure I haven't had the detail on that. But, that, yes, well, that's right, a submission to the government, but it's ORC who is running the buses. So unless we have control over that, which we don't, I'm not sure whether this will happen. Um, but I do think it's a great idea to submit, like we do, to the government on any issue as it comes up, and particularly around this, because we've got major problems with South Dunedin in the future and climate change and how that will affect that area particularly. But other areas, coastal areas like Brighton and like other areas in our city will also be affected. And we need, we can't pay for all this ourselves. And we need the um, government to give us help, financial help, to do a lot of mitigation around the sea, particularly the sea walls and things like that, that there's massive amounts of work that needs to be done there. All of that is climate change mitigation. So um, it makes sense to me that we submit and we, and if you've, once again, going back, if you've got a goal, if you stipulate and state to people that can help you with it what your goals are and what you hope to achieve, it helps them know, okay, DCC is clear, they've given us a clear direction, they've told us what they need, and then they can help us. Because if you don't say what you need, you're not going to receive. So thank you very much for trying to help us with this. Excellent. Further speakers? Councillor Lord. Uh, thank you, Worship. Yeah, look, I can support A begrudgingly. I can support C, but I can't support B. And um, Councillor Vandervis referred to it at the start, but then he sort of changed his tack. But <coughs> I think the point he made very well and clear that I picked up is that there's no such thing as a free fare. Somebody has to pay for it. There's no such thing as a free lunch. It's a well-known um, uh, comment. Somebody still has to pick up the tab for that. And uh, one of the problems that I had with the free fares or the supporting the ORC in their last um, year's uh, annual plan was the fact that they would take money from the general rate. So often people that have absolutely no ability to use those buses, people that could be farming at the extremes of Hyde or something like that are paying a, a magnified contribution up to 20, 30 times what the average ratepayer pays um, to to support people using buses. Now that in itself wouldn't necessarily be wrong if it was fair and equitable, but it's not because of the large capital values of those properties um, and, and the fact that they have no access to use those buses. Now I realise that this is talking about government funding but the same rules applies. It falls to people that may, in many cases, have no equitable access to the service. It'd be a wee bit different if those people lived in town and chose not to use the buses. That's a wee bit different. It's like a library. You get a you get a choice to use or not to use. But I, I can't support because I just simply don't believe there's any such thing as a free fare. Someone always pays, and I'm sure the mayor understands that too. I'm not thinking for a moment that he thinks that somehow money magics, but buses need to be paid for, so I can't support free fares. Further speakers? Um, I'll be brief in response. The, the, the question has been asked by a number of people, the question of 
who pays for it. I agree with Councillor Law and Councillor Vandivis, nothing is free, but the answer is we pay for it. Uh, through taxation, um, by way of the government who would fund this initiative as it is being asked for in the same way that our schools are paid for uh, and our hospitals are paid for. I mean, our libraries aren't free either, uh, but we've decided that it is worth us collectively chipping in through paying rates to, to provide a service to our community regardless of whether we uh, individually use them or not. Uh, the suggestion has been made that the tertiary institutions should pay. Uh, I can't imagine there being much appetite uh, at the university to pay for people on low incomes in our community to use the buses for free or uh, for people under the age of 25 who aren't enrolled in their institutions. Um, that's, that's not how it works. Uh, comments have also been made around uh, the fact that the... I mean, I agree with the comments that have been made around how, how, how we can better integrate the public transport network um, by being in direct control of it, and I certainly uh, don't disagree with comments about the fact that the service could be improved and the service could be better, uh, but at present we know that the service as it currently exists uh, is beyond people uh, due to the way that we recoup the funding for that service uh, by people paying to buy fares uh, to use the bus, uh, it, which makes it not accessible to people, and this is entirely in line with the comments that have been made in our uh, submission around supporting a just transition. Uh, it's, a, it's as much about um, equity uh, and social well-being, in my view, as it is about uh, environmental well-being, uh, because there is no climate justice uh, without social justice, uh, and as uh, Chico Mendes uh, was keen to point out, uh, environmentalism uh, without class struggle is just gardening. Uh, and I'll take the votes in parts and we'll take them all by division. Councillor Barker. This is for resolution A. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lefiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandivis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 13-1. Now we'll do resolution B. Includes support for funding free fares for public transport. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Hall. No. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lefiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. No. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandivis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. No. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 10-4. Need, oh, do we need to take C by division? No, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Councillor Vandivers, would you like to record your vote against C? No. <laughs> Very benevolent of you, thank you. Uh, item 11, uh, and we will uh, break after this item. Mr Logie is on his way, and now he is here. Anything from you? Okay. Questions, colleagues? Being none, would someone like to move? Councillor Lord has moved the recommendation. Is there a seconder? Seconded Councillor Hall. Thank you, Mr Logie. That was brief. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Well, I think... Um it's uh, very much a case of this is necessary, and the reason it's necessary is because last or earlier in the year we set a 10-year plan, and in that 10-year plan we outlaid spending and expenditure that now calls for this to happen. It was, uh, it was well known at that time that we would need to do this extra borrowing, and um, the only person that 
perhaps has the right to vote against us now would be the only person who voted against the long-term plan. But for the other 12 of us around the table, I'd expect this will be unanimous. Unusual maths for the Chair of Finance, it has to be noted, but further speakers? <laughs> Councillor Vernivus. <coughs> I see a bit of smiling and a bit of looking sideways around the table. And this on the occasion when this council wants to tick off a debt ceiling of $1.2 billion. We're not just talking millions anymore, we're talking billions. We're talking a debt that has basically already been planned, as Councillor Lord has pointed out. A debt, if you look at the graph of which I've had to get made up myself because we don't get decent graphs on debt from the DCC, certainly not ones that go back 10, 20 years, or preferably go back to 1995 when the DCC had no debt. This building was built with no debt. The Civic Centre was built with a very short-term debt that was paid back. The railway station, all the glorious buildings that people were rhapsodising over this morning and other agenda items were built with no debt. And when you look at the debt graph that we are now about to tick off, it is the steepest, most massive increase in our history and we're not even building anything with it. A billion dollars worth of debt is something that you need to get your head around in terms of, has anyone here really considered ever paying it back? If, for instance, we were to pretend that there won't be ongoing onerous and increased interest rates on this billion dollar debt. And if we were to pretend that as of tomorrow, we could start paying back the debt at a rate of a dollar every minute, and we kept paying back the debt a dollar a minute, every minute, day and night, how long would it take us to pay back this billion dollar debt? The answer is close to 2,000 years. The year 3,922 would be the time it would take to pay back the debt that you as a council, and I say you advisedly, have been ratcheting up for many years now. We're getting nothing for this debt. We are funding uh, pet projects for which there is no real value, and I'm talking about the recent $53 million worth of transportation projects that I voted against that I see no value in, the $60 million that has been uh, voted for for the surface treatments that go from George Street down to the exchange, again, for which I believe we are going to get no value for. That's over $100 million just there. And that's something that we collectively here have done recently. And now we want to push this debt up and keep pushing it up. For what reason? Oh, we have to deal with deferred maintenance in Aurora in particular. And we've got all these capital projects that the DCC has to do. Yes, it's mainly Aurora and it's mainly DCC. We have failed to look at our council companies and take control of them. We have listened to the argument from Aurora for at least five years now that, oh, we had all this deferred maintenance and we have to uh, do all this extra work to pay it back. Well, they've been doing that for five years now and they've not been doing it well. The Commerce Commission has fined them $5 million for failing to keep safety standards, and we still have outages on a regular basis even now, five years down the track, and now they want more and more and more money. That's your five minutes, Councillor. Councillor Obviously, Raddick. I'm not going to be voting for this, 
and anyone that does Councillor. needs to think about the 2,000 years it's going to take to pay it back. <laughs> Councillor Reddick. Yes, um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> back in uh, 10th of December 2019, we increased the share capital from 850 to 975 million, which is a pretty eye-watering <laughs> sum back there, an increase of 125 million. And now we're being asked to take it to 1.2 billion, an increase of 225 million. So it's an extra 100 million increase. So it's a $225 million increase. And actually, uh, I contend that just this merely pushes out the boundary. It's not actually necessary. And I think it's better to keep the boundaries where they are right now. And it's better to have those tighter boundaries to ensure that the council lives within, within those enforced boundaries, just as most people in their households and people in their businesses live within bank or self-imposed boundaries. Currently, the facility limit is 921 million, and we've got 975 now, and the requested, the expected facility limit is 971, so that is still within our boundary. In other words, the expected increase in council debt is still within the uncalled share capital of 975 million. Therefore, this is not necessary at this time. I also look to the net profit after tax within the companies, showing 10,020, uh, 10 million and 20 million, uh, a one and a two percent return on investment for council's money, which uh, strikes me as ex exceedingly low. So I'd like to see improvements in that regard. And uh, I, I don't see any need to just simply keep increasing debt when the return on the investment from that debt, in my opinion, is insufficient. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I'll remind councillors that it's not the council's uh, debt uh, that we are discussing, it's the group debt, uh, which uh, will sit within, uh, as, as per the statements of intent, at 1.1.6 billion uh, by the 30th of June 2024, and that is what we are being asked uh, at this meeting to bring uh, uncalled uh, capital in line with decisions that have been previously made uh, by council, bearing in mind that some of those weren't universally supported by elected members. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, well, I would love, I've seen the ads for them and they look amazing, I would love a hybrid Lexus. And I would also love a, a SUV that's a Volvo, because apparently Volvos are one of the best, um, you know, safest cars you can buy. But I haven't budgeted for those, unfortunately. And right now, I mean, I really can't justify buying them. I haven't got the money right now, so I don't think, I don't see that happening. Um, yet, you know, and I think probably what I'm saying would be the same for most families, that when you're going to buy your groceries or you're thinking about a new car, you think, oh, I'd love this or I'd love that. And most families will do a budget and they'll go, okay, well, we'll get this, we'll spend this much money on food, we'll put this much away, maybe for a holiday one day when the border's open. And, you know, we'll, we'll, so they work like that. I try to, and that's the way, you know, most families probably operate. However, it seems to me that as a council, we're not, not doing that all the time. You know, we had our 10-year budget, and now I think in my term trimester since being here, we've had council staff come to us maybe two, perhaps even three times and say we need to increase the budget. Now, I'd like to do that at home too because I want to buy, you know, Louis Vuitton handbags, but I can't afford it. I'd love to buy all sorts of things. The list goes on and on. I mean, I could shop till I drop, quite frankly. But is that sensible? And is it, you know, it's not. It's extravagant. And I can't justify this, and I will not be supporting it because enough is enough. You've got to say, there's a point where you've got to say, OK, I haven't got that in my budget, I'm not going to do it. You can't keep adding to your debt all the time. What happens is, and as a society, 
it is happening, you know, some people are doing that. They're adding to the credit cards all the time and the debt levels get higher and higher. And you know what happens? That's where they get into trouble. So we have to be very aware that there are consequences to adding to your debt all the time. It's not just, oh, payday will never come. The payday does come and we'll be asked when the rate interest rates are higher to pay back some of this. Banks, I can tell you, on the everyday people, when you go for a mortgage, because ju I just changed a mortgage recently, and, you know, when you're asking for different conditions, they want to see everything you had for breakfast. And, you know, things are tighter. Banks are tighter. Now, why is that not the case for council? And it will be. Things are going to be tighter for us as well. And interest rates are going up. And we need to be aware of that because increasing debt has implications on future things that we want to do and we have to stop enough is enough. We can't keep adding to this debt. Councillor Staines. I think some councillors have forgotten about inflation. We heard the comment that in 1995 the council had no debt. Well, I just took a little look back, not for 1995, but for the 1990-91 year. And the debt then was 32 million DCC debt, 40 million CCO debt. So a total of 72 million. I hopped on to the Reserve Bank of New Zealand CPI calculator, calculated that out using their calculator, and it says that the same amount of money, the 72 million, today would be 1.106 million. So it's not far away from what we're looking at, adjusting to, and I would strongly challenge that this is spendthrift that's causing the debt to increase. Two things cause it. One, infl the effect of inflation. Two, the investment that this council is making in its 10-year plan. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Worship. Um, I would also like to point out that a lot of the heritage buildings were built um, with levy off gold being harvested from the interior in much the same way that all the lovely buildings in Christchurch were paid for by West Coast Gold. Um, and if we look back at the low debt level and we look at Aurora's debt right now, it, although Aurora, a lot of its debt is expansion into Western and Central Otago in that component, the other part is actually catching up on a period where we absolutely decided not to spend and in fact to defer maintenance and that it caught us because we were going to keep the debt down. So. That's, that's, in my opinion, that's what that kind of talk ends up leading us towards. And then the other one is city forest debt, and I'm sure Councillor Lord and his right of reply are going to catch into this one. It's not so much your debt alone, it's your debt against your asset base. And we've got good asset base in our, in our CCOs. So nobody's calling red flags here, except those who basically are looking at these numbers out of context, and then basically, I would almost say, but I won't say it, looking for headlines. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Worship. I support this. As Councillor Lord said, um, councillors agreed in May and June to this budget, and this enables us to pursue the, as it says in the summary of considerations, approved strategic projects and plans that we've already agreed, incurs very small legal costs versus if we didn't do it, it would have significant costs in non-delivery of our capital program, and it supports our group credit rating assessment. And I point out one, um, Councillor Hulian was talking about the auditors want, to, sorry, that the people, the bankers who are lending want to see everything we've had for breakfast. Well, we are audited, and we've had we've got an equity of over three billion dollars. So our debt to equity ratio is actually fairly reasonable. This is about um, our, enabling our capital expenditure to happen that we've agreed on. Um, it's about intergenerational equity, and as Councillor Staines pointed out, the ratios are still the same as they were in the 1990s, so I feel comfortable with this. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Um, I will be supporting this. Um, I think the key for me is that it's providing a one point two billion uh, uncalled capital. It's not about spending all the money. And I think we go back to the 10-year plan and what we voted on and going through. And we, Some of us got all we wanted in the 10-year plan, some of us didn't. Um, but this is not about re-litigating all those debates. And 
where we should be investing money or spending money or how, what we should be doing with it. The key is that discussion took place. We are reacting to what is needed come out of the 10-year plan for the next three years uh, and beyond. And I think the key part, though, is it, and again, I go back to a discussion that we had the last election campaign. When you look at Aurora, the last thing you do with a house halfway through renovation is go and sell it. You know, go, let's go through, let's invest in Aurora, let's do what we need to do with Aurora, and then when it's all uh, state of the art and delivering, then we can decide what we're going to do with it. And again, there's a lot of things we can look at for our assets and how we look at them later on. But I think the right now, the discussion and the decision we have in front of us, I will be supporting because I think that's the sensible way to go. Further speakers? Councillor Walker. I'll be very brief. I don't want to repeat. Um, everyone who's spoken in support, um, I'm very much in support of this and uh, commend the report. But I do want to put it on record now that I will not be running for re-election in the year 39-22. Thank you. If only we could all make such assurances. Uh, further speakers. Um, well, I can I can support this, and I don't see what the alternative is at this point. This is uh, bringing the uncalled capital into line with previous decisions of council, regardless of where individual elected members may sit on those decisions that were taken, whether that was around our 10-year plan or or the council and company's uh, statements of intent. Um, it is often well-meaning, but it's not particularly helpful, I don't think, to try and compare uh, how we run a city and how we fund a city uh, with how someone buys their own groceries uh, on a week-to-week -week basis. I mean, we're talking about investing in, uh, in networks uh, and investing in a city uh, that will benefit uh, ratepayers for decades to come, and, and it is only uh, equitable that the cost of servicing that debt is paid off uh, over decades. It's not uh, akin to a roast chicken that might be left to rot at the end of the week uh, from, uh, from, from people's uh, groceries. And it's easy now for individuals around this table to pick off one or two things that they didn't like uh, in the 10-year plan uh, and use that as an argument uh, to vote against us funding the work that has been agreed by Council through the 10-year plan. Uh, which has a $1.5 billion capital budget, of which roughly two-thirds of that is replacing ageing infrastructure. Uh, again, a, a topic that has already been raised uh, earlier on in this meeting in terms of how we better support the resilience of our communities, particularly those in low-lying areas, uh, and then to vote against <laughs> being able to finance the work that we have already planned and approved that works towards creating that exact resilience that we are after uh, seems uh, unnecessarily uh, churlish uh, and counterproductive. Councillor Lord, your right of reply. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, look, there was just a couple of things. I think it's probably been said, and I know what the vote's going to be in advance, but the, the interesting thing that I find is we've got... Um, Councillor Vander was saying that we're getting nothing for this money, and I think that needs to be put front and centre. Just uh, as the Mayor's just said, just because you don't agree with something doesn't make it nothing. And um, I think since 2016, there's been a very robust uh, plan to rebuild Aurora, and we know that that's taken a good portion of this money. We also know that as a city council, we're investing in a huge number of assets. And even if you took a hundred million that you didn't agree with uh, Councillor Van de Vos out of the long-term plan, there was still another seven hundred and fifty million dollars worth of capital expenditure: rebuilding roads, rebuilding our, our council buildings, rebuilding our uh, uh, library in South Dunedin. There's a whole lot of projects there that we can't sit there and say these things are valued at nothing. Uh, to, to Councillor Staines's point, it was exactly what I was going to do. I was going to re refer to, and, and I just think even the time I've been on council, a house that was purchased for three hundred thousand dollars in two thousand and twelve, um, just sold the other day, six sixty odd thousand. You know, um, we can sit there and, and Councillor Hulahan can talk about her uh, Lexus that she wants, and, and that's fine to want a Lexus. But actually, when we look at people today uh, buying properties, you know, if I said uh, 
when I first went to buy a property, you know, I could have put up enough, I could have paid cash for a house in the 90s um, with my savings. The reality of it is that people can't do that today. People have got much bigger mortgages than their parents had. That is just the reality of inflationary living. Um, to say this is out of control, I don't think it is out of control, I think we're taking control. We're rebuilding a lot of things around this city and um, the comment from also from Councillor who we have to live within our boundaries. Well, let's let's look at, oh sorry, that might have been Councillor Radish, that we have to live within our boundaries. Yep, people do live within their boundaries, but boundaries change. I mean, years and years ago you could get someone to mow your lawn for a dollar. I don't think you'd find too many people want to mow your lawn today for a dollar. Um, you know, that's that's the reality of it, is that, that there is inflationary pressure that's changed a lot of these things. And, um, and, and then the final point I'd just make is these are decisions that we made earlier in the year that built all these things in place. And um, whether you like it or not, to sit there and agree that things are OK six months ago and now say, oh, well, look, I don't want the debt forecast. Well, that was all forecasted in the long-term plan. So unless you're running for me or something like that and you've got some standout you want a point of interest or point of difference, I think people should support this. As I said earlier, the only person that's got the right not to is Councillor Vandivis. Uh, I can't really be taken into... No. Well, uh, we'll, take the vote. we'll take the vote by division. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. No. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. No. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 11-3. Thank you. I'll move that we adjourn the meeting until 22.4. Seconded. Donald Rush, Councillor Barker. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Thank you.
to item 12. The Dunedin City Council further submission to the Otago Regional Council Regional Policy Statement uh, 2021. As you are, as councillors are aware, uh, this has been submitted and that the due date for submissions was uh, in advance of being able to bring it to a meeting of council or council committee uh, for approval given the uh, efficient timeline uh, of the regional council's processes. Uh, anything further to that, Mr Freeland or Mr Drew, that you want to add at this point? I just want to say that this is just a normal uh, planning process, the two-step of an original submission and a further submission, and that the Regional Council received over 300 submissions, and credit to them, they've managed to summarise them all, which ended up being um, over 800 pages of original submission points. And the 10 working days for further submissions are set down in the Act. There's no real ability to depart from that. doesn't fit very well with uh, Council beating schedules and uh, once again we're just caught out in this retrospective situation. Our options at this point as I understand them are to withdraw the submission at this point or to approve it. We don't have the option of amending it. No, I th you could withdraw it in part as well if there were certain aspects which um, you didn't believe it was necessary to further submit on that would be a possibility as well. Okay. Councillor Officer. Atinako, Your Worship, um, thank you so much for the mahi and, and responding, especially in the tight time frames. And I understand from the Chief Executive um, staff are having to constantly do these things. And um, I've, I'm not in favour of, I'm not advocating any position regarding the withdrawing or anything, but I just um, forgive my ignorance of the process. Um, but I, I think my question is for either His Worship or or uh, the chief executive, because it's, uh, with respect to the summary of, um, summary of considerations, um, where there was not time for staff to engage with mana whenua or okaha, uh, just, to, just to looking where it's uh, where there's opposing where we're opposing stances by um, mana whenua, uh, in the, so, given the hegemony of um, our organisations as Toiwi, um, as bodies who are not Māori, um, what's the overall process in terms of how do how do opposing mana whenua, tangata whenua stances in the overall scheme of things? How does that facilitate relationships, relationship building? given that you don't have time to really nut these out and it just comes out baldly um, in that. If I might just check with Mr Freeland, have a question that might help answer your question, if that's all right. If that's all right. Mm. Do you know if Okaha um, submitted or have done further submissions on... So Okaha have submitted, and as indicated in the original um, report to the submissions, they worked closely and consulted closely with the Regional Council on this plan change. Um, we have also received about 20 further submissions to our original submission, and there have been some, uh, and some of our further submissions are by submitters um, who represent iwi, I think Naitahu or uh, one of the submitters that we've further submitted on. So there is a full involvement by those groups, um, and some, in fact, have had uh, more involvement than the city itself in the original consultation. Indeed. And in part, this preserves our position by submitting into what is a regulatory yeah. process, but then we will, we will talk and find out whether there are areas of similarity, and, and there might be areas where we do disagree and then, yeah, but, but it, uh, yeah. And if I might, that, that language of oppose or support is set out in the Act and it does seem very adversarial and, and often it's just an ability to be part of the conversation about what the outcome might be. And that's correct, we, because we only had a choice of opposing yeah. or not, or being, or supporting, yeah. and so that was the wording, so we had to choose oppose, unfortunately. But, but it would be, it would be, reasonably likely that there would be opportunities for finding consensus through mediation as part of this. Yeah. 
Thanks. Councillor Reddick. Uh, the discussion point 16A, reverse sensitivity. Now, I presume that's referring to the Waka Katahi's um, original submission, but can you explain what is meant by that? So, so reverse sensitivity is a, is a planning term. Um, it typically means that where someone has lawfully established something and someone else comes along and then complains about them being there uh, originally. Uh, so instead of someone turning up and establishing close to something which has effects, something which is already lawfully established complains about something else that comes, on, comes along which is... Um, which is allowed as well. So it's um, yeah, it's a plan term. It's um, it of, it's often something which is managed through plans. For example, moving next to a railway line and then complaining about the noise that the yes. train makes yeah. would be considered reverse sensitivity effects. Those are good examples. Um. In reading through this um, and looking at, um, at what, we're, what we're talking about, and often in the case that we, we actually do agree, but um, we need that opportunity in emergency situations or situations um, where health and safety is concerned, we have to have, have the opportunity to, to um, act differently. Is, is, is that the intent? Because most of it, I think we agree with the intent but in health and safety and emergency situations, we na may not be able to. Would that be? I, I think I understand what you're asking. Um, yes, uh, I think in general, uh, things like discharges of, uh, to land of wastewater, um, our strong preference is for that to happen, but the way the terminology of, of avoid um, removes any flexibility for exceptional circumstances where it may be unavoidable or the outcome could be agreed by all parties and there may be a better outcome. It's been moved by Councillor Benson Pope. Is there a seconder? Seconded Councillor Law Fiesel. Thank you. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Uh, briefly, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think, first of all, I I should say on our behalf, um, thank you to the staff and Mr Freeland in particular. This is a complicated um, re response process as part of our original submission uh, and um, clearly the staff who have prepared this response have been involved for a very long time both through the development of the second generation plan and subsequent hearings with the protection of our position according to our policy. And I must say, and it's partly in response to um, Councillor Lofito's question, um, that the relationship uh, with Okaha is very positive. Uh, there are a lot of issues in here that present significant challenges for us, particularly around um, water, wastewater disposal and stormwater disposal that are ongoing matters for mediation in addition to what's in here. Um, but I'm confident in, in telling everyone that the relationship with iwi around those issues is extremely sensitive to their concerns, their overriding concerns about disposal uh, and contamination, uh, and our positions are not far apart, but the relationship is good. But this is part of a process which protects our interests and those of our ratepayers uh, in areas where we may contaminate, for example, unavoidably or accidentally, uh, and that's just the way the process works. Further speakers? Put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 13 has been withdrawn. I item 14 is the New Zealand Masters Games update. Mr Pickford and Ms Kiss. Dealer, welcome. Anything by way of opening? 
questions, councillors? <coughs> Thank you. I. Oh, yeah, yeah, got it. Councillor Wood? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the report. Uh, just a question around um, the cost analysis. Has there been any analysis of, if it does go ahead, the extra cost that will be incurred because of perhaps of COVID having to adhere to now that we're a bit clearer on the traffic light system? There hasn't actually been, because we're still waiting for um, industry specific guidelines on how we will run under the vaccine passport, and that um, it's not quite clear whether we will need additional um, resources or staff, but we are monitoring it very closely and hope to have those guidelines out within the next couple of weeks. Forgive me if I've um, just been un unable to pass this, but were we to support the motion uh, that's been foreshadowed here to proceed, and then the board makes their decision on the 16th of December whether or not to proceed, and then it doesn't happen. Uh, what would you anticipate the extent of the underwrite required of council to be? Yeah, we have done a, a um, analysis on that, and should the games be cancelled at this time, and that we're looking about a 43k underwrite from city council. What about at other times? Okay, that was another question we thought we'd get. Um, so if we do go ahead to the games and we go into a red traffic light system um, closer, as in you know the week before, we were looking at, I didn't have it here, we're looking about 160k um, underwrite to the City Council. So that's your worst case? That's the worst case scenario. scenario. Thank you, that's helpful. Uh, further questions? No, you're moving the recommendations, I presume, Councillor. It's been moved by Councillor Wiley. Is there a seconder? Seconded Councillor Elder. Thank you both. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just want to thank Vicky and her team at the Masters Games and trying to work through these challenging times and trying to put an event together. Um, together, we've actually been very focused on uh, at the Masters Games board trying to make sure that the a lot of items are, are held back or invested in until the latest moment. Um, and so a lot of what, for example, stage set up, venue set up, is all pending for the new year uh, before we push complete green to go. The one thing that uh, I will mention is, for example, the medals this year will not have 2022 printed on them. Um, nor the, um, any merchandise items or anything like that. So, because we've already had to enter all those agreements and bring those in. So should the games not proceed in 2022, a lot of things can be carried across to 2024. So I can um, basically let council know that the Masters Games Board are very focused on trying to run a very successful games in 2022, but should it not happen, they're making a lot of preemptive decisions to move it onward to 2024. Thank you, Councillor. If it does go ahead, that's a fine economic development opportunity for the local engraving businesses, who can then go back and add the year to all of the medals that people accumulate. Uh, further speakers? There are none. Uh, all those in favour? All those against? That is agreed. Item 15, Statement of Proposal for Consultation, Strath Tyre Key Vehicle and Pedestrian Routes, Earthquake Prone Buildings. Ms Austin and Mr Henderson are here to speak to the report. It's a great wave of regulatory enthusiasm on my left. Uh, anything, uh, anything from either of you? Take Questions? Mm. Councillor Laws? Councillor Barker. Thank you, Wisha. I just have one question around paragraph 23 around consultation, which notes that it will be website, targeted emails, etc. And I just wonder, given it's um, a little bit in the countryside, about whether looking at using the local notice board or something has been addressed as well. I don't know what Gigatown extends to Middlemarch. We'll, we'll take all measures to make sure we reach people. Yep. Further questions? Thank you. 
questions? It's been moved by Councillor Benson Pope, seconded Councillor Lord. Would you like to speak to it? Further speakers? If there are none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against? That is agreed. Item 17, Regulatory Subcommittee. Rec oh, sorry. Uh, item 16, thank you. Uh, hearing Committee recommendations on the review of the Truby King Recreation Reserve Management Plan. Councillor Benson Pope will speak to the recommendations of the hearings panel, Mr. Pickford and Miss and and Mr. Brinkley, who's been called out by our more recent efficiency, uh, but is on his way. Do you do you want to field any questions that might exist and leave any that you can't until he gets here? Okay. Nothing that you wanted to add, Mr Pickford? Questions of staff? Councillor O'Malley. Um, Mr Brinkley is probably going to have the answer to it though. This is a large body of work, isn't it? Um, there's quite a number of these plans. Do you know where we are in the process? Through the Chair, this is the first of um, several plans to come through. So this is the, the template, if you wish. Um, so there'll be a number of these coming through. Uh, but Mr Brinkley can answer that probably more, uh, more directly than I can. Anyone want to say We don't have to wait for the answer. <laughs> uh, Councillor Barker. Thank you, Risha. I just want to ask a tree question. Um, I don't know if you can answer that. Um, on page 219, it has about trees identified as having historical significance that are to be retained in when necessary to be replaced with specimens of, this, of the same species as those initially grown. And I wondered whether it was looked at to actually revert back to native bush. I know that it's looking at the heritage asset, but I also wondered whether that other option was looked at as well. Um, it's basically uh, with Truby King, there's such a significance with the garden space. And so uh, with this, this is something that came from a previous reserve management plan. The idea is that trying to preserve as much of the historic plantings from Truby King as possible, and so that's why that is there. So other parts of the reserve may be sort of more preference for bush planting or native planting, but those ones um, where he was actually involved in the planting uh, should be retained. And before you arrived, uh, there was a question about where we are at with the wider reserve management plan programme. Um, we've got a schedule, we've got 21 uh, reserve management plans under review. This is the first. Um, Signal Hill and the general policies, uh, we've done the first part of those, which is getting feedback on the existing plans. We're in the process of drafting those new plans and we've got, uh, got them lined up at six month intervals to um, try and get through the backlog. And general policies is the one that catches anyone that doesn't have a specific plan. That's right. Yeah, it's it's basically it's rules and regulations. I'm not aware of <laughs> rules and regulations for everything, which is kind of the base document. And then specific reserve management plans take precedence in certain cases where they have special requirements. Thanks. Does that answer your question, Councillor? Further questions, Councillor Hulan. It's yeah. It's it's something a name that um, locals uh, have preferred. It's another one of the Truby King um, planted areas, and it, it does tend to have a lot of canopy species in there. Um, and so it's more of your sort of part of the reserve that's quite densely planted, and so it's just got that name over time. Yeah. And um, what sort of um uh, is there going to be any memorial in this reserve? I think I've asked this before, but I'm just wondering, I didn't see it, for the um, people who died. Yeah, one of, the, one of the aspects of this reserve management plan is it's been working really closely with Heritage New Zealand. And part of the, uh, one of the recommendations is that we do an interpretation plan. Yes. And we're going to be following, we're working a lot more close with, uh, closely with Heritage New Zealand. And so... Certainly interpretation, uh, whether that takes the form of a monument, we'll have to take their advice on that, but there will certainly be a lot more information about what happened. Have you had any consultation with family of the people who, who burned in the fire? 
Um, there's been a couple of submissions came in from relatives. Yes. Mm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Are you Could moving the recommendations? Yeah. Been moved by Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, is there a seconder? Second, by Councillor Walker. Briefly, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think this has been, I, I've found this a very positive process. Uh, I think the staff, again, need to be complimented. I think it's an excellent document, what's finally been produced, and you've, I think in the papers you've got both versions. Um, the process involved a hearing panel um, which included two representatives, one from uh, Hurupa and one from the community board. And, uh, after submissions, as you heard Mr Brinkley say, uh, some of which were from uh, relatives of those who died in the fire, but also from mostly the local community, but other, others from um, botanists and others of international repute. Um, after that, the concerns that were raised in the hearing were all referred to staff for inclusion. Uh, and all were included, uh, and that f second document, which you now have before you, was circulated to all submitters for their further information, and there was no further response. Um, the um, the significant, most significant changes or inclusions in the document, I think, relate to uh, more interpretive material about what happened there and what was where. It, you've heard me say before in this environment that it's actually an extraordinary gem in our city, this reserve, which um, is a recreation reserve in terms of its gazettal at the moment. There was some debate that hasn't been traversed publicly in the report about whether it shouldn't be an historic reserve, but that is not precluded by the classification formally currently as a recreation reserve. And the major changes or improvements are to the maintenance levels, uh, the maintenance of tracks, the signage I talked about, um, including identifying the Janet Frame tree, a magnolia, I think, but unless you happen to know and have a map that says it's a Janet Frame tree, you wouldn't know, uh, and other important um, species that are around the place, not the least of which, of course, the issues around the building and the history of the building, uh, Truby King himself, Miss Dr Truby King himself, uh, and the treatment fashions of the time and what happened to the building, which, of course, was destroyed by, mostly by land movement on our sliding coastal hills. The tennis court... Car parking have also been addressed, and you've probably read most of it yourself, but I would um, commend to you all a visit. Um, the vistas um, to the coast are stunning, um, but it's hard to visit um, the reserve without thinking about what happened there and that incredible building that you see that is no more. Um, yes, so... I think in terms of the process with staff, I think it was a very good example of a good cooperative process that I hope we can um, replicate with the other plans as they proceed. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Yes, I, I would like to see this area um, certainly acknowledged in a significant way by our city because um, of the significance of Janet Frame and her you know, obviously her time there, and that influenced a lot of her really um, poignant work that she's done in, in her books, and of course later portrayed in the film. And that's, and, and I mean, you know, debatably, Janet Frame is one of New Zealand's best writers, and, and she obviously um, spent a lot of time in Dunedin. I also think, and I've got a conflict of interest as to why I think this, because my great-grandmother burnt to death in the fire, um, and I wrote a play on it, and so researched that quite a bit. But during that time, the some 
when the play came out, a few of the family members from some of those victims came forward and spoke to me and they all talked about how they'd never discussed this before and it was a, a really big thing for them because of the stigma of mental health. And uh, what also became very uh, relevant was that um, a lot of those people who died were never acknowledged because it was wartime and because of the way they died and where they died, their, the acknowledgement of their lives and of them was um, hidden under the carpet, a lot of people say. So I would like to spend the rest of my time reading out the people to acknowledge their death. Um, Frida Aldis, Rita Alexandra, Christina Black, Marjorie Blakely, Helen Brown, Agnes Cross, Frances Cummings, Marion Donaldson, Annie Douglas, Violet Fowler, Elizabeth Gibson, Margaret Corden, Grace Harrison, Edna Law, Violet Lyons, Jane Manley, Isabella Macquarie, Ivy McSwain, Edith Montgomery, Anna Moore, Sarah Morris, Matilda O'Brien, Fanny Osborne, Alice Owens, Margaret Perry, Alice Sinclair, Mary Stewart, Mavis Stott, Rachel Sutton, Agnes Tapp, <coughs> Margaret Thompson, Margaret Thorne, Eileen Warring, Emily White, Catherine Wilson, Mary Wilson, and Frances Winslade. And may they be remembered in this reserve. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor O'Malley. Um, actually, I'll just pass, I think, and just respect for the, those who died at the fire. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That is agreed. Item 17, Regulatory Subcommittee Recommendations on the Proposed Parking Changes. Uh, October 2021, um, with the, the amendment that has been foreshadowed uh, around the octagon. Are there questions of staff? Councillor Benavis. I keep having as a theme coming up people who've been to Australia and seen the reverse angle parking work very well there. I note there's some uh, angle parking involved here as well, but um, it has been suggested for a few years now that if people were to back into an angle park when they drive out, that is say you, you do the angle parks the other way, when they drive out they can see everything and there's much less risk of someone backing out and causing an accident. Um, the other nice thing about backing into a park is quite often, especially if you've got a, a, a ute with a long tail on it, you get all the way down to the gutter and then you stop so you're not right, right out into the street. I'm thinking particularly of streets like um, a Royal uh, Terrace. You could bring the instance. question to a point yeah. sooner rather than later, Councillor. Oh, pardon me, sorry. <laughs> um, my, my question really is, is there any possibility that we could at least trial the Australian model which has proven to work very well, be safer, and make people more confident about angle parking? Um, we can certainly look at it, Councillor. I could talk for days about uh, reverse parking. Um, just not today. No, no just not <laughs> today. Um, it, it, it certainly is mandated um, across a lot of the workforce. Um, you'll find Downer, Faulties, all reverse park. Yep. Um, it is proven to be safer. And if we were to make the angles the other way, it would be a lot easier for people to do as well. Yep. Great, thank you. I mean, do we, is it within the scope of our powers as a territorial authority to mandate that? You can, uh, a workplace can mandate it. Right. Um, but potentially I don't think we could, but yeah, definitely in a workplace you can mandate it. Oh, I meant in terms of I mean in terms of backing. Oh, anyway, further questions of staff. 
There are none. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wiley is uh, going to speak to his, his subcommittee's recommendations in due course. Is there a second for them? Seconded. Councillor Elder. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Yep. So pretty much as the paper um, says, with the amendment, um, thanks to um, Councillor Barker, who picked up with a steely eye. Um, <laughs> And we're actually surprised it sort of slipped through because the intention was was the five minute parking being retained from six p six p m through to eleven p m but the original intention uh, came through from a request from the police and around safety in the octagon um, The one thing I do want to highlight was um, in the executive summary point three was around port Chalmers and around the bus stop there, there uh, we are. We did do a site visit last Tuesday. We're working with the Peninsula, uh, with the um, West Harbour Community Board around that issue. Um, and trust me, it's not as easy as you think once you go there and have a look. Um, so, but beyond that, again, thank you to um, Councillor Walker and Councillor O'Malley with helping me with this uh, committee. Thank you. I guess some of these are certainly more straightforward than others, angled or otherwise. Further speakers? Being none, I will put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Item 18, Ms Graham will speak to proposed event road closures for December 2021 and January and February 2022. And we have Ms Benson back. Are there any? I have a question, yep. uh, and it's sort of related to the questions I got asked around the Masters Games. But were we to resolve to close the road for these purposes, uh, and then the events for which we have closed them don't happen, um, do we? What, what are the options from there? Because the closure has to be assigned to a particular purpose. It couldn't be used for another purpose in that same space. That's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and the events team are working through um, the traffic light system at the moment. Yeah. Who would who would be? Yeah. Anyway, Councillor Reddick. Just a small question about the veteran car display in the octagon. Is that otherwise known as the Brighton Run? Colloquially, yes. Yeah. Was previously associated with Festival Week. Going back, going back a ways now, Councillor. Started by Jim Barnes, I understand. Uh, further questions? None. It's been moved by Councillor Van. It was seconded by Councillor Houlihan. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Further speakers? Being none, I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That is agreed. Item 19, submission on the local government. Uh, open brackets, pecuniary interests register, close brackets, amendment bill. Ms Sullivan. Just happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Uh, I'll allow people time to find it. It's on page 247 of, your, of the substantive uh, agenda. Questions? Councillor Barker. Thank you, Your Worship. Kia ora. I have a question around that this is a submission from the basically the Society of Local Government Managers and councillors would belong to the Local Government New Zealand. So was the local, did the Local Government New Zealand put a submission forward? They are in the process of putting a submission forward. It support, their submission supports both the Taituata submission and also the submission from the Controller and Auditor General, which I circulated to councillors earlier this morning. Thank you. Just a slight distinction, councillors aren't members of local government New Zealand. Council as an organisation is a member of LGNZ and is also a member of Tai uh, uh, At least that's my... Individual staff. Oh, individual staff. So, uh, yeah, individual staff are managers of Tai Tuara. Uh, uh, further questions? Sorry, Councillor Van On page 248 it talks about that community boards and members appointed to council committees be included within coverage of the bill. Is that intended to be community board members? Yes, correct. And 
Is there a, much of a bureaucratic cost involved, given that um, you know the, the, the kinds of money they're dealing with are quite small potatoes, sort of the, the Jersey bennies, really, aren't they? Well, we currently include all community boards have a, a risk um, the same conflict of interest register that you, um, councillors have, have on their agenda, um, the boards also. Remembering this is government legislation and our community board delegations could change at any point, so this is ensuring that, say for example, they had greater delegations that we then had good process in place that would would capture any pecuniary interests. Right. Is there is there a significant cost though to doing all the associated paperwork or is it all pretty much in train anyway? It's pretty much in train. Um, we, we are well experienced. We have probably a councillor who has the most LAMIA applications in the country potentially. Thank you. <laughs> any further questions? So I'd like to move the recommendations. Moved by Councillor Staines. Is there a second? Seconded Councillor Elder. Would you like to speak to it? Councillor. Further speakers? Councillor O'Malley. I just can't wait to get to my next community board meeting and call everybody a pack of Jersey bins. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everything sounds better in a Scottish brogue. Further speakers, there are none, nothing in response to that, I don't imagine. Uh, I will put it, all those in favour? Aye. Those against? Uh, that is agreed. Uh, item 20, appointments to outside organisation. Well, welcome back. <laughs> Are there questions of uh, the report's authors? Councillor Walker. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just a couple, and probably uh, Councillor Wiley can probably answer them. I'm just interested to know who's, who's currently on the Dunedin Masters Games Board and who are the other two people on the National Board? Uh, the other two on the National Board are John Brimble, CEO of Sport Otago, and Julie Ryan, who is uh, essentially a marketing specialist on the board. The Dunedin board, oh no, you're texting me. Um, so those two plus, oh, Nathan. Yeah, okay. And, um, I'll send you a copy of the minutes. Paula Hallier. Mm. Recently appointed by council, uh, I wish I would remind us all. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Van der Vis. Yep, yep. And seconded by Councillor Walker, would you like to speak to it, Councillor? Further speakers? Councillor Raddock is warming up. No? There are no speakers. I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That is agreed. There was a, an item 21, I presume, at some point. Which no longer. Oh! Ah, oh, I see, 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 see. Got it, got it. Yeah. I was just trying to manage my. Just managing my chair's agenda. My apologies. Uh, item uh, 22 is a covering uh, report. And I'm happy to move that we note the advice provided as, as outlined here. Second. Councillor Lord, I've got a question from Councillor O'Malley. It's just specifically to um, what would change based on the first motion going through to the second motion? No. Depends, um, because until the motion is, the first motion is moved and seconded, it could take any form with the leave of the meeting. And so we, we can't predetermine that in the advance of the meeting. So, so that we're entirely dependent on what council, and they, depending on something may lose or not, and then we'd need to, in parts, and then we would need to assess whether there was a pre-existing council position where, that your notice of motion was then in contravention of. The noting of the advice has been 
uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Walker. Oh, sorry, Councillor Lord. My apologies. Anyone wish to speak to us? I'll put it. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? That's agreed. Uh, item 23, uh, notice of, notices of motion, and I will move uh, the proposed uh, as, as set out here. Is there a seconder for the motion? Seconder, Councillor Lofiso. Uh, thank you. Uh, it seemed, uh, it seemed um, a salient to bring this discussion back to the council table, given that uh, we haven't had the opportunity to have this debate subsequent to the decisions that have been taken by Cabinet. Uh, that participation in, the, in their Three Waters Reform Program uh, will no longer be an option. Uh, for territorial authorities, uh, and uh, and in fact, uh, it has uh, they have decided it has been uh, it is to be made mandatory, uh, and that is uh, incredibly disappointing uh, to those of us uh, who have been engaging in this process, um, both uh, at an officer level and at an elected member level uh, over a considerable period of time, um, in good faith, and. It is, we were always told, uh, well, three things. One, uh, that government would lead on uh, an education uh, effort uh, to inform uh, the wider electorate. Uh, we were told that it would be a genuine choice for local authorities to make, uh, and we were told that, uh, council, uh, that our communities would be able to participate in that process in advance of, uh, of us making that decision. Uh, and by making it mandatory, uh, those, uh, those last two points have become moot, uh, and I think that is uh, disappointing, uh, and, and I think it is right for us uh, to express our disappointment uh, in, that, uh, in that decision. Uh, and I, but I have, I mean, I've also said previously that uh, the nature of the discourse, uh, so far as it existed, um, does mean that it is understandable uh, that government have chosen to take that course of action. And I don't think uh, our local government colleagues are free of all responsibility for getting us to a position where uh, the, the, those decisions uh, were taken. Uh, and, and indeed, it's, uh, I think it's, um, doesn't, it's not too long a bow to draw, actually, that uh, the intention of government was indeed to announce that they were making it mandatory at the local government New Zealand conference, uh, and they chose uh, not to do that. Uh, courtesy of the, the, the uh, negotiating effort of local government New Zealand and others who, who ensured that there was uh, an eight-week window provided to local councils to be able to provide feedback on the model as it was proposed. Uh, and I think what's, it's important to make the distinction here between the decision that government has taken around mandatory participation in the water reform program uh, and the proposed model. Uh, the only decisions uh, that have been, the only thing we know for sure around uh, what the decisions that they've made are that uh, it will be mandatory and there will be uh, four entities. Uh, a lot of the other uh, specifics around the system design are still to be worked through and, and a number of groups have been uh, set up with uh, representation from uh, local government and the first of those is specifically around governance arrangements uh, and how we can influence uh, a greater degree of, of control over these entities and, uh, and it's, it's useful for us uh, here in, uh, at this end of the country uh, to have uh, representation from Otago on that working group uh, through Tim uh, Cadogan, the Mayor of uh, of Central Otago. Subsequently, there will be another one set up around managing the challenges around rural water schemes uh, and another one on uh, how this reform program interacts with the resource management uh, reform work, uh, which is uh, something that I think we all uh, should be uh, concerned about. Uh, but none of those issues have been resolved uh, and, and uh, the opportunity remains for there to be uh, a degree of, of influence, uh, which isn't to say that we will all get either individually as councils or collectively as a sector, everything that we want uh, out of those. But it does mean that the, the window remains open for us to try and influence the outcome uh, to, the benefit of, um, to the benefit of our communities and our, uh, and our country as a whole. Uh, given the toxic nature of some of the discourse, I feel like it's important to include B. 
uh, that we reaffirm our desire as expressed in our uh, submission uh, to the uh, initial proposal uh, to see an enduring role for iwi Māori in the governance uh, of Three Waters service delivery. Uh, and that is certainly something that Naita, who have a particular interest in, uh, and they have done a considerable amount of work uh, on trying to, again, uh, shape the proposals of government in a way that uh, better serves uh, not only their, their people, but those of us uh, here uh, in the Naitahu Takiwa, which is uh, to be set up as, uh, as Entity D. And I don't think, uh, given the decisions that we have made as a council around ensuring that we have um, a stronger mana whenua voice in our debates and our process, that, that, sh that should remain uncontroversial. Uh, and, and while we have been, our community has been denied the opportunity to uh, participate in a decision that we would take, because that decision has been taken away from us, I think there absolutely needs to be a, a, a there is a, absolutely a critical role for this authority in making sure that our community have the option uh, and and the understanding. Uh, and the opportunity to pa participate in the relevant select committee processes. There will be uh, high-level legislation, we understand, introduced uh, this side of Christmas uh, and more detailed um, uh, legislation uh, in the new year. And it is important that the, the genuine concerns that both this council has and our community more widely have uh, are expressed through those uh, processes uh, and, uh, and participate in them. And D, uh, really uh, comes to the crux of the current uh, debate that is running within local government and the wider local government sector. Uh, and and you, when you speak to uh, those councils, mayors, uh, who have expressed uh, loudly uh, their discontent and disquiet about the proposed reforms, uh, there isn't a huge degree of difference uh, in terms of what their concerns are and what our concerns are. Uh, we are not poles apart in terms of where we see the issues and where we see the needs in terms of resolving some of those issues. The fundamental difference uh, between, uh, between the two groups, uh, to, to, to put it that way, is that one see a desire uh, to work constructively through them, through the opportunities that remain, uh, and others uh, seek to um, work combatively uh, against government uh, in terms of trying to uh, influence their decision making. Uh, and my view is that uh, we are better off uh, in general, but certainly in this instance, uh, to work constructively to get the best outcome possible. That is, I think, in the best interests of our community uh, as opposed to uh, fighting government and denying the political reality uh, of the situation that we currently face and that we have a, 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 an elected um, uh, government with a majority in parliament who can pass any legislation uh, that they like uh, and have shown uh, no interest in response to the more combative elements within local government uh, to, to, change, uh, to change that approach. Uh, and I think that is um, unfortunately where we are at. Uh, and and you know the easiest thing uh, in the world is, is to take a combative approach uh, in response to the the decisions of government. Um, the 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 better outcome for our communities, though, I think, uh, and the the obligation we have to best serve our communities uh, is is better um, resolved through. Uh, working through whatever avenues that we may have, and, and that will be potentially working with other councils, working within local government New Zealand, uh, working with uh, NITA, who, who obviously have a keen interest in, in uh, an entity D, uh, where council will sit, uh, and through the, through the select committee uh, processes. Um, it, it's been disappointing that the debate has gotten as ugly uh, as it has, particularly the way that it has been directed at the Minister for Local Government uh, and, and, through, and to our Prime Minister, actually, and we, we all saw around the country further examples of that uh, over this past uh, weekend. Uh, and I think um, we do ourselves no favours by aligning ourselves with, um, with those uh, activists uh, in this sense. Uh, and uh, and that is um, 
So this is where I think uh, we can find the the best outcome uh, for the city. Is it the perfect outcome? No. And would I prefer for us to have been left with the option of being able to make the decisions for ourselves? Uh, absolutely. But given where we find ourselves in, and given the 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 control that the Labour government have over the Parliament, uh, I can't see uh, what an alternative uh, path, uh, a realistic alternative path is for us uh, at this point. Councillor Vanivis. No trouble at all with A. The eloquent expression of disappointment um, by Mayor Hawkins is appreciated, and I think it's actually fundamental to the real issue here. Uh, who ends up running it, uh, less of an issue than us. In fact, the whole country showing almost unprecedented panoramic opposition and the government just bowling it through anyway. What concerns me about B, C and D is the assumption that this Labour government is going to be the government at the next election and the assumption that, um, as Mayor Hawkins said, the easiest thing in the world is to take a combative approach to the government. <clears throat> if you ask anybody that's not yet vaccinated whether it's the easiest thing in the world, uh, I think you'll get a quite different view. The fact is that we have a government intent on forcing through the biggest takeover of council-created infrastructure in the country's history. And they are going to do it by force for no good reason other than that they can. The fact that the national government, if they become the government next time, uh, with the help of uh, Seymour and co, uh, have promised to tip this out I think is something which we should consider in regard to these recommendations and the exceptionally long speech by our Mayor promoting all of these things made no mention of that possibility. In fact, the way things are going, I think it's quite a probability. Uh, Councillor, I'm, I'm disappointed that I'm holding you up from something, but uh, the speech that I gave in speaking to the motion uh, wasn't overly lengthy. You may not have thought so, Your Worship, but that's how it appeared to me, and it's my opinion I'm giving. B, C and D all assume that this is absolutely going ahead. It also assumes that these massive changes can be made within the current government term, uh, which I don't believe is possible either. Uh, these legislative changes may be able to be made within that time. Uh, but in terms of actual change on the ground, I very much doubt that this can happen inside years. And I also very much doubt that it's going to happen because the vast majority of councils and councillors up and down the country have already voted uh, against uh, joining. Christchurch, every single councillor spoke out against it. Uh, Timaru have unanimously voted against. Up and down the country, I think 60 out of 67 councils have said, no, we don't want a bar of this. This motion in front of us, B, C and D, assumes that it is going to go ahead and that it's going to continue to go ahead. And I don't think those assumptions are valid and I don't think we should be voting on that basis. So I'm asking that we take A separately, very happy to vote for that. That sends a message we need to send to government. Um, but I will be voting against the rest because they assume something which I don't believe is the case. Councillor Houlihan. Yes, I'm, what people won't be able to see here um, who aren't in this meeting is that we have two motions here, one by the Chair of Infrastructure and one by the Mayor. I'm very disappointed that, you know, it seems to me that why couldn't, I don't know why the Mayor couldn't work with the Infrastructure Chair to write one motion. It does seem unreasonable when the Chair of Infrastructure, this Three Waters comes under infrastructure. 
It should be something under his delegation, and I don't understand why this has happened, apart from perhaps politicking. But um, we are politicians, so I suppose that's fair enough. What I will say about this motion is, and I've been saying for ages, that why aren't we making an issue around this mandating? We live in a democracy. This is not democratic behaviour to just tell people when 60 councils out of 67 said they didn't like it, and the, count, the government has just said we mandate it. I've tried to raise this issue before, and the mayor pretty much tried to shut me down. So, um, Sorry, you know. Sorry, Councillor, can you, uh, can you remind us when that was? Well, I can't remember the date, but when I said it, you, your comments were at the time. I wasn't going to say anything, but I will now, and then you went on to proceed to talk about Three Waters and how we need to not be com Sorry, combative. Which, I'm, I'm curious as to which point you're, Sorry, you're alleging uh, I shut do you, you have down. A, do you have a, a point of order no, that you're calling? I'm chairing the meeting, Councillor. But are you, where's the point of order to interrupt me while I'm speaking? You went on and on, and now you're interrupting my speech. So you can't point to an example where I shut you down over the debate. Yes. You shut the whole meeting down when question time didn't oh, go counsel. your way, your, your honour. Yeah. I'm not a judge. Uh, well, uh, you can, get, you can car carry on, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. That's very kind. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I won't be supporting this motion. Thank you. Fine. Further speakers? Councillor O'Malley. Your Worship. Um, if you've read both notices of motion, you'll see that there's a fair amount of commonality between them. Um, I would point out that I had foreshadowed at the end of the Infrastructure Services Committee that I intended to put a notice of motion up. And I apologise to everybody that I didn't have a chance to communicate with others before I put mine up. I put it up on the Monday, on the last day. Um, I was surprised to find then, to be informed that another notice of motion had gone up. Um, because I had not been approached by anybody. And so I, I would ask you to please vote this motion down because I believe that the next ones coming through have more assertive position from the council. And I look at part A on this one, expresses disappointment. I feel that we need to be more affirmative in our position than just say that we're disappointed. And it is not necessarily a done deal yet that these four water entities are going to go and form in the form that they are. If you look at my notice of motion, it starts out with an agreement of, of a, an important role for iwi, and it, and it starts out with an agreement for reform and formation of a national regulator. And in fact, that component in that notice of motion, and I know I'm speaking to the next one, but this one directly affects it, um, was a, was a consequence of talking to the local Labour MPs when I asked them what is the chance that we can get to the government and ask the government to please slow down. Not on, not on the first part of reform, that's almost all through as law now, but the second part of reform. Because it has in many respects many of the aspects of neoliberalism in it. And, and it looks like electricity reform with a number of, just a couple of twists to it. So I think we need to be much more assertive in our opposition than just merely expressing our disappointment. The next component, part B, is I've, it's reproduced in another set of words in mind. Um, and I really doubt that we can actually work constructively with the government that told us that they were waiting on our feedback, and yet the Cabinet papers arrived within a day of our feedback for them to make a decision. The, the, there's legislation going through now to set up the transition teams. That stuff had to have been written before our feedback came back. So there was no real attempt, in my opinion, there's definite process evidence to suggest there was no attempt to constructively work with us. So why would we believe it's going to be constructive going forward? So I would ask you to vote this down, not because it's completely different from mine, but I feel that mine actually has a little bit more assertiveness to it and I think gets closer to it and, and really the second part of mine affirms an actual council position. We have yet to take a position and I think that if we do not take a position we in this motion effectively acknowledge and agree to the disposition of our assets when moved into the four water entities because there's nothing here to say that that wouldn't happen. So I'm voting against this. Through the speakers. Councillor Barker. 
Thank you, Worship. Um, Councillor O'Malley did signal that he was going to put a notice of motion forward at the infrastructure services. So while I agree with the, the sentiment of the Mayor's um, recommendations, I will be voting against this and I will be supporting the notice of motion from Councillor O'Malley. I gave an angry speech a, a few months ago that covered my points about how I felt the government had treated local councils and our communities. And I'm angry, I'm not disappointed, I'm angry. Further speakers? Councillor Staines. I could support either of these notices of motion, to be perfectly honest. I, I do think that it's more than disappointment. We were, a promise was made. That promise was not delivered. And I remember in the local government conference when the minister spoke to the elected members present, and one of them asked the question, is it still going to be an option for councils to not take part? And her reply was, it is uh, well past that time. And that triggered to me that already the thinking was that it would, would not be optionable. And so I... While I see, I don't actually have a problem with the water entities. I have a problem with the way a promise was made and not delivered on. And so I, as I say, I, c I could support either of these notices of motion. Um, I would prefer that it was significant disappointment rather than just disappointment. It is significant. It's significant in that what was the rule of engagement from the very beginning was, in the end, pulled out from underneath us. Councillor Reddick. Yes, I'm afraid I feel that this uh, notice of motion is insufficient for our needs. It's insufficient for the needs of the community <clears throat> And contrary to their desires, because I've certainly been subjected to, as have we all, uh, many in the community are very angry about this um, whole water reform, but in particular some certain elements of it. And just to express disappointment, uh, it does not carry the weight of um, feeling that the community has expressed. And similarly, for us around the table, uh, it's a very significant thing for this whole exchange of assets and who's going to own them and who's going to administer them and so on when we've spent many decades building them up. This notice of motion is simply an endorsement of the government position with a little bit of disappointment expressed and it leaves us at their mercy um, and they have shown not to have any because there was certainly a, 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 um, a promise of consultation and free choice and an ability to opt out, and yet uh, that has been changed, overturned, and now mandated that we must be part of it. So this uh, notice of motion is an approval of the themes of the water reform and delegate, relegates the community to having to go through a select committee process to make any form of protest or put up any kind of submission. So that's quite a long way removed from the normal avenues of, um, of participation in government and in local government, and we have had lots of um, uh, interaction with our community over the last year, and so they're certainly very... Many people, a great many people are very disappointed to miss out on that. And I think it's, uh, so this motion is not in the best interests of the city, in my opinion. And I think it's, um, I think it's quite contradictory of the mayor to characterize those who disagree with the water reforms as unpleasant activists, whereas earlier today, he endorsed the activism of those um, people protesting climate change who he says beat the door down of this chamber. So, you know, which it's just a, a simple matter of which form of activism you endorse or otherwise, I think the wider community 
uh, should have their voices heard and should have their uh, feedback to government heard properly rather than you know, a mandate that has been imposed upon us. So I think, hence, I feel that this notice of motion is insufficient for our needs as a community. Thank so you. I should be voting against. Councillor, the, the activists I was referring to specifically were the brazen racism uh, and misogyny, not the concerns that have been raised more generally with the reform program. Uh, I believe it was Councillor Benson Buckle, Councillor Walker, who talked about doors being beaten down by climate activists earlier, not myself. Councillor Walker. Um, yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and I'll come back to the motion in a moment, but um, I think I better speak to this because, as I found out last time, saying saying nothing can be can be completely misconstrued and even dip into party political um, accusations. Um, I, and I agree with um, Councillor Romali. Actually, I, I think there's there's quite a lot of commonality uh, between these two motions. Um, and I don't, I, you know, I'm not really sure yet which direction we're going to go, but I'm pretty uncomfortable with one part of, of, this, of the next motion. Um, I'll start with the expressing uh, disappointment. I'm really happy to, for us to do that, um, to express disappointment to the government, uh, <laughs> to make it mandatory, and I'll speak about it personally. Um, am I disappointed? Yeah, I'm livid, actually. Um, we were made a promise many times to opt in or opt out. We were told that to our face by uh, the minister, um, and that was taken away. We were told that in good faith. And I don't know about anybody else around this table, but I wouldn't look any of you in the eye and make you those sort of promises and then tell you, after had, like all of us, had to read hundreds, even thousands of pages to, make, to, to inform my ultimate decision in opting in and op opting out. And we were told we, that option was taken away. That's, that's low. And, and, and just so you know, with... Yes, do I have Labour connections? Yes, I was elected on the ticket. Have I passed on what I've just said to you to the Labour MPs in Dunedin? I have. They've been left in little doubt how I feel. So, that, does that clear that up? That's where I stand. Um, I also just want to skip on to the, the fourth part here, and I think that's a really important part. And I, and I say it just because it's the way I operate in, in, in my life, and I've probably learnt, like all of us from experience, how we get things and how we don't get things. And I think it's really important at this juncture for us to work constructively. For me, that's a no-brainer. I think if, 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 if we continue to be combative and more combative and let things get uglier and uglier, we're not going to get much out of this. We're not going to get the best for our community. Um, so I would really... <coughs> urge whatever motion we support that that is is central to the way we act going forward and i don't think it's good enough to say we've been treated badly to this stage so let's let's get down and dirty into that ditch i think i think we we show show more class by working constructively in the context of the government in terms of mandating this not not behaving constructively and fairly um yeah, I mean, it, I don't know if it's unique around this table that uh, notes of motions have, have, have come on the same two mo motions on the same thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, f finding it finding it difficult where to go. I mean, I'm, I'm probably happy to support this in the context of the fact that we'll be moving on to the, to, to the second second one anyway. So, um, but I just wanted to make it very clear after the, the previous meeting where I stupidly said nothing. I'll, Rest assured, I won't be doing that again on anything. Um, where where I stand and how disappointed I feel about the government now mandating this upon us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lord. Um, yeah, look, I I uh, I struggle with this a wee bit, but I'm going to support it. Um, one of the things that I find interesting is Councillor O'Malley has said this doesn't go far enough. Well. I'll just reiterate that first line, express its disappointment in the decision to make participation in the Three Waters program mandatory. Now when I look at the second one, uh, which is the next page, I see nowhere at all where it um, shows, and you were saying you've gone much stronger, well I see nowhere at all where it says anything that is disappointed. The only thing in B it says in part two, we're disappointed the government appears to have given little consideration to alternative models. Well it's actually true. but. 
Um, there's, there's no disappointment in that that I see whatsoever to the fact that it's been taken out of our hands. And so that's why for me this uh, first motion, at least it does express that disappointment. So something either I'm not reading it right or I've missed something. But support this one. OK. Further speakers? Councillor Lofisor. Um, Tēnāko, Your Worship. I am going to be supporting this, and um, there are parts of the second motion that I support as well, but um, I... I uh, the reason that I am going to be supporting this is... Uh, it, it really, for me, the really big parts are going to be C and D, and that's really um, actively promoting community participation. So I, I you know, look, glanced at those 600 and nearly 700 emails that we got, and yeah, and I think that's great that people wanted to express their um, opinions and their perspectives. I was concerned that it has had parts of the debate had turned it into anti Māori, um, statements and stances um, and I would just um, hope that we can try because to me it is a fait accompli like, like from what I hear the government is determined to pass bills into thing before Christmas which makes it resistance pretty futile so I think I'm very disappointed, as it says there. And, but I just hark back to that face-to-face -face meeting that we had downstairs. Um, and Dr. Temaire Ho, um, To, sorry, he said, this is going to happen, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And, and for a long time, tangata whenua have been saying about te mana o te wai, we need to be involved. Um, and I'm kind of disappointed, not only in the co-governance, but the implementation. I wish they were running the entities, um, but they're not. And so it really is a test of power sharing and faith and hope that we can use this example to actually genuinely share power with tangata whenua and mana whenua. Thank you. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Elder. I too am a bit conflicted. I agree with expressing, um, I would say, a bit stronger than dis disappointment. I would say it was, um, it was gut-wrenching to um, have um, central government not even um, paying any lip service to what local government has been asked to do and that is to enable democratic local decision making and action by and behalf of communities. They said they were intent but they did not follow up and um, I think as someone else said 600 submissions to us on our, on our um, council pages expressing that bitter disappointment that that wasn't followed through, so I can I can support A except I th I think it should be stronger, um, and I believe that both um, motions mention the um, support for um, iwi part participation um, and support. Um, I, I I believe that the second motion has um, some really good points, um, and I think. Um, when I think about South Dunedin and the discussion we had today about South Dunedin, and my concerns um, expressed are about local decision making on local issues, and I think we do need to consider a reset. I think we do need to consider a rejig, and I think we do need to confront um, central government about that, because not only is it South Dunedin's concern, it's mine as well. And I don't know how we do that, except to express that we feel like things need to change. And so I think 
in this one um, and, and, and Jim's one, that is expressed. Um, and I think we need to express it on behalf of our people. Um, definitely they've, they've mandated it, but we still need to express the opinions of our, our people, our communities, when it comes to um, meaningful engagement and local decision making, and I believe that's stronger in Jim's motion. So um, I'll leave it at that. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Your Worship. Just on that last point, it isn't actually, Councillor. Um, I, um, I find this an extraordinary situation, and I have to say I don't think there's ever been any doubt around the collective position of members of this council about this issue. Not all of us have screened it from the rooftops or uh, and made some of the extravagant claims that some have made, uh, but I, like the rest of you, have always been opposed to what has been suggested. I think the savings that have been mooted are illusory. I think the whole proposal was com is completely ill-founded. And if there'd been really an attempt only to properly regulate drinking water, for example, which was the stalking horse ex Havelock North that was used for development of this policy, then they could have used the rules that currently existed uh, and got the Ministry of Health on the job enforcing water standards. So I don't think anyone's ever had any issue around um, the capacity of government to require what they want. Uh, and as I say, I think the rest of it is probably undeliverable in terms, we know in terms of contractual issues, how difficult it's been to get work done that we've had planned for some years. And work of the magnitude, the billions of dollars of work of the magnitude suggested it's inconceivable that our con uh, contracting industry could be ramped up uh, at the speed we're talking about, even if the Ministry of Works was to be reinvented. Uh, what's more, uh, the, the, the reforms also will lead to, inevitably, uh, the uh, volumetric charging for water that I have always opposed, which has never been discussed by a community or supported by the Dunedin community. So all in all, I think it's a dog, uh, and I have conveyed that opinion consistently both to the local MPs and to some cabinet ministers with whom I served in the Clark government. So be under no doubt about that. I'm in the same boat as my colleague on my left who have been told off for not being vocal about it. Well, you've heard me on this once before, not as extensively as I'm speaking now. That said, um, they've made it very clear, um, even in the meeting downstairs when Minister Mahuta wouldn't answer the question about whether, if we all said no, it was going to be mandated. It was pretty obvious from that date what was going to happen. And in practical terms, like it or not, and in my case it's very much not, the Mayor's assessment is completely correct. It's happening. Um, and whatever we think of it, I think this is a much better way of making the best of it. Uh, it's hard to talk about this when we've had this strange debate around two notices of motion that are very, very similar. The thing that uh, turns me off completely about the second one is the delegation of an elected member to do an administrative operational role. I think that's way out of line. Uh, and the unfortunate thing about um, notices of motion is that once they're moved, they can't be changed. Um, so I will be supporting this. I think this is the sensible way to proceed. Uh, I do not believe, uh, I, I do not believe at all, much at all as people would like to be extremely disappointed or very disappointed or hugely disappointed. Um, the second motion is no more rabid than this one. I think this is an appropriate way to respond to government and try to work with them to protect as much as we can. Uh, the, the interests of our community. Councillor Wiley. Well, yes, it is a different scenario having two notices of motion and having to try and speak to one and talk about the other. But I think the key thing is 
that I've got out of this discussion today and, uh, and everybody's position on this motion is that we all oppose three waters reform by the government as it stands and the way they've gone about it. And I think that, I believe, is a very strong point uh, and I hope the one that ODT really leads with, with the fact that nobody around this table supports the government's three waters reform. And we all agree that community engagement is so. We all agree that more community engagement is important, but it's got to be meaningful engagement. And we've heard the stories about you know the meeting downstairs with Minister Mahuda, the meeting in Blenheim with the local government New Zealand. When I read this motion, to me it just plays to what they've done all the way through. There has to be a stronger position, some more forceful direction. And unfortunately, I want to see more leadership in this area. And that's what I really liked about the second motion. It gave me confidence that there was going to be more leadership. There was going to be more direct. Three Waters Reform Program needs to be reset. Government commits to meaningful engagement. Government has basically shut all councils out in this discussion. They've chosen to do what they want to do. And they're going to continue that steamroll on and on and on. They talk about the Scottish water model. It's not the Scottish water model. It's their water model. If they really want an effective water model and three waters for the country, then they would be engaging with all 67 councils. They wouldn't be talking about RMA reform at the same time. They wouldn't be talking about local government reform at the same time. They would be saying, let's focus on this and let's do it once and do it right. Or let's work with a, across Parliament. There's none of that. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to support this. What I'm sorry, I believe, is a soft motion. I would have liked to have seen more leadership, a stronger expression to, to government on this one. So um, I, would have, I look forward to voting on the second motion. Further speakers. There are none. Councillor Wiley has just said that everyone around the table opposes reform as it stands, and that's true. Uh, and that was entirely consistent with the feedback that we gave uh, on the proposal that government put out. Uh, also has suggested that nobody supports uh, Three Waters reform, and I don't think that is true. Uh, and it's certainly uh, that point isn't supported by the foreshadowed subsequent notice of motion, which uh, supports the objectives of the water reform program, uh, just how the model is um, being proposed to deliver on that. Uh, Councillor Elders said that things need to change. Nobody's arguing with that. Uh, but the idea that councils have been shut out of this process uh, is, is untrue. The, the, the work around the design uh, and implementation of the structure that has been made mandatory is ongoing uh, and there are plenty of opportunities uh, for local government to continue alongside um, uh, Iwi Māori to continue to influence uh, those decisions uh, as, uh, as that work progresses. Uh, I, f I find it um, odd the inference that uh, there is something underhanded in proposing a notice of motion and bringing it to this meeting to be able to be discussed by this meeting uh, as, as, the ch as the chair of, uh, of the meeting. And it, and it is um, it's an unusual situation to have two, um, uh, two notices of motion addressing a similar topic. Uh, I, I, I personally wasn't aware of that until uh, the day uh, that those closed, which is when the second one was uh, presented, at which point I offered uh, Councillor O'Malley uh, the opportunity to provide any proposed uh, amendments that he wanted to make uh, to mine, uh, and he didn't avail himself uh, of that opportunity, seeing them uh, as, um, as too distant. Uh, so that was certainly an opportunity that was provided, just not one uh, that was taken up. 
Uh, it's been said that 60 out of 67 councils uh, oppose this. Certainly at least 60 out of 67 councils gave feedback suggesting that how this would be implemented should be changed, uh, of which we were one of them. Uh, and to interpret uh, people providing constructive feedback on the proposal as blanket opposition uh, to the proposal in the Three Waters Reform Programme I think is, is a bridge too far. Uh, it's, been, it's been suggested that we should just wait this out uh, and, uh, and, and take, up, uh, take up the cudgels of the protest movement and wait for a change of government uh, in 2023, uh, which will be the death knell of the Three Water Reform Programme. Uh, I think the parliamentary opposition uh, to this is illusory. Uh, there's a re there was no meaningful uh, engagement and no meaningful parliamentary opposition, particularly from uh, the National Party, until very late in the piece uh, when it became obvious that they were hemorrhaging votes to the ACT Party uh, and needed to be seen uh, to be uh, <laughs> shoring up the base, uh, as it were, by, by becoming actively involved. And that's evidenced by the fact that they don't have any concrete proposals as alternatives, just that we should be thinking of other models uh, which they could have been doing all the while if they were genuinely in opposition to the idea of a Three Waters reform program that started uh, under the previous uh, national-led government. Uh, and there is a fair degree of cyn cynical partisanship involved in some of the opposition to this reform program. Uh, from particularly from uh, conservative uh, mayors and parts of the country working with uh, former members former members of parliament uh, for the national party uh, the former chief executive of local government new zealand uh, and the current minister for a uh, local government um, and 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 we should be under no illusions uh, uh, around around all of that uh, part d um, is, a, is about trying to work constructively through any available avenues it's not trying to ascribe any particular uh, pathway, nor limit it to working through government. Uh, we do have other avenues available to us, in particular our ongoing uh, and strengthening relationship with NITA, who, who have a great deal more leverage in influencing government's decision making than we do, uh, and certainly are a significant uh, ally uh, for us in trying to shape this reform agenda uh, through, the, their, uh, through the powers that are granted them through their treaty settlement process uh, and then were quickly removed from most other subsequent uh, treaty settlements given the, the, the expanse uh, of, uh, of that scope. So uh, I certainly don't believe that the only thing that we should be doing is presenting to the select committee and lobbying members of parliament. There are certainly other avenues uh, available to us to try, uh, to try and shape this. But ultimately, uh, this is uh, about... Um, you can, you, can accept the you can accept the political reality of the situation you find yourself in without accepting the result uh, of that, and that is what this is about, uh, and trying to work through uh, the situation we currently find ourselves in to get a better and more constructive outcome. And we'll take all of them individually, and we'll take them all by division. Resolution A, that the Council express its disappointment in the decision to make participation in the Three Waters Reform Programme mandatory. Councillor Barker. No. Councillor Benson Pope. No. Councillor Alder. No. Councillor Hall. No. Councillor Houlihan. No. Councillor Lafiso. No. Councillor Lord. No. Councillor O'Malley. No. Councillor Raddick. No. Councillor Staines. No. Councillor Vandivis. Yes. Councillor Walker. Councillor Wiley. No. Your Worship. Aye. Carried 8-6. Resolution B, that the Council reaffirm its desire to see an enduring role for Iwi Murray in the governance of Three Waters Service Delivery. Councillor Barker. No. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lafiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. Aye. Councillor O'Malley. No. Councillor Raddick. No. Councillor Staines. Aye. Councillor Vandivis. No. Councillor Walker. Aye. Councillor Wiley. No. Your Worship. Aye. Lost eight five eight six, sorry. C, 
that the Council actively promote community participation in the relevant select committee processes. Councillor Barker. No. Councillor Benson Pope. No. Councillor Elder. No. Councillor Hall. No. Councillor Houlihan. No. Councillor Lafiso. No. Councillor Lord. No. Councillor O'Malley. No. Councillor Raddick. No. Councillor Staines. No. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. No. Councillor Wiley. No. Your Worship. Lost eight six and D that the council continue to work constructively through any available avenues in an attempt to res resolve our concerns around the system design. Councillor Barker, no. Councillor Benson Pope, no. Councillor Elder, no. Councillor Hall, no. Councillor Houlihan, no. Councillor Lafiso. Councillor Lord. No. Councillor O'Malley. No. Councillor Raddick. No. Councillor Staines. No. Councillor Vandervis. No. Councillor Walker. No. Councillor Wiley. No. Your Worship. No. Lost 8 6. I'll move that we adjourn the meeting for five minutes. Second of Councillor Staines. All those in favour? No. Those against? That's agreed.
Your Worship, as before we uh, move on to this item, I'd like to foreshadow that I want to modify it slightly so that in part C... You don't need to foreshadow it, you can just do it. Can I do it now? Yeah. Okay. Um, that we change the word work with staff to discuss with staff so that there's no actual allocation of staff to this project, but I just have access to them. That's fine. Who's seconding it? Councillor Reddick. Councillor O'Malley. Your Worship. Um, as I bring this up, firstly, I, I will also feel, um, be more than willing to take these in three parts because I know that there's some controversy around the third part. The, what we've taken from the previous motion now will sit as a council statement, although it's not part of this motion, that we express our disappointment. Um, I have been, I don't think it's any secret that I have been working quite strongly and I have actually been seeking the council to have a f position so that when any of us speak, we can speak from the council's position because I have felt that up to now, we have lacked a position. And so part of this notice of motion is to establish one and it's part of what I hope to be a piece of work going forward. Um, and I just want to pause to um, say a, a whakatoki that is a um, kaitahu one. It's motatu, a mokauri, a muri akinei. And that's for us and our children after us. And the reason I'm saying that is because we have to move forward. And the whole first part, a big chunk of that is our relationship with Māori and how we go forward in partnership. And I, I completely embrace that. And I do acknowledge in, the, in His Worship's commentary in, around his motion that there has been a lot of negativity come out of here. And there have been all sorts of groups come out of the woodwork when it comes to opposition to the four water entities. And I do not in any way associate myself with any of those anti-Māori racist groups that have come forward. And the things that have been said about the minister are terrible, and the prime minister. And I reject them 100% before we go forward with this. Um, I think when we look, so there's three parts to this. The first part is something that's mentioned a lot, and, and then it's conflated into the second part. The whole water reform has taken two, it's, it's been done in two steps. The first step was in response to what happened at Havelock North and, and a need for a better form of regulation, which is Tomata ROI. There is a statement in that first act which says that, that, that the water regulator must give effect to Tamana Mana Otewai, and I support that. Now, Councillor Lafiso will remember sitting next to me when it was not that clear that the Department of Internal Affairs was actually going to take the word give effect that seriously, So, which brings me on to those bits later. We have a specific relationship with Naitahu in the South Island and, and Te Waipanamu, at least this part of the Takiwa, that it, that, and that's why all three documents are there in that section. Te Tiriti and the Treaty are not identical, and therefore they both need to be included in the list. And then we have the specific settlement claim of 1998 which is the Naitahu Claims Settlement Act. And those all must be given effect to and listened to as we go forward, so I completely support that. I have been reaching out to the local runaka and to Naitahu. I've been part of a bigger group that includes Christchurch and Invercargill and some of the smaller councils. Um, and again, so th Often as not, those councils have found themselves operating not necessarily with the, in the same line or vein that their mayors have been speaking about when they've been out there. And I believe that's why we need to have a formal council position so we're all speaking from the same position. So we acknowledge that Tamata Arawai needs to form. We acknowledge and support a, a, a true role for Māori going forward in governance and potentially in execution, but certainly in governance. We acknowledge that we need to give effect to Tamana Aotawai. And we acknowledge that there can be efficiencies gained by cooperative and coordinated behaviours between councils. And that's what the alternative model rhetoric or, or narrative has been from other councils going forward. And that's, I'll speak that again when I get to part C. So that's the positives. And a lot of the stuff comes out of, or is a slight variation from the letter that we sent 
to the Minister in part of our feedback, and most of Part B is actually from directly lifted from that letter. The difference is that we said we want a reset in the letter, and I originally wrote in this that we reaffirm our position. Um, the CEO pointed out that actually wasn't a position, so therefore the word affirms is in this time. And if you look carefully, it doesn't say we absolutely support it. It says we currently do not support it, the formation. Because what I'm asking for us to have a position on and asking government to please listen to us is that we might go forward with the four water entities. We might decide that is the best model. But the actual design and feedback has been poor. Department of Internal Affairs who have led this have not engaged with us and we have seen in the interaction we have with government over this whole thing that that level of interaction was poor and it needs to be improved. I completely support reform and I acknowledge that we cannot go forward with the 67 councils currently operating completely independently of each other. There is a regional component to it and we have to do something about that. But does that mean that we need to dispossess the assets from the councils and hand them over to this regional to these four water entities? Because if you consider that, then I consider the fact that how would you like Veolia or Nestle or Coca-Cola Corporation owning your water within the next 25 to 50 years? Because we will have aggregated them. The only protection we will have is a legislative protection. And do you want to know how weak a legislative protection is? There is a legal protection right now in legislation that stops councils handing over their entities. But a government with a clear majority is going to rewrite that law and take that protection away. Legislative protections are only dependent on the government on the day. They do not give you permanent protection. And aggregation exposes you to extreme risk. That's why I would think we need to reset the program. It's not discarding it, it says go back to this point and then come forward again. And then that next part then is effectively the meaningful engagement with our communities. Ask the communities what we want, because we've been told councils asked for this. And then I ask what councils? And then it goes silent. LGNZ might have asked for it, but again, I don't think that was necessarily what went on here. I have a feeling that Interested parties like Infrastructure New Zealand were lined up waiting for something to happen. They wrote the paperwork, gave it to DIA, who then gave it to the government and moved forward with it. And I think we're just saying, please come back to us. Please come back to us and start the process again from this point forward. Part C, I know that's causing some controversy to, for some councillors, but I would, you know, I would remind Councillor Benson Pope that when, when the hospital rebuild was being put forward, there was a council resolution put forward that effectively allowed him to be involved actively with that process. And all I'm asking, and now especially with the word discuss involved, is I'm not asking for staff resource other than to be, have access to some of the reports that are there, have some explanation of what's going on, and be able to reach out to some of the other councils. As I've said, I have been in communication with some of the other councils and it has to be, at this point, it's been in a very unofficial position because I don't have any delegated authority to speak in any position. Now, I would ask you, if you can delegate me this authority, I, I give you my word that I will work with you because I've shown that on the Regional Transport Committee where I was the first councillor to bring back minutes from exterior committees and, and table them for the very purpose of making sure that you saw what I was saying and what I was doing at those exterior committees. So I'm asking for delegation to move forward and discuss with you, it says engage with the council then the government and other councils in the development of an alternative regional water model. Now, when this will be completed, I don't know. And, 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 I, and I do know that I'm basically offering to take on a vast amount of work and only be helped by volunteers around me. But I, but I believe that we came a long way towards that with the Otago Southland model that was proposed. It failed at the, at the mayoral forum level. I'm trying to work now at the infrastructure level and see if we can get it to work again. So that's my opening speech and I now wait to hear what you have to think about this and I'm hoping that you will support me on these three motions. But I definitely am willing to take them separately. Thanks, Councillor. I'd be surprised if any conversations with a runaka would lead you to believe that Mana Whenua would sell off our water services entity to Coca-Cola. Uh, but are there further speakers? Councillor Vanavis. There are some fundamental assumptions here 
and I'm very pleased that Councillor O'Malley has, has clarified some of them. Um, one fundamental assumption that I have real difficulty with is his claim that councils cannot go forward independently. Unlike our national grid, which has tied all electricity producers and distributors together, our water systems, our three waters, are fundamentally independent. The idea, for instance, that um, the technology that we have here in Dunedin for a water catchment, which is essentially a rain catchment area, is entirely different to what Christchurch has, which is an artesian water uh, sourced system. There are virtually no commonalities between these quite different catchments and quite different systems for getting drinking water, for instance. There are some more similarities about uh, sewage and, and drainage, perhaps, but even there in Dunedin, our stormwater system is very much um, decided by the topography and the very hilly nature uh, that we have here, whereas in Christchurch it's mostly flat as a pancake. So um, the, the assumption that councils cannot move forward independently, I believe, is not a safe assumption. In fact, I would suggest the opposite. I think that councils should go forward independently because they have such vastly different topography, water sources, financial resources, and economies of scale, depending on what size those water systems are. <clears throat> if you look at the Morrison Lowe Consultants report that we had, quite a weighty uh, report that actually had some very good stuff in it. Um, I believe that their uh, um, conclusion really was that of all the Otago and Southland councils, Dunedin would gain the least from any advantages that there might be, mainly because our economies of scale were already quite large and most of the others were not. So this idea that councils can't go forward independently, I think, is a, an incorrect assumption. I think it's not just desirable that we go forward independently. I think it's necessary that we go forward independently before we even start to think about the 150 years of investment that our forefathers and previous ratepayers have all put into the massive pipework system that we have. In terms of the relationship with Maori, if we have to forego two and a half billion dollars worth of piped infrastructure uh, as the biggest asset base that we have, the base in fact that we justified taking our debt up to 1.2 billion just a few hours ago, if we have to forfeit that asset base to the control of an outside agency uh, in order to um, move our relationship forward with Maori. It's simply not a relationship we can afford to have. $2.5 billion worth built up over many, many years. Technology and understanding and background uh, that we all have for a system which is now absolutely custom made just for Dunedin and which won't work anywhere else and where the uh, um, intellectual property that we have associated with it is probably irrelevant almost anywhere else. The idea that we have to somehow share this and that it's going to be um, able to be better managed by some centralised agency is I believe, completely illusory. Getting back to these recommendations here. A, expresses government broad support for reform in three waters. I don't believe Dunedin needs it. I don't believe that despite the fact that we dragged the chain for a long time, especially on stormwater maintenance, that we are now in a dire situation as we were prior to the flood of 2015. I think that Dunedin's actually doing reasonably well, notwithstanding the fact that we can always improve. I think most people are actually quite happy with our water system the way it is, and they don't want to lose it, and they certainly don't want to lose control of it. The claim by government that we somehow would still own the water infrastructure. Five minutes, Councillor. Um, 
is also very questionable. Thank you Councillor for Lane. indulging me for five minutes. It's the least I could do. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, yes, I'll be supporting all three of these points. And um, one of the reasons why I'm supporting this is because uh, I agree with the stance Councillor Malley has made previously, um, and he's been quite firm on his objections around this mandating, as have I. And I think he's shown leadership there. He's also he's also the chair of infrastructure. I mean, it makes sense and it's fair and reasonable. And he's done quite a bit of work in the background, talking to other councils and other infrastructure heads around what issues they're facing and how they're dealing with it. And 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 we need we need someone to take leadership on this and to look at where we can, if there's any opportunity to negotiate more. And what I would say is with this, and I think the government has missed an opportunity, is that my feeling is a lot of people would agree to some of these reforms, or even all of them, had they been listened to. And when we went back, like I, along with many of you, went to a lot of the meetings, I think I went to almost all of them, we're including driving to Gore and going along to those meetings. We put a lot of time into all of that and read, like Councillor Walker said, we read hundreds of thousands of pages on all of this. And, you know, to in good faith, I did it, and I'm sure we all did, in the hope that we can have some sort of um, say in our future for reform. Instead of that, all of us was taken away from us. And uh, I just think it's, yeah, as disappointing as too light a word to use here, gut-wrenching, someone said before, was better. Thank you. What? Further speakers. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Worship. I support all three of these um, recommendations. Um, I know that Councillor O'Malley lived through the 1980s neoliberalism. <laughs> neoliberalism in all of the reform which promised greater efficiencies and greater use of, um, of assets, etc., etc., and we only have to look at um, perhaps some of our hospitals, electricity prices have not gone down, they've gone up, etc., etc., and um, those who don't know their history are often doomed to repeat them. Uh, I also look at B around um, the alternative models, and I look at what the, um, the Green Party have said is they've asked um, to press pause on the three water reform, and it's interesting the, the people around the table that are actually agreeing around this. Um, and they certainly uh, ask, want to see more than four proposed entities so communities are closer to the decisions being made about their water services. And we've talked a lot today about communities being closer to their um, decision making. We've talked about that with the um, we didn't talk about waste minimisation, about the uh, climate change, about carbon zero, et cetera, et cetera. And I really think that we really need to encourage, uh, encourage government to look at this again and to strongly word this. And, uh, and I also agree with the delegating of authority to discuss this work. I know that um, Councillor O'Malley is deeply embedded and very passionate about infrastructure. Councillor Reddick. Uh, yes, I support all three of these uh, elements of the motion. And I actually particularly like the way it dovetails with the previous uh, part A of the previous notice of motion and how they uh, work well together. The particular uh, element of this motion is part, is uh, B2. We state that the water reform program needs to be reset. And personally, I think it started, the whole water reform program started with a fundamental flaw and I think that whosever idea that was has proceeded to come up with a range of other ideas that have compounded the error and the I think it should be the whole thing should be reset back to Tamata Arawai and I think that Maori should have 50% of the regulator and I think if we have uh, mana whenua having 50% of control of the rules and the um, establishment and the um, dissemination and enforcement of the rules, that will go a long way to covering off um, a, a lot of the ambitions for water and will improve uh, the, 
the whole relationship by going right back to that fundamental basis. Because at the moment, there are only two advisory roles on Tamata Arawai, and I think that is insufficient. And so thereafter, we've got this hodgepodge of a, an idea of how to arrange these water assets and then incorporate them into various uh, iwi around the country. And whilst and some people may think that the South Island is either straightforward or not quite right, uh, the North Island gets very messy, where you've got multiple iwi, multiple tribal groups involved in a single uh, authority, and I think that would just spell a whole lot of trouble going forward in terms of the governance, let alone um, how it's going to work out with the assets being owned by, still supposedly with the councils, but uh, under the control of a separate authority. I don't think that the general population of New Zealand, right across the board, want to lose control of the assets they have paid for. So I think the whole program needs to be reset and rejigged. And one of the things I like about Councillor O'Malley's uh, motion is that he has a range of positive suggestions, but ultimately he's saying he doesn't support the situation that we have now, has put forward a range of positive and constructive suggestions which further echoes our, our whole council, I suppose, position that we want to work constructively. And here are some good suggestions that can be brought to the table and everyone work on them together. And I think for a start, the suggestion that Otago Southland might be amalgamated into a single authority is something that we have been working on as a council and the, the mayors around the uh, Otago and Southland seem to have broad agreement on, and I think councillors, councils in general, have broad agreement on, and that would make sense. And it I don't, doesn't make sense to me to be amalgamated with Christchurch and parts further north, because as Councillor Malley has pointed out, we're all well aware there's no instant, there's no network connectivity between water systems. Although within Otago and Southland. There could be. So to me, uh, I think resetting the program is very important. And you know, there's no one in the building that knows more about both the, um, the physical nature of the assets and the political nature of the other parties involved in this throughout the South Island than Councillor O'Malley. So I certainly support Part C. Further speakers? Um, I, f I find it unusual to read what we currently have before us, given the tenor of the debate uh, that preceded this one, uh, having been lambasted for not offering strong enough language uh, in terms of the notice of motion that was proposed. We're now being asked to express broad support for the Three Waters Reform Program. And there are specific clauses to that, but I struggle to see how uh, that is any uh, more strong uh, than the position that was taken. Um, I think the reality of or the crux of this motion as proposed is C, uh, around Councillor O'Malley, who wishes to be given the delegated authority to work with staff uh, and government somehow, um, and, and uh, albeit not in a constructive way because we've voted against that, uh, and other councils in developing an alternative regional three waters services model to be completed in time to inform the government three waters reform program legislation which is being introduced this side of Christmas. Um, so that seems like a Herculean task uh, for anyone uh, to be able to do resourced or not. Uh, and I do wonder uh, about uh, about the merits of that. Uh, the Regional Transport Committee has been mentioned, and yes, the minutes of those meetings are now presented through the committees, but I don't recall at any point uh, ever being asked for input uh, onto anything that was on the agenda in advance of those meetings so that, councils, so that council could uh, give feedback to our representative uh, on that committee uh, to represent uh, our position. Um, so, uh, Councillor, uh, forgive me if, uh, if I don't have such confidence uh, in the ongoing role that this Council will have uh, in informing whatever might come off sea uh, were, it, uh, were it to progress. Um, and and uh, that is 
all I have to offer on that. Are there further speakers? Councillor Staines. Thank you, Worship. I think in running these two against each other, we might have completely lost the plot, to be honest. I think we, we in, around this table all feel that we have been cut out of a decision that we were allowed to take in conjunction with our community. We had that promised opportunity to opt out should we believe and our community believe that we should meet the regulations separating them from the delivery uh, as a council ourselves. I really struggle with C. At the end of the day, the last resolutions did say work with the steering committee. We have to have an input. We can't just step away and say we won't, and this is saying we will, but it's saying we will via one member of our council. And it's going to happen quickly. So personally, I would have rather seen the situation where the mayors, the mayoral forum was, had been contacted and that the mayors of this region had the opportunity to consider together how they might submit to the select committee and how that might include either a reset or alternative options. So I'm of two minds how to vote on this, but I think there is a degree of um, confusion now around what the two note notices of motion are trying to achieve, and I think my personal view was it would have been better to have withdrawn, or for the councillor to have withdrawn his notice of motion, and then followed up with an opportunity to speak with our Mayor and perhaps rejig what came to Council in a way that all of us around this table could support. I don't think it's good that we sit here and have a divided Council on this issue. We need to be together. We need to be together if we're going to have a strong voice. And right now, I can't see that happening with these resolutions. Thank you, Councillor Lord. Yeah, um, I certainly can't support A. I mean, the fact that uh, expressed to government board support for reforms in Three Waters, well, I don't simply believe we need that. I think Councillor Vandivis was clear about that, and I agree. Um, a wee bit further down, um, it says, sorry, I can't read it very clearly now, to take my eyes off it. Um, it says that we're disappointed government appears to have given little consideration to alternative models for water uh, services. I don't think we know or have any idea what is the best. I mean, right from the start, I heard some people saying, have the Highlanders model, have the Highlanders model. And to me, what we need is demonstrated to us the need for reform. Just because, to, to say that the whole South Island won't work, but the Highlanders what model would work, it's just nonsense. All it gives you is a local, uh, greater local content. But I, I, what I would like to see is it demonstrated that councils are not doing the job. As for supports the formation of Tamata ROI and increased water standards, I think increased water standards is a completely separate body of work. If, if our water standards as a country aren't good enough, some, you know, usually Ministry of Health can review and work out what is suitable. But I think it's a complete mix-up to say because water standards aren't good enough that we need to modify what we've got. And, and who's to say that water standards can't be improved and this council could, could comply with those water standards like most countries around the country have for a long time. So I can't support A or B and certainly I can't support C because I just think it's wrong process to say that um, you put the chair of infrastructure. I think this is a, needs to be led at staff level and we as a governance body have to give that direction to staff, but I think the idea that we elevate a, a single councillor to that role is is just not the way it should be, so I'm sorry I can't agree with either parts, so just telling you how I feel. 
Who are the speakers? Councillor Elder. Um, I'm, I want to talk to Part P, B actually, um, and um, I agree with um, Councillor Barker on this, and, and the Green Party has asked for this, that there is a press pause on this. Um, and I go back to um, point three, we seek the government commits to meaningful engagement with our community before advancing any further with water entity reform. Um, we did not have the opportunity as a council to go to our community, and I believe that um, is wrong. I believe our community expected that of us, and I want to express that disappointment openly. Um, does that mean it will change things? Maybe not, but I do want to express that disappointment openly. Um, I do believe um, that we should have been able to explore different models as it was, it was one model or out, opt in, opt out. And to me, I, I, I again think that the journey um, has been dishonest in some ways. Um, I would like to see, um, I would like to see a reset because of that. I, I think, um, I think um, this, this process has been quite rushed. And I look at um, local government reform, um, RMA reform, <laughs> how many reforms are we going through? And our heads are full. And we need to have a really solid discussion together on this. Um, so I support A, um, because in fact, there is a need for some work on this, the three waters. Um, and I, I agree with, um, um, Naitahu participation, number two, two, supports the aims of three waters to give effect to, to mana Aotearoa, and there could be efficiencies gained, but again, we need to have that conversation, and the, to me, this is really quite a, a, a protest um, part in Part B. Um, I like um, that we have included expressing disappointment in the decision to make participation in the free waters reform program mandatory because indeed um, it is disappointing but I also want to express um, that in fact I don't agree with it and it's a protest I suppose um, and this um, motion supports that. Councillor Walker. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, again, interesting discussion, but um, I really just want to echo what um, Councillor Steyn said, actually, that um, it's just the awkwardness that's emanated by having these, these two motions, and uh, in his words, that you know we should be together, and I think these two motions, unfortunately, have, I get the feeling are sort of beginning to t tear us asunder. Um, and for me, certainly what was um, relatively clear when, when we, we listen to the first motion, is now, I'm, it's opaque. I mean, I'm just at a loss, and I, I'll move, I mean, enough has been said about A and B, but I'll, I'll, I'll move to, to section C, and I, from, when I read these two motions, um, when we got our papers, I was just, you know, astounded that, that that was actually included. And I mean, I think the mayor hit the nail on the head, um, and sort of paraphrasing what he said, but the resources required to, to develop a, a, an alternative three water service model uh, is most definitely beyond the resources of one person and some you know staff input and government input and good luck getting the government input um you'll you know don't know how you're going to do that one um to see if you can get an audience with with whomever and not to mention the absolutely impossible time frame of, of doing something which is already is, al is already in motion so i absolutely um, I'm, I'm dead set against voting for C, and I'm struggling, struggling with the others, to be honest. Thank you. Councillor Romelli. Oh, sorry, Councillor Vincent Pope. Well, it will be apparent to colleagues um, from the comments I made earlier um, that I certainly wouldn't support A. Uh, I'm ambivalent about the general message of B, and I think Councillor Lord hit the nail on the head with the problems with C. There's no requirement that whatever might be discussed would be approved by Council or agreed by the majority of people at this table. 
there's no requirement in there that anything will be ticked off um, before it was discussed with anyone else. So in the sense of the way a local authority has to operate, that just cannot be. Um, and that will be a level of delegation to one, one councillor that is simply not acceptable. So I certainly won't be supporting that and I would encourage colleagues to join me, whatever they do with the re remainder of the motion. Councillor O'Malley. It's quite a lot to answer back to here. Um, I just want to start out, um, Your Worship, you said that uh, good luck with um, having Mana Whenua sell off the product. It's great. Yeah, that legislation would be fantastic. Currently, the legislation prohibits it 100%, not even a thing. The government is able to override it. You're missing the point. No matter how pretty and well you write your legislation, it can be overwritten by a sovereign government in the following government. So it makes no difference what that legislative protective is. It has no life beyond the current government. Now, don't want to be too pedantic, but it doesn't say that we express broad support for the Three Waters reform. It says for reforms in Three Waters. Part one of that is already a done deal. That is the Water Services Bill. Same with part three. It's already done. So I got on your council, Benson Pope, for not being able to support it, but you seem to not be aware of the fact that the bills have already basically passed and Tamata Arawa is now in existence. Um, this is not a comprehensive list of what I think we should be doing as a council and I acknowledge that two notices of motion went up and I would speak to the fact that that might speak to the environment of communication inside this council. I clearly said I was going to put a notice of motion up and you, your worship, did not come to me when you knew I'd already proposed to do it. Now, I'm not expecting people to come to me, and I apologise, maybe, for not having spoken to others before I put the wording of this up. But I would like to point on Part C about whether or not I could be trusted to communicate in his worship statement that I've never approached him. I asked, at the end of a council meeting, I asked him to hold the council back at the end of a council meeting because I was going to a regional transport committee meeting, and I sought the council's feedback before I went. And instead of holding it back, His Worship said, oh, Councillor O'Malley has something to talk to you about the RTC, you can talk to you over lunch over it. I specifically asked to get feedback from the Council to take it to the RTC. <coughs> now, in terms of Part C and delegation, the delegation already sits with the Mayor to do most of this activity right now. Not formally given to him, but that's where all the, that's all the meetings are. The Mayor's going to these meetings. Is he seeking any feedback from us to take to those meetings? Are we getting any briefings of what's come out of those meetings? So if you're so uncomfortable with me having the authority to maybe not be able to do my homework, because I won't be going away to some exotic place for Christmas and New Year, this is what I'll be working on. And I won't be working on it by myself, because Christchurch is preparing the very same model. And when you talk about councillors shouldn't be doing this, I had learned something in my little interactions with these other councillors, and that is this separation of councillors and staff is by no means as tight as it is in this council. The letters that were written back to government were written in most of the other councils with councillors in the appropriate position sitting with the staff members that wrote those letters. They were genuine letters from council, not council, not letters written by staff that were signed off by council later. And we saw what that came down to when we wrote our letter. It took a whole new re-meeting and it ended up being me putting in all those extra points. Now that should have happened from the start. Oh, I do want to correct some things that, that Council Vandiver said that has been coming forward. There is no asset transfer to Māori here. It is a governance role change. And it's been conflated and turned into, we're giving all the assets over to Māori. That's not happening. Um, the idea that smaller regions um, do their own thing and are not interconnected, that's correct. That's why these models are being thought about. Now, Christchurch and Waimaka area Selwyn, or Waimaka area and Christchurch, because Selwyn's not involved yet, are talking about how can they act as a metro. And then they're acknowledging that they cannot ignore the West Coast. And yet only two of the three West Coast Councils are actually in, only one of the West Coast Councils are in need. Every freshwater treatment plant in the Westland Council is less than 10 years old. They have one wastewater treatment plant to be upgraded, which is in Hokitika. And they have more money in the bank than it's going to cost them. They are under no threat whatsoever. 
Now, how did they do that? Because they got given $20 million of relief from the government during the COVID fund, and that's how they upgraded their fresh water plants. So what I'm saying when we talk about these new models, other alternative models, is I, I do believe that small councils need help. And the kind of model we're talking about is shared services. So Clutha District, Waitaki, CODC, and whether Queenstown Lakes is in with us or not would be a determination of whether they want to pay into part of a shared activity so that the water office here helps design and build some things down in Clutho if they need it, rather than going out to, rather than having to go out to consultants. Because that's all this entity is going to do. It's going to force that into an office in Christchurch. That's your five minutes, councillor. Okay. So, vote as you wish, I believe, and I'll ask them to be taken. There's nothing surer, <laughs> uh, but we'll take them. We'll take them in parts A, B, and C, and, and we'll take them place. by division. Yep. No, uh, but I, uh, I'll read the headline statements so you can follow, the, follow them. Uh, part A is that Council expresses to Government broad support for reforms in Three Waters, uh, specifically, etc. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Aye. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lefiso. No. Councillor Lord. No. Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. No. Councillor Vandivis. No. Councillor Walker. No. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. No. It's failed on the Chair's casting vote. Thanks. Part B, that the Council affirms to Government that it does not currently support the formation of the four water entities specifically, etc. Councillor Barker. Aye. Sorry, can I just clarify what happened there? It was, it was, it was seven a, all. Oh, sorry. So, but you should, and we should have declared yes, the vote. We should, so sorry. The, the Mayor jumped in, so that was a seven all. In that case, the Mayor has an option of exercising a casting vote, which he did, and the motion was lost. Clause B, that the Council affirms to Government that it does not currently support the formation of the four water entities, etc. Councillor Barker. Aye. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. No. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lefiso. Aye. Councillor Lord. No. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. No. Councillor Vandivis. Yes. Councillor Walker. No. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. Carried five, uh, sorry, nine five. Uh, Can we just check that? Is that what you mean? I have not, I have ten fours. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, and, and C has been well traversed. Councillor Barker. Aye. Councillor Benson Pope. Councillor Elder. Aye. Councillor Hall. Aye. Councillor Houlihan. Aye. Councillor Lefiso. No. Councillor Lord. No. Councillor O'Malley. Aye. Councillor Raddick. Aye. Councillor Staines. No. Councillor Vandivis. No. Councillor Walker. No. Councillor Wiley. Yes. Your Worship. No. Once again, this is a um, seven. Seven. Worship. What, Mayor's and, casting well, vote. Well, I'll take. I'll take. A, to take advice from staff. W were it to be uh, a tied vote, what would the outcome be? Oh, I'd have to check what our standing orders say, but generally. I'm just. I'm just interested in the question as to the chair may exercise their uh, their, their delegation. What would the alternative? We would be? need to take five minutes because. Oh, that's fine. I'll use it. Uh, it's it's lost on the chair's casting vote. That brings us to the. Uh, I'll move per the order paper that uh, we move into non public for the reasons outlined and that we adjourn the meeting for. How long do you need? Five minutes? Yeah, five minutes? Five minutes. Yeah. Uh, and, and come back with a non public part of the meeting. Thanks.